Starfield has a beautiful world. It is packed with these gorgeous vistas that you can stop at and watch a skybox of the universe. I have a lot of footage that looks like this. Because I played the game in two hour chunks with minimum 15 minute breaks, so I just park my character on a vista somewhere and record the skybox. It's not surprising, but that's the game studios have always been good at creating atmospheric skyboxes and vistas. They've always nailed this aspect of world design. There's a lot of components to it. They simulate the movement of planetary bodies, which are at good proportions. They don't overload the skybox with details, and they don't overuse planetary rings, which is an amazing trope of the last decade to have avoided. But they also keep it special by maintaining a balance of rarity. Only 10% of planets have life, and I couldn't tell you the percentage that have good skyboxes. But Todd Howard is absolutely right about this. There was a big design kind of problem to solve in terms of, well, what's fun about landing on a planet where there's potentially nothing? Because there's a lot of planets and moons, if you kind of, in reality, that, well, there's nothing on them um, except resources. And so we spent a lot of time figuring out, okay, let's just lean in on that can A, be a lonely experience, as long as we tell the player, here's what's there, here are the resources that are there, go find them. But I equate it to that moment of, we said, about listening to the wind go and watching the sunset. And I do think there's a certain beauty to landing on a strange planet, being somewhat the only person there. And we are modeling all of the systems because that's how we like to do things. So you can watch whatever that gas giant or moon, it will rotate and go and sunrise, sunset, and all of those things that you would expect. And it's, it's all really happening. And... Most people probably won't notice or appreciate all of that. It was funny watching people be absolutely hysterical about this one element prior to release, while ignoring other alarming elements of the marketing. I suppose it is fair. World design has always been the number one strength at Bethesda. A shift in the status quo could be quite dangerous to the one pillar that has remained rock steady throughout the years. You are going to see me walking around planets a lot, and truthfully, I know it's going to look boring. But it's strangely engaging to me in a way that I get when playing, even if a lot of people don't. In my view, one of the big problems to plague Bethesda worlds, especially post-Oblivion, is that things are packed in too tightly. It's hard to appreciate what is there when you don't take the time to tease the player with what isn't. Morrowind and Oblivion are defined by large, uninterrupted stretches of the natural world, even if most planets are barren wastelands, I still find this to be a wholly welcome change. Fallout 3 and 4, as well as Skyrim, always felt like the subway, subway surfers. surfers in the margin of world design. Skyrim more so than the others is beautiful, but also jam-packed with encounters practically on a timer to ensure continual, formulaic retention of attention. And that's not to say Starfield isn't trying to do that too, but having so many procedural places to visit requires a shakeup in formula that reinvented a component of these games that I've been missing. Contemplative silence. But I get it. You don't want to go two minutes without having something dramatic happen. So here's where I hit you with the bug compilation. Wait, where's the bug compilation? Well, funny joke, I actually do have one, it's just kind of boring. I'm sure several YouTube channels are having to tighten the belt this year as the dramatic and buggy releases of a few years ago get further and further away. Now it's just sad as games come out with just poor optimization. Starfield was kind of a surefire bet for that crowd. I'm not in it, I never was. This is my third time around at playing the new release game, and despite doing the same old routine, people are still finding ways to be surprised when I'm the one person in the room not losing their mind with either hype or hysteria. Starfield was given an extra year of polish. Then again, according to Todd himself, the game only clicked into feeling fun to play as late as last year. I thought we would find the answers faster, Howard admits, explaining that Starfield only clicked into feeling fun to play as late as last year. It's the game flow, he says. We whittle away on these lumps of clay and make them better, but there's a magic to that. 
They even went so far as supplementing the recently unionized ZeniMax QA workers who handled Fallout 76 with Microsoft's own QA workers. I think Matt says we have every QA person in our entire company <laughs> State of Washington like playing, yeah, yeah, yeah. playing um, Starfield right now, looking at bug counts, looking at quality of where we are. Uh of course, they had every monetary incentive to do so. Starfield has been described as the starter pistol for Xbox's new wave of first-party titles. It's a flagship for Game Pass, which, just prior to the game's launch, slashed its trial periods. It is the Halo 3 of the Xbox... You know, I don't even know what they call their consoles anymore. There was simply too much money invested for Starfield to have issues at launch. I suppose it's just nice that consumers' best interests lined up with the investors. This time. Still though, don't take this as cynicism, fixing the bugs is a good thing. I mean, I might say the ironic value of enjoying Bethesda games as being buggy messes is gone, but on the other hand, it means that the critical long-term discussion of Starfield will move away from memeing about glitches to actually discussing things like the world design, gameplay, and storytelling. So in many respects, as an analyst who likes discussing those things more than the bugs, I have to thank Bethesda for removing this protective layer. As an example, how many people can actually discuss Fallout 76 as a game versus Fallout 76 as a failed product launch? And on that note, I know a segment of the audience at this point will be commenting that Bethesda didn't make Fallout 76, that it was actually a side studio. Fallout 76 uh, is a big fall game, not under your personal, like, this team here at Rockville's. There was a lot of people here involved in it, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, Austin, the, the Austin team was, was were they the, the kind of? The Austin studio, I mean, the whole studio in Austin's working on it. They, I think they've done a really incredible job, but there's a lot of people uh, here in Rockville and yeah. in Dallas and in Montreal. Everybody. That was that was a lot of people. That we game. knew we were going to have a lot of bumps. You know, that's a difficult development. A lot of new systems and yeah. things like that. Hey, we're going to go try this new thing. And anytime you're going to do something new like that, you know you're going to have your bumps. Uh, you know that a lot of people might say that's not the game we want from you. But we still want to be somebody who's trying new things. Um, and that was a very difficult difficult development on that game to get it where it was and we were ready for you know a lot of those difficulties ended up on the screen and we knew this is not the type of game that people are used to from us and we're going to get we're going to get some criticism on it yeah. um, and a lot of that very well deserved criticism fallout 76 like really bad launch and okay what did we do wrong what can we learn let's go at it now it's a now it's a success a lot of people here in Rockville worked on 76 and Montreal and Dallas as well. That's well, we have what I would call, you know, a, a, a full-size group team on 76 still. Right. Updating that game, it's doing great, very fortunate. Well, there you go. But it's not actually that clean. And it is, as you said, you know, our first new IP in over 25 years. It's our first major release in about eight years. Yeah. Yeah. 23 minus 8, that is 18, the year Fallout 76 came out. That I've, yes. Yeah. Well, obviously we had 76 in between, but it's something that I've directed, yes. Yeah. That is the one. The pressure from our players that they wanted a multiplayer experience hmm. got to be so high that Todd wanted to do it too. And so it was like, you know, it's going to be the same Fallout. All we have to do is add multiplayer. And with those words, we started down a path that was not as successful as we had before because- All right, so to do my daily good deed, I'm going to clear up some misinformation. Bethesda is two companies, both owned by ZeniMax. One is Bethesda Softworks, the other is Bethesda Game Studios. Bethesda used to develop and publish games under the Softworks title until 1999 when the company was formally split into two. Games published by ZeniMax will, at least if they're good, have Bethesda's logo placed on them. Typically, this is the hollow square icon. This is why people think Dishonored is a Bethesda game, despite being made by Arcane. Games developed by Bethesda, on the other hand, have the Vault Gear logo. Bethesda Game Studios is the company that Todd Howard runs. There are four divisions of this company. Rockville is the first, which is the development studio that made all those numbered Elder Scrolls and Fallout games you know about. 
Montreal was the second in late 2015, Austin was the third in early 2018, and Dallas was the fourth in late 2018. Now, while it is explained that Bethesda Game Studios is effectively one big family, the reality is that the role of the satellite studios is to either assist with the main team in Rockville, Maryland, or handle the dirty work that the main team doesn't want to do. This is why Fallout 76's credits reads like a reunion of developers from Fallout 4. While Austin did participate, primarily assisting in the multiplayer components of 76, it was Maryland that made the content of the game. Staff at Maryland continued to work on the game post-launch until Wastelanders was out, at which point it was finally handed off to Bethesda Austin, but still with some support from the Maryland devs. So 76 was, was interesting for, for us because most of the development had been done by the folks in Austin, at BGS Austin, and then we came in later to, you know, add content and do some stuff. And then and then when the Wastelanders uh, expansion came out, then, then it was more of an all hands on deck type of thing. So it is absolutely fair game to make comparisons between the two titles, even if Bethesda formally doesn't want to associate Starfield with 76 in their marketing. They were quick to cite Skyrim and even Fallout 4, which still has a much lower Metacritic rating than I thought, but not their most recent game of 76. No matter if you are a 76 purist or not, Bethesda's lowest rated game before Starfield was still their most recent. This presented most hilariously in the Direct, when they showcased the lineup of Bethesda games that exist in a glass case of the studio. They started with Morrowind and Pan Wright, cutting off halfway through Fallout 76. Bethesda, even at their home office, considers the game one of their own. But I don't forget so easily, especially since I think 76 is better at several things than Fallout 3 and 4, namely its short introductory sequence and the fact that in-game player builds actually distinguish themselves rather than congealing into a mono build like in 4. And with that out of the way, we move on to my next public service, debunking claims that the games were made in 8 years. Yes, this is twice now. Starfield was pitched to Robert Altman, that's the Robert the game is dedicated to in the credits, in 2013. We'll talk about that pitch later, but they filed the trademark then because they just wanted the name Starfield. However, development didn't start until after Fallout 4. Specifically, it didn't start until Todd Howard's three-month hiatus post Fallout 4 had ended, and even then it was just pre-production by a three-man team of Todd Howard, Istvan Pili doing the art, and Emil Pagliarulo doing the writing and design. There is no sign of when pre-production ended, but we do have leaks from 2018 showing the game was still largely in the concept stages of development. This lines up with the timeline of BGS who had been doing various things like a mobile Elder Scrolls game, now two of those, VR ports of Skyrim and Fallout 4, Creation Club, and of course, that whole Fallout 76 thing. So really, full development of Starfield probably began around summer of 2018, that's not the quibble either, if I wanted to paint the game in a poor light, I'd say the game took as long as I could get away with saying just to turn out a poor product. Five years is still a long time, but more honestly reflects what is inside the box. Especially considering the disruption work from home would have naturally caused the development. Diving into Starfield as a game requires three key words that are going to tie this entire analysis together. It's like a magic phrase that really explains everything wrong with this game. No design document. It does not explain what is right with Starfield, because ostensibly everything in this game is developed both simultaneously in a vacuum, but also within the context of whatever build the game was in at the time. That is to say, everything right about Starfield is a product of it standing strong independently, while everything wrong about Starfield suffers from lacking cohesion with other ideas because there were no plans. A good example of this is Zero Gravity Combat. This is a fun mode. It's not strong enough to replace the old combat, but it is an excellent system that is criminally underused. It seriously appeared less than 10 times, all within tightly cramped ship interiors. Some poor designer figured out how to make the AI maneuver in three dimensions and even take cover, just to have their work go almost unused. The footage you see is actually me running dungeons where I used a console command to disable the gravity. And it was a lot of fun. The problem is, on paper, it's a conceptual compromise between inertia-based ground combat, as we typically see in their games, and the new ship combat mechanics introduced in Starfield. But that's only on my paper. Again, there's no design document. 
As a result, the zero-gravity combat is extremely underutilized. If the quest designers don't know if it's going to exist in the final product, they cannot design quests around using it. It becomes fundamentally circumstantial by nature. But more so, it is not a compromise between ground and ship combat, because ship combat is also inertia-based. I loved another one. This is a kind of pen and paper uh, role-playing game at the time where, you know, D&D was getting popular, is this game Traveler. Traveler was a little more hard science fiction. The other thing there is one of the first games I programmed on the Apple II at the time. I really wanted to make a Traveler game. It was also my first time realizing that computers had memory that you could run out of. <laughs> Despite citing Traveler as an inspiration multiple times, the ship combat adheres to air resistance rules, meaning lowering the throttle causes the ship to slow down. As a result, the frictionless combat of Zero Gravity actually stands out as an oddity because it is not marrying traditional ground combat and the new ship combat. It is not teaching the player skills that can translate to both modes. And this is because, again, there was no design document stating that it needed to fill that role. It was created in a vacuum, and so it exists within the framework of Starfield in a vacuum. There is no cohesion between it and the rest of the game around it. To be fair, design and writing director Emil Pagliarulo stated that there is a design document, but that it is very short and he believes the game itself is the real design document. Imagine being a designer and being told to go play the game instead of reading a few pages to answer your questions. This is woefully ineffective and can be chaotic on a development process. That's yeah, good... design documents are only as good as, you know, your follow through when you actually start putting stuff in game. like. It, 100%. This is not the first time Pagli Rulo has discussed his aversion to design documents. In, in the development of the studio, we don't have a lot of extensive design documentation. We found that probably after we hit Fallout 3, the design docs that we had became outdated very quickly because we knew we needed to get stuff in the game and play it and then change it. We needed to iterate on it. So we would have these extensive 50-page design documents that were completely outdated and the time it took to maintain those just wasn't worth it. By the way, I'm going to invoke Immel's name a lot, but it's important to remember that he's not the only person to credit or blame. He has people under him that he's responsible for, as well as people above him who had the responsibility to manage his decision. Part of the problem is that every creative decision runs through Todd Howard, but with the changes made to Bethesda as a company, he, as an individual, is no longer in a position where he can be as accessible as he used to be. This was attested to in an interview with a former senior designer, Bruce Nesmith. You didn't get to uh, interact with Todd as much anymore. Hmm. And I've been blessed with the ability to pretty much walk into his office anytime I needed to and be able to have conversations with him. But when you're running six different studios and you've got a dozen projects, although usually only one really big one, going on at a time, you know, he just, he just, he's only one man. He doesn't have the face time to be able to, to do that anymore. So yeah. the lines of communication became a lot more rigid. Well, all decisions run through Todd. Sure. He would hate, hate, hate me for saying that because he doesn't believe it's true, but unfortunately it is true. All decisions run through Todd. He has, I will give him full credit. He has tried really, really hard to not be the last say guy. It, it, it hasn't worked out that way, but that's not something that he wants intellectually. This is important, as Todd used to be a very active voice in development. There are many stories from the older games of low-level designers having in-person meetings with Todd Howard to discuss what they were working on. Now, Nesmith doesn't think this flaw of requiring Todd Howard's input on all creativity is an issue with his ego. Rather, the issue is that Todd became more and more inaccessible due to the increasing size of Bethesda Game Studios and lacking the necessary underlying leadership structure to fill in those missing gaps. The problem is that it hampers creative flexibility. If you can't pop your head in his office to clarify an idea, that's going to create an inevitable time lag that pushes developers to either go slower or play it safe with their decisions. I don't feel like clarifying every single time I say his name that I think Todd Howard could have pushed back against Emil's impulses, or trying to guess where the line between Emil Pagliarulo and Will Shin was. Just bear in mind moving forward that Starfield's problems are not to blame on one single person. By account, Pagliarulo learned to hate design documents with Fallout 3, and so his next lead project of Fallout 4 went without one. 
I think if you were to ask him, he'd probably liken the process to jazz music. The fundamental problem with art that works through improvisation is that it is usually a small group of individuals, if not one person, whom are all talented and knowledgeable working within a central discipline under a short time frame. To confer it to my own skill sets, I am one person making videos is multidiscipline, but at a low level in each profession. My project times vary, but I've not worked on a single project for more than 12 months continuously. I am not in charge of hundreds of people, my work does not trickle down to dozens of disciplines, and I do not spend five to eight years producing a project. And yet, I find it prudent to have a design document. I don't just mean the script, I often have an additional document cataloging sources and keeping track of ideas. The longer I expect a project to take, the more robust that document becomes, because fundamentally, I am forgetful and it's handy to have that kind of stuff on paper, so editor me doesn't have to ask writer me what his source was. Immel says the reason he dislikes design documents is because updating documentation is a time-consuming task, which is the ultimate ironic statement. For me, a central document is a huge time saver. Work done early to lay out a solid outline pays huge dividends once I'm in the throes of a project. If you have a problem updating your documentation, that's what producers are for. For those unaware, producers are managers of game projects, but not bosses. They are the literal grease between departments to keep things running smoothly. Despite having over 30 producers just in the top billing, apparently it's too much to have one keeping documentation up to date. And even then, this all sounds like a skill issue. There is a middle ground of documentation between having every single minute idea or quest written down in exhaustive detail, and having a couple pages of basic notes for everything. But, as is Bethesda tradition, if a good idea is broken, the best fix is removal. Take it out. Instead of figuring out how to better work with a design document, let's remove it. And so it's little wonder that each game post Fallout 3 became more and more, as Todd Howard would put it, schizophrenic game experience. And the alarming fact is, this trend will continue. Here's Bruce Nesmith, lead designer on Skyrim. Fallout 76 was one that I, I definitely struggled with. I think the, the company's aim was not as focused as it probably should have been. And you could see the result in that and the way it entered into the marketplace. Yeah. To a certain extent, our own hubris caught up with us. You know, we had had so many, you know, not just successes, but literal game of the years, like yeah. industry-wide accepted game of the years, not just in our own heads or in these two little magazines over there, but like <laughs> everybody's saying this is the game of the year. Right. Yeah, you know, we started to talk ourselves into the fact of, you know, we were infallible, you know, that we, there was nothing we couldn't do. And clearly that's wrong. Emil Pagliarillo has stated he does not listen to criticism. Ignoring the reviews. This is a common lie that creative people will tell, but he actually recently proved this to be the case by announcing that originally, Starfield was going to have a player voice actor. Sometimes, look, the best, the, the, the worst decision is no decision at all. So sometimes you have to make decisions that may not be the right ones, but like. This was not an early design idea either. This made it past the text-to-speech phase, to casting, to recording, before Immel decided it was a bad idea. In case you don't know, the player voice actor for Fallout 4 was a heavily criticized idea, if not the single most scrutinized element of that game. Bethesda makes games that heavily cater towards player immersion in their role. Many people felt that Fallout 4 defined the player as a character too much. For every small benefit, like the Veterans Hall speech, there are many reasons you do not want to have a player voice in this kind of game. It stifles the player's opinions about the kind of person they're playing, the inflection the player will have, even the decision as to whether their character speaks at all. Emil himself has also cited many design complications that arose because of the player voice actor, and when stating the pros, he simply says he knew the game needed them, with no other benefit stated. And we needed a voice protagonist to do that. It was a very controversial choice within the studio. It's the first time we had ever done that. Um, and there's something to be said for the silent protagonist, right? So you can have the voice in your head. Uh, but we knew that in order to tell the story the way we wanted to, we were going to have to voice them. And yet, despite the heavy criticism, the very first decision made regarding Starfield's design was not to have a silent protagonist. Because Immel doesn't listen to criticism. Ignoring the reviews. Years of Fallout 4 critiques all ignored because quality is equivalent to profit. Meaning I can say whatever I want and he probably won't hear about it. But if he does, I'm open for interviews. Instead, he decided to learn the hard way a lesson that the rest of the games industry learned back in the 90s. 
which unfortunately does not exactly inspire a lot of confidence. There is a bubble that surrounds modern Bethesda of sycophants and the delusional whispering sweet words into their ears, to the point that they seem to genuinely believe the games they make are truly the game of the year. No, this year they want to be the ultimate game of the year. If you were instrumental in making Fallout 4, and were of the belief that Fallout 4 was 2015's game of the year, would you listen to criticism? The question ultimately becomes, if I knew these things before launch, and I did know these things, why did I expect anything of Starfield? The answer is simple, I didn't. I only played it because I'm stubborn. It's not about my expectations, rather I used to have a bad habit of making promises about buying and playing games under specific conditions. Most of these have expired, like playing Vanilla WoW if they ever offered it again, or playing Halo 3 if it came to PC. But in the summer of 2019, I wrote down in a script that millions of people would end up seeing, that I was interested to see if Starfield was going to be a return to form for Bethesda in context of Morrowind and the belief that this was the game Todd Howard has always wanted to create. In essence, was Skyrim as casualized as it was simply as a means of making enough money to bankroll a true RPG in Starfield? And it's nice with Starfield to go back to some things we didn't do, the backgrounds, the traits, the defining your character, all of those stats. Um, and I think there's so many games now that do those things that people are ready for something that, that does a lot of the things that, you know, older hardcore RPGs, some that we used to do, doing those again in, in a new way. It's part of the reason I'm interested to see Starfield. I mean, if the claims are true, and this is what Howard has been wanting to make for a long time, it'll either be a return to form that we've been waiting for, or it'll be a disaster from a man who's lost touch with his original fan base. It'll be fascinating either way. It was not optimism. In fact, when asked on stream over the course of the next couple years, I consistently stated that it was difficult to predict. Now that the sale has gone through, there's a very real pos- there's a chance that Starfield will be a return to roots, but there's also a good chance that it'll be even worse than anything that had come before it. That's why it's fascinating. It's a gamble of what could happen. Do you have low hopes for Starfield? Well, I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt. It's such a wild card. And so it's like, it's very difficult to make predictions for. There's definitely a lot of conventional logic that says the game probably isn't going to be very good. But I think that like, if Fallout 76 was kind of like a wake up moment for Bethesda, then Starfield would, might not be too bad. Really hoping Starfield isn't dog. I think that they wouldn't have delayed it this long if they were intending on dropping a terrible game. I'm not going to say it's good. I'm not making any predictions. I really haven't seen any of the marketing material on it yet. I'm not at the point where I download all the marketing material and like comb through it. I did that for Cyberpunk. I did not do that for Elden Ring. That was one statement for the last three years. Four if you count the Morrowind video. I perfectly entertained that Starfield would maintain the downward spiral. My romantic side simply likes the tale of the artist painting by numbers until the day that they can break free to define themselves by making something their way. It was, after all, pretty much a replica of my own story as a creator. My cynicism towards Starfield correlates with how much marketing material I was exposed to. The reality was, I had an open mind until I saw evidence. Which is what you are supposed to do. It is curious, though, how it's considered unacceptable to assume something will be bad without playing it, but perfectly acceptable to spend months assuming something will be good without playing it. And with that, I never want to hear anybody talk about my expectations ever again. But I've got another reason. I dislike the post-apocalypse. There are several post-apocalypse games I really enjoy. In Vegas, Seven Days to Die, Zomboid, all three for reasons unrelated to their setting. The fact is, I just don't like Fallout. I'm sure I'll make more Fallout videos come the day I ever have to pay for a house or kids, but my heart won't be in it. But do you know what my heart is in? Science fiction, and space in general. I'm not the guy who confuses galaxies with solar systems, I'm the guy who casually reads articles about planets and stars I'll never visit but want my kids to be able to. So I've got one more rodeo in me, but this is the end of an era. Continuous negativity and Bethesda coverage is over. Honestly, it was supposed to be over last year, but someone missed their release date and suddenly I had time to cover Fallout 76. Not my fault it took you guys until 2022 to make this game, well, fun in your opinion. And well, I just can't quit you.
Still, I set a rule over a year ago that my next big video post Starfield was going to be about a game I liked. So, shut up and put your raincoat on. If you're still in the honeymoon period, you better open your mind up or prepare for a rapid skull expansion. Starfield begins with a lengthy end user license. Starfield begins with its main menu. Uh, let's not start there, but we'll loop back to it. Starfield begins with a short questionnaire asking the player for details about their character before placing them dynamically into the world in a sensical location based on their answers. Just kidding, we begin on our first day at the job at a mining company. Just kidding again, after all it would be ridiculous if the player character was tasked with handling the mining of an important relic, the acquisition of which is worth an entire month of normal operations, on just our first day. Starfield instead begins with our second day at work. Honestly, this would be fine, given if later we learned that the supervisor has a history of mining for these things, and it was normal for her to hand such jobs off to new recruits due to some kind of inherent risk of injury or death. It's actually quite the opposite, as she ends up being quite upset with our client due to the dangers involved. I'm not really sure why we, of all miners, are handed this important responsibility, other than, of course, that we are the player character, and this artifact is important for getting us out of this job and into the main quest. After a short tutorial introducing us to mining, of all things, we find the relic, have our mandatory protagonist vision, wake up and do our character creation. More on that later. Not a minute after recovery, the buyer of the artifact happens to arrive. Our supervisor informs the buyer of our incident. However, while payment is negotiated, a ship enters from orbit. The Crimson Crin- I mean, the Crimson Fleet has arrived pursuing Barrett. Short combat tutorial and... You dug up the artifact, right? That means you saw it. The visions? You're coming with me to Constellation. You're part of this now. What? Don't you get it? You don't have a job here anymore. You're with those explorers now. What? Like it or not. No, I don't like it. But even better, Barrett gives us the Constellation watch, available now for $299.99. And he gives us his ship. And he just... He just gives it to us. His spaceship. His iconic, trademark, classic, no longer in production, one of a kind spaceship. What? Okay, let's pause for a second. Good introductions in all forms have objectives they wish to accomplish, and ideally the audience won't even realize what these objectives are. Typically for a game, the intro will tutorialize basic mechanics and controls. Now I'm going to give credit here. Starfield's introduction is relatively short, relative to other games like Cyberpunk or The Outer Worlds. It's still the longest introduction they've ever made. It's impressive that they have at least managed to not bloat their intro into being four plus hours long when everyone else has. That doesn't make it good, it just puts them above those games in this specific department. However, Starfield's introductory objectives are needing to accomplish more than any of Bethesda's games ever have. Objective 1. Put the player into the world. This is giving the player basic items and lore to get you started. All of the games do this, Skyrim best exemplifies this aspect by having it be the only objective of its introduction. In fact, it would be laudable if it didn't take so long to do comparatively little. Objective 2, Main Quest Item. This can be literal or metaphorical. Oblivion and Morrowind do literal items, Morrowind being a letter and Oblivion being the uber-important Amulet of Kings. For Fallout 3 and 4, this is your relationship to your father and son. For Fallout 76, this is the first Overseer Log. The goal of this is to give the player a hook into the main quest. For Starfield, this is the artifact. Objective 3, the UI element. Only Fallout has done this previously with the Pip-Boy. Because the Constellation Watch, available now for $299.99, is the player's user interface, the player needs to be given one quickly. The problem with this, of course, is that it's the Constellation Watch. Constellation is the main quest organization, meaning it's an inherent constraint placed upon the storytelling to explain how we get this item. And for no real reason, it seems that unlike the Pip-Boy, which was a semi-exclusive item usually possessed by Vault Dwellers, although not nearly enough appear in those games, the watch is not anything special. It's a smart watch. We have those in the real world. They know this. They sold one for $299.99. On that topic, it's transparently obvious that the watch exists solely to be able to be sold. Some of you may remember that Bethesda previously sold the Pip-Boy with the collector's edition of Fallout 4. 
And usually, I find second string experiences, they're generally just stupid gimmicks. You might say I'm not being generous here. However, there is evidence from early leaks to suggest that the watch was one of the very first things to be developed. In addition, Todd was actually gifted an Omega Speedmaster, which is the same model of watch that landed on the moon. Simply put, there's a world of difference between adapting something to be merchandise, like with 76's moldy power armor helmet, and creating something to be adapted as merchandise. Obviously, I don't have proof that this was the only reason for the watch's existence, but it is worth pointing out. The weird part is, though, outside of the two and a half minutes of the Direct where they were shilling the watch, it started to become a prominent obsession of mine to check developers' wrists to see if they ever actually wore the thing in marketing. But come on, obviously the watch wasn't produced yet. It's not like they showcased it in the marketing back in 2021. Oh, no, 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 they did do that. Pete Hines didn't even wear the original watch, instead wearing a custom variant to Gamescom instead. This is not the one you all are going to have. This is a variation on it. If you notice, the, the actual one is uh, gray right. with yep. white yeah. underneath. This yeah. is yeah. the reverse. Um, but, uh, I mean, I have this on because I'm testing it. Like, <laughs> this is another thing. <laughs> so like, I'm sure in. none I of like you it. are thinking about it, but like, hey, <laughs> like we are giving you a watch that has an app. Like, it has to work showing a lot of confidence in this product that started to break for people after one month. Apparently the first time Immel wore the watch was 12 days after customers received it. Where this comes back to Starfield is that it should be the case that watches are fairly common. We could even already possess a starter watch through our mining job, one that's cheaply made and slow and can later be replaced with the higher quality Constellation Bling. The funny thing is that the only reason I even remembered the watch existed come time to write this script was because of the marketing. If they hadn't sold a real watch, I might have forgotten it existed because unlike the Pip-Boy, the watch doesn't remain a relevant element beyond the introduction. It's almost like you can get away with having a user interface without explaining how or why it exists. And it even tells the time. No, no, that's the funny part. It doesn't directly tell the time. You have to check a submenu in the stats to actually know how many days have passed. Finally, we have Objective 4, a new one for the series. Starfield's introduction needs to give the player a spaceship. In the context of the objective, Starfield has a lot it needs to accomplish, so much so that I would actually forgive it for taking longer to accomplish it in these ways. If it means that it comes off more naturally. For example, spending more than 20 minutes of your 90 minute intro, not including character creation, explaining why we are being given these things for free. And it's kind of telling how many reviewers were playing on autopilot, as not many seem to even realize just how long this intro is. Some even cited the game as having one of the shorter introductions from Bethesda, not realizing you're locked in until you arrive in New Atlantis. Starfield starts much faster than previous Bethesda games. Bethesda may be a bit notorious for their lengthy intros with their open world games. I'm pleased to say that this seems to have been changed for Starfield. What's funny is Fallout 76 does actually have a short introduction at just six minutes, beaten only by Morrowind. But hey, that was the bad one and we don't count it. Of course, the ideal way would simply be to start the game being asked how exactly you came into possession of your ship. Maybe you saved up money since you were a kid. Maybe your rich parents bought it for you, hence why you're paying them back. Maybe you owe money on the ship. Maybe you won it in a high stakes game, or maybe you stole it. Or simply, you don't own a ship, instead being grounded until you can save enough money to buy one, or acquire one. There are many opportunities to have a character defining moment here without just giving the player a free spaceship. In any event, prior to release I was speculating about how they were going to explain the player coming into possession of our ship. We actually knew quite a bit about the introduction of the game, and so my conclusion was that during the attack on the mine, Barrett would be killed, with his dying instructions being to take his ship to deliver the artifact to Constellation. I figured that was the laziest way they were going to explain this plot point. Inadvertently, I'd actually given Bethesda more credit as writers. I didn't think the introduction was actually going to have the still-alive Emperor just awkwardly give us the Amulet of Kings, for no reason other than us being the protagonist and him being a wacky guy. This is where we need to talk about protagonist syndrome. If you haven't noticed, we start Starfield from minute zero already working for Constellation. That's not terribly different from Morrowind giving you orders from the Empire. The difference is that Starfield also has the relic to give the player visions. Morrowind just gave you the mail. 
The player is not the only person to get these visions, but it is still a marker of significant specialness. And then the player is additionally given the watch, a robot slave, and a spaceship for almost no explicable reason. But of course, the reason is that if Barrett simply ferried us aboard his spaceship, then there wouldn't be a big moment when we first arrive in space, because it would be Barrett's ship, not ours. They didn't have to do it this way. An obvious option would be to board and take the Crimson Fleet ship that arrives and make that the player's first ship. But then the player wouldn't own the iconic Frontier and wouldn't have Vasco as a welfare companion. Because giving the player both of those things is more important, as those were things marketed to the player. We're excited to introduce you to one of our favorite companions in the game. Hello. Constellation's very own expeditionary robot, Vasco. They are iconic and need to be merchandised. Starfield's intro is uniquely broken. It's backwards from what it should be, but makes sense in the context of Fallout 4's extended introduction throwing a set of power armor and a minigun at the player in the first hour so they can go fight a Deathclaw. We didn't even touch on why the Crimson Cringe attacked the mining operation. They apparently just followed Barrett here because they are nameless space pirates who will attack and kill no matter where they go to steal a ship that is effectively worthless. I sure hope these guys aren't part of a joinable faction that I'm supposed to take seriously. Funny thing is, almost everything I've said about the intro until now, I wrote before the game came out based on a leak. And yet despite not playing it for myself, I largely didn't have to make many corrections once I did. It's almost as though I know what I'm talking about, and that only allowing people to have opinions on things they buy for themselves is corporate propaganda. Gotta help Daddy Bethesda make those 11 million sales. But I digress. A major area where I erred, which is understandable based on where the leak ended, was assuming that upon arriving in space, the tutorial had ended. It turns out that Constellation has a contingency in place to make sure that we don't run off with their ship, forcing us to deliver the artifact. But Vasco decides that we need to go clear a dungeon. A recent scan indicates an abandoned facility on the nearby moon of Crete, a perfect staging area for pirates. See, the logic is that if we don't, the Crimson Fleet will keep pursuing us. However, in order to complete our mission, we only need to jump a single time. In every part of the game going forward, that is sufficient to escape danger. I really don't understand why forcing players to do a dungeon is a necessary part of this tutorial sequence. Imagine Skyrim, except you're forced to go to Riverwood, and then Bleak Falls Barrow, and then Whiterun to meet the Yarrow before finally being cut loose from the main story. The Crete Research Base is a dungeon that Todd Howard showed during the 2022 demonstration. This demo is notable as despite being pre-recorded, several bugs were showcased and scrutinized. You have to remember that the delay was announced a few months later. As far as people were concerned, Starfield was going to nail its 11-11-22 release date in all its buggy glory. So in response to that, Bethesda became hyper-wary of showcasing the game. They delayed the game with no immediate planned release date other than the first half of 2023. You can see how well they hit that. Starfield Direct was heavily edited to ensure that no single shot lasted for more than a few seconds, and all advertising post Direct just reused the Direct footage. Didn't stop there from being issues, which even made it on the Steam store page, but it did work at tricking people into thinking that anything meaningful or accurate about the game was showcased. I mean, I guess the jarring editing of the Direct accurately portrays the jarring gameplay experience of being whipped around these different gameplay systems at breakneck speeds. Mostly though, I don't really see a good reason why the Crete research base is a necessary part of the intro. As Todd and co are prone to point out, Skyrim sold tens of millions of copies with its sub-20 minute intro. It's kind of surreal, yes. right, that you're talking, we're talking about a game we made 10 years ago still. So, I mean, for, for me and everybody here, it's still like, you know, we can't believe it either. Go and look at our player numbers on Skyrim and how many millions of people played Skyrim like last month. Mm -hmm. You realize that like this is not a game that gets measured in hours. Like, I suppose the sequence is an effective vertical slice of the game's core loop of fast travel to place, do dungeon placed in the proc gen sliver, fast travel once content is complete. In fact, there's not really a good reason why Starfield Direct couldn't have simply been more transparent and showcased this as a full, continuous, vertical slice, other than of course to obfuscate and misdirect people about how divided the world spaces are. It's not like Todd Howard did exactly that at QuakeCon 2011, three months before Skyrim's release. Say what you will about Skyrim, and I absolutely have, that game was accurately marketed to the experience you were going to get. Starfield was not. 
As to Crete's part of the introductory sequence, it beggars the question if such a loop is actually necessary to forcibly introduce to players. Again, players in the past didn't need this kind of handholding. People were able to figure out how dungeons worked in Skyrim without being forced to do one. But perhaps the sequence was necessary in development to serve as a vertical slice of how all the mechanics were coming together, on account of there not being a design document, and for some reason they never decided to flag Crete as optional. You know, every time we make a build, there's a bot that runs through, like, the first one or two main quests. Like, it'll just play it. That way we know, do we break anything? Oh, I see. While this seems like a prudent and effective means of bug prevention, it also means that there was likely some hesitation when it came to cutting Crete out as a sequence from the tutorial. The QA infrastructure became dependent on not changing the foundational status quo, and so Crete remains bloating the runtime, not unlike the similar planet of Crate from The Last Jedi. With that, we move on to our final destination, New Atlantis. I should clarify some things at this point. We are forced to go to all of these destinations. You might wonder how that's possible, and the answer is that you are not allowed to fast travel to anywhere except the main quest objective areas. If you haven't played Starfield, but have played a prior BGS game, you're likely still confused. The answer is simply that Helgen, Riverwood, and Bleak Falls Barrow do not exist in the same load areas. You cannot run away from the main quest to Falkreath instead of Riverwood, because it is physically impossible to travel in Starfield without fast traveling. This caught me off guard. I knew inter-system travel was going to be through a loading screen, and I could easily accept that, but I didn't realize that interplanetary travel was also going to be done through loading screens. This is because this facet of Starfield was not fully advertised to players. The plebeian response to this is to say that Starfield was impossible to accurately market, but I disagree. It's an intentionally obtuse perspective that goes out of its way to ignore reality in favor of defending Bethesda because, of course, they would never mislead players with their marketing. Instead of showcasing a highly edited Let's Play of the tutorial behind closed doors at Gamescom days before release, Bethesda could have done a public showcase where they got up on a stage, anticipated the natural questions people would have about this system, and showed how it worked and what the limits would be. If your answer is that they couldn't do that because it might have caused people to be less likely to buy the game, you have also answered what the real objective of the marketing was, and if you defend that, that makes you a shill. The goal was not to be transparent about how the game played. The goal was to mislead people into creating their own headcanon about how the game would play and what features it would possess. Despite the meme, Todd Howard has very rarely ever been caught in abject lies. Rather, he's always been caught in well-designed, charitable interpretations of the truth, aka lies of omission. Despite that, Skyrim's live demo at QuakeCon was very transparent about what Skyrim was going to be as a video game. You can run around, find towns that start quests that send you to dungeons that reward you with loot and words of power, after which you can kill dragons to unlock shouts. And none of it was a spoiler either, because it was all within the first couple hours of gameplay, so don't even try that defense. But, it was decided instead that Starfield needed to be marketed in a way that was new, that wasn't done before. That's not me fluffing them up, Pete Hines actually said that. We get really careful about not just repeating the same thing just because oh, we yeah, did it last time, and this game required something different. Even though what was done before was effective. You're not artists, you're marketers. The only fear they would have is explaining the system would invoke criticism, so they didn't explain the system, letting it surprise people instead. But hey, a few negative reviews are worth the price of being a billion dollar release. And I really want to nail this point. They spent two minutes of the direct shilling merchandise and three minutes having the senior management at Bethesda praise their own game. Some developers even praising their own work, like the multiple level designers whose favorite part of Starfield was the level design, I love the way that our final combination of all the new tech has come together to create some of the most beautiful sunsets and sunrises we've ever had in any of our games. I love the creatures, the exploration, every biome is different. The word that comes to mind is vast. The day-night cycle. The ending. Vesco. Obviously. The incredible amount of worlds we created. Lever action. Rocket launcher. R.I.P. to the guy who started to say what he liked before being cut off because the marketers wanted choppy and fast editing. My favorite part is biomes, the day-night cycle. Those details matter to me. But seriously, imagine I was marketing a video I made and part of my pitch to get you to pay me to watch the video was several minutes of me just talking about how good my editing is or how great of a writer I am. 
Like, marketing is supposed to help sell people on those things, yes, but imagine taking such an ego-heavy approach and then scoring below a 90 on Metacritic. Starfield Direct was a visual assault, a good example of this being me completely missing that Aquila City was a cowboy LARP town in my first viewing because of how fast things were moving. I just couldn't process the information fast enough. Oh no. No! Oh. Dragonborn! <laughs> Thanks what? again for being with us today. We are just talk so about dropping a bombshell. Oh yeah, by the way, we put dragon shouts here. in Starfield. There's probably a lot to take in. There's a lot to the game, <laughs> more than we could show here. Oh, no. God. We're always sharing no. these special moments that only a game like this can bring. Oh my like, god. You guys you, get, you guys I can play a space mage. This. This was the moment my cynicism about Starfield began. Different and like we didn't do a making of, but in case you missed it, we did do a like a feature film length reveal of this game during Starfield Direct. Like yeah, yeah. that 42 minute thing was an unbelievable amount of work. It was honestly almost infinitely more work than than a, than a making <laughs> than a making of because yeah. it, it it took so much work and the filming and the work by the dev team. It was it was an unbelievable amount of work and sort of we had to put all of our heart and soul and effort into that as a thing because we just no felt Pete. Like a sales pitch before launch is not the same as a making of documentary. The whole point of the Direct was to tell people about the game, even if it was in an obtuse way. The point of a documentary is to tell people about how the game was made. Of course, the real reason is pretty straightforward. You know there's a bunch of tourists surrounding Bethesda when they're sad that Pete Hines retired. No, good, I'm glad he's gone. <laughs> Fucking tourist. Of course, the real reason is pretty straightforward. The behind-the-scenes material for Skyrim was damning. The silver bullet for Bethesda being transparent about their process was the Bethesda Mod Jam. This was the week in 2012 where designers were allowed to do whatever they wanted and the results were advertised to the world. In just one week, the developers were able to add dozens of requested and desired features. Even if half of them were barely functional and needed a ton more work, the messaging was clear. Bethesda was not saddled with a lack of time, but an intentional vision that was stripping down the mechanics and simplifying things. They exposed that Skyrim was as simple as it was on purpose. I know this isn't what any Starfield fan wants to hear from me, but I feel like I need to make this clear. No one other than Todd Howard himself is authorized to talk publicly about unreleased game info. That's the job of our PR slash marketing slash community folks. I can't share my opinions on game content. I can't talk about performance. I can't discuss, well, most things. I signed an NDA. I'm a professional. I don't want to get fired. Now sure, developers signing non-disclosure agreements is nothing new. But it's very clear that they muzzled Immel because even in the short controlled interviews he's allowed to do, almost everything he says is a damning indictment of Bethesda's design practices. Literally all you have to do is let him talk and he'll tell on himself the entire time. My ritual is to just go. I, I just like, I, I mean, I, I like stream of conscious. I think like I sometimes can be a little bit manic, but like my my process is just like, it might be sending an email with dialogue. It's just like, hey, let's talk this out. Let's do it. Like I, there's no, the, the process is really just like, let's do it. Let's go and, and like create as soon as, and like, with that, we finally made it to New Atlantis, but we still aren't free. I mean, technically we could be. While you aren't allowed to use the frontier to fast travel anywhere else without main quest progress, you are free to do any side quest in New Atlantis that you want. And if you were able to acquire enough credits while in the city, you could purchase your own ship and use it to travel without continuing the main quest any further. However, I consider this an extremely unlikely thing for people to do when the alternative is a single conversation with Constellation. I know it's a role-playing option, but it's pretty extreme just to break out of the shackles of this railroaded introduction. Also, you can actually commandeer one of the Crimson Fleet ships that attacks you before the Crete research base, but they're also locked down by Protocol Indigo. So being able to bypass Constellation by buying a ship is more likely an oversight than an intended mechanic. Shout out to Private Sessions for helping test this with me. However, it's further established that Constellation actually has a protocol for this exact scenario in order to prevent us from stealing their ship. Which means this must happen more often than never. This protocol has big implications for the story later, no I'm not joking. 
There's also a very slim window of opportunity where we're in Constellation and can take the frontier, but not saddled with an active quest. You can even be stuck with a companion if you go one dialogue too far. This game's main quest is determined to not let us break up with it. Let's talk about step off moments. This is a buzz term that was used all throughout Starfield's development and promotion. There is. Look, the way the, the game starts is pretty set for everybody. Yeah. Um, so we, we definitely have the, what we call the step out moment. And we, we probably have a few of them given the scale of the game. The, the early ones are the ones that we do spend time on to make sure it's impactful when you finally get to see the you know, surface of the planet or what that planet looks like from space. We always have that step out moment into the world, so to say. Technology has changed. We've all changed. So our expectations when loading up a game, like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out, and there's gonna be this moment. Us being able to do that and have it feel new, every generation, every game, is something that is really special about what we do. I like to say that Starfield has two step out moments. It's cryptic. I think it's okay to let just like the time settle, meaning you step out. How does the wind sound? How are the trees moving? How are the clouds moving? So when you step out, you feel like you're experiencing the outside world. Like you feel a little bit of the loss of it being destroyed because you were there. You feel the loss of your family. And the game throws a lot of mechanics at you. And it's intentional that you're trying to find your way. It takes a little while for you to feel comfortable in that world. My favorite part is every time you step out on a planet, it's a unique experience. The, the moment when you step out into the open world in Oblivion is like an all-time, like instant great gaming memory for me. Yeah, and for the time, it's such a wow moment. Yeah. Given gaming at the time, I think if you go back and look at it, you're like, ah, that's all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> Todd talks a lot about step out moments. Um, and that game, out of, out of really any game that I've played years since, that growing up in the vault sequence, growing up in having a building relationship, and the moment when you walk out and the world opens below you, no matter how old I get, I will never forget that moment. As far as thinking about moments like that that have such a strong resonance with the character, um, how does this creating that come about? Do you think about that early on, like we have to create a step out moment, and then you kind of work backwards from that? Or does it just kind of evolve organically? We're like, this is going to be the moment right here because it feels right. That is the, that is the seed that comes from Todd Howard, the wellspring yeah. from which the game flows. It's always the very beginning moment. It, it always starts with Todd and where he wants to see it, it's, yeah, he's great about that. Step off moments are defined as that moment after you exit the tutorial dungeon in Elder Scrolls or the vault in Fallout, where you first enter the open world. It's ironic that the term was focused on so heavily considering Starfield ultimately lacks such a moment. All right, poll time. Is Starfield's step off moment when we first exit the building at Argos Extractors? Is it when we first enter space? Is it on Crete? Or is it our arrival at New Atlantis? See, the formula up until now is that the step-off moment is the first time you're in the open world and you're no longer under the control of the introduction. When you exit the cave at Helgen, you're free to play Skyrim however you want from there. Starfield doesn't have that. The fact that people didn't even know they were still in the tutorial really speaks to Starfield lacking a strong, defining moment of player freedom. And that's why I say it doesn't have one. Todd did say there were two, so I have to imagine the first is when we first exit the building on Vectera, and the second is in orbit of Vectera. One is the step-off moment for a new character, the other is a step-off moment for New Game Plus. But that doesn't work when Protocol Indigo is a thing. The first step-off moment is really the moment that the developer has to trust the player, and since that never seems to come, I think Starfield's true step-off moment is this. I suppose I must rip the band-aid off at this point. If I were to do an analysis of Fallout 4, I feel that covering the main story between our departure from the vault to our arrival at the Institute, without revealing that our missing son is actually the leader of the Institute, a faction that everyone will meet hates, that you will invariably waste time in that analysis. Because of that twist, you have to reanalyze Fallout 4's first act in that context. Whatever interesting intrigue you thought was being set up has to go out the window. Starfield suffers from the same problem, which is alarming to say the least. One of the benefits that Starfield enjoys, which Bethesda did not have with their prior titles, is that Starfield is a new intellectual property. 
A common trope of Bethesda writing is that they often violate their own canon. While this is true of all of their games, it stems from a basic creative decision. Internally, the policy is that the writing of new material overrides strict adherence to old canon. I actually think that can occasionally be a prudent thing to do, but only in the interest of doing something interesting. To mind, Bungie with Halo Reach made decisions that retconned the novels Fall of Reach and Ghosts of Onyx. However, despite these canon violations, Reach also uses material from those novels in order to tell its story and attempts to smooth over the seams. As a result, people don't tend to as heavily criticize Reach as they do Fallout 3 and 4. Also, bear in mind, the team at Bethesda were almost entirely working with franchises that they did not originally create. The founders of Elder Scrolls were largely gone by 1999, when the company restructured, and the founders of Fallout never worked for Bethesda. In terms of Todd Howard himself, outside of a few amateur coding projects when he was young, he's never worked on a new IP, let alone helmed one. However, that really hasn't helped them. The great thing about not having existing canon to comply with is that another common shield goes out the window. You can't say I'm just nitpicking about retcons if there's not an existing continuity to retroactively change. In theory, the big benefit for Bethesda is complete creative freedom. They can put whatever Kims they want in whatever containers they want to because there's no quest in Fallout 2 that says otherwise. The downside is that it is up to them to create an interesting continuity and setting to explore completely from scratch. I could say that, but Starfield is all new. Right. But it was so new that you had no basis. You're kind of starting from scratch. And that's also can be had its own challenges. Now, I have heard, even from Bethesda fans, that I should not go into these games expecting a good story. At best, the claim will be made that the story merely has to be functional in order to introduce the mechanics. I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree for a few reasons. Firstly, Todd stated that the main storyline was going to be 30 to 40 hours long. But if our previous ones, if we aimed for, let's say, a 25 hour main quest, this one might be in the 30s, maybe, maybe 40 just for the main quest, but yeah. You simply do not spend that much time and effort on something you don't expect players to do. In fact, Starfield was marketed that its main storyline was going to be a key selling point. There is a particular argument I have heard before that, while I do not like, I do feel the need to discuss. The argument goes that Bethesda is consistently bad at doing main storylines, so it might be better if they stopped. I don't like this argument because it assumes a lack of ability to improve and takes away creative license. However, I do have to confess that they've had a long time and many chances to demonstrate improvement and haven't. At some point you need to tell that friend that no, a 21st year of doing stand-up comedy may not result in their breakout moment. I think about how much effort went into the main quest and how if that effort had been put elsewhere, how much better the side content could be instead. Will Shen is the lead quest designer on Starfield, his resume including several side quests from Markarth as well as Azura's quest in Skyrim. Sorry, correction in editing, I have to do the Wikipedia thing and update that is to a was. He didn't die though, thankfully, he only left the company. But it was funny editing my script and realizing that statement had already aged. His work isn't groundbreaking storytelling, but it is interesting to imagine the what if if the side content was the main story. It's the most directly transferable skill set, simply changing a mentality of design. It's an apples to apples transfer, not like saying they should stop making main quests to focus on making more music. Instead, and I was shocked that they admitted that Starfield's development began with its ending. An ending that Will Shin says is his favorite part of the game. So let's hear some of their favorite moments. The ending. To be frank, from my impression of just playing Starfield, I had assumed that the ending was a year four or five edition. A neat feature someone came up with that they managed to backfill material for, not an actual design goal from the outset. In order to really understand Starfield's main quest, we need to start at the ending. New Game Plus is not a bad idea to add to the Bethesda formula. In fact, it's a solution to many of the problems I've discussed with the Elder Scrolls games. If anything, New Game Plus could help Fallout 4, which was probably part of the motivation to implement it. But, 
for some reason, they decided to create an in-universe explanation for New Game Plus. Instead of creating opportunities, they created restrictions. Questlines could be incentivized to become multifaceted and present many different options as replayability is baked into the game. Continuous progression gels well with continuous skill-based leveling. Essential NPCs are no longer necessary if I can restart the universe. In fact, per the rules of the story, you could design a backdoor route to completing the main quest without talking to a single NPC in Starfield. Starfield could actually mirror the freedom that Morrowind gave. So for, for Morrowind, um, we were much more cavalier about it. And, you know, um, we had that, that message box that would come up that would say, you know, you've severed the thread of prophecy. And Little we Mimi just said, like, days, yeah. you're on your own, pal. <laughs> um, for, for Oblivion onward, I think, you know, we do the best we can to find as many of these things ahead of time but you know it's it's definitely it's a challenge of making a big open world game is that it is difficult to anticipate everything the player can do mm -hmm. um and i do think that to a certain degree it goes into the writing is like you you you're you're trying to craft a, a story that is for the most part pretty linear um but you're going into it with the understanding that at any point the player can pull out a sword or a gun or just walk away from it forever yeah ah you see essential npcs are necessary because well they just are okay someone might ruin our linear story if we let them do whatever they want so the main problem as always is having a way they expect players to play and needing contingencies for when the player decides to deviate from the rails of their ride that's what I mean when I suggest that Bethesda's goals with New Game Plus are backwards. They're too focused on giving it a lore explanation and not how it can fundamentally uplift their design ethos. There are only so many ways you can diegetically explain a mechanic like this, which is why if they decide to bring it to Tez 6, I hope they, they should just bring the mechanic and not try to write an explanation for it. Please, do not break the canon further by trying to explain in-universe why I can do New Game Plus and Elder Scrolls 6. I don't care if Akatosh and Dragon Breaks already exist, it's not necessary. Starfield's big twist is that the artifacts we are hunting grant us access to something called the Unity, but there are mysterious entities pursuing the artifacts as well. The Unity unlocks access to the multiverse, returning us to a prior point in time in the next universe, and that these beings are actually alternate universe incarnations of characters we've met called Starborn. Yes, unironically, we are Kunalakin, Starborn. I mean, you guys are basically writing a multiverse every time you write a storyline. Multiverse. Every time you write a storyline. However, it does not stop there. We are permitted to bring forward our knowledge from Universe 1 in order to affect events in Universe 2 through specialized Starborn dialogue checks. For example, explaining up front to Constellation the entire main story, thereby skipping the mystery components. Or you could replay the main quest but change a key event. For example, warning Constellation of an imminent attack, thereby saving a companion's life. If this is starting to sound interesting, then I'm afraid that I've already revealed most of the interesting things Bethesda will do with this premise. The majority of its usage is largely to just skip bribes and persuasion checks. In Fallout 3, we try to handle so much, we ended up having a rule. Like, the player can only have... The player can only make two decisions before we have to say enough. Like, you can, like, accept a quest from someone and then, because in Fall 3, you could kill almost anyone. You could kill your quest giver left and right. And so we really wanted to be, like, you kill the quest giver, but you can still complete the quest. And then what if I decide to do this? At some point, we're like, okay, we can't let the player do everything, you know? I will predict now that Starfield quote analysis unquote videos of the future will heavily praise this premise whilst leaving out the myriad of aspects by which this idea completely and utterly fumbles. A couple tasty morsels does not excuse a mile of broken glass. We are the Starborn, which unlocks an ancient and mystical power exclusive to us, which we empower through the discovery of ancient temples and Yes, this is Skyrim. You were sold Skyrim again. You were literally sold space Skyrim. I have taken a rather large enjoyment in seeing the spoiler-conscious culture attempting to broach the topic and advise people on how exactly they should play Starfield without revealing why they should play Starfield in those ways. Actually, Super Rad basically admitted that details about the system were not supposed to be revealed in day one reviews, which was corroborated by other reviewers blurring out main quest objectives in the power screen. 
The only rules necessary to follow were or certain spoilers surrounding the game. This matches with similar requests, rather than mandates since I didn't have to sign anything, that I got with my review copy of Cyberpunk 2077, asking I not discuss things like the Black Wall in a day one review. So in a way, Bethesda engineered the confusion about New Game Plus, which is further hilarious because it's definitely an element that is helping fuel the fire against the game. Pete Hines suggested a week before launch that Starfield doesn't really open up until you complete the main quest. But I'm here to tell you that this game doesn't really even get going until you finish the main quest. Okay. Meaning that rather than embracing the defense that the main quest is always bad, the main quest has become a pivotal cornerstone of even being able to enjoy Starfield. It's hilarious, to say the least, especially since many reviewers tried to act like not discussing spoilers was a public service, thereby further enabling public confusion. Even as of my initial writing two weeks post-launch, I'm not really certain there's good advice published online in a way that most new players would benefit from. I can give that advice, but I doubt many people will be playing Starfield because of this video. In my opinion, Starfield is completely playable without completing the main quest first, and if anything, the reveal of a universal reset and additional choices upon doing so might come off as more delightful the later you do it, rather than earlier. The concern I've read from a few people who haven't played the game but do know about New Game Plus is that by resetting your universe, you're also losing whatever progress and stuff you've gotten. But too long, we'll talk about it later. I don't necessarily think this is the biggest deal. As someone who's very much used to starting new games in Morrowind, losing all of my digital stuff is a feature, not an issue. They very easily could have come up with a way of communicating to prospective players that New Game Plus wiping your digital hoard is not the worst thing. The bizarre part though, where that lack of central design document comes in, is character creation. It's New Game Plus but without character recreation. Meaning that if you wanted to actually do your second playthrough with new traits, like having parents or being a member of a religion, you can't do that. Or at least you have to actually start a new Universe 1, rather than changing your traits for Universe 2. So when I'm asked the question who I will be in the next universe, I guess the answer is a wanted Taskmaster from the Freestar Collective, just like I was in Universe 1, and will be in Universes 2 through 10. But our character progression does carry over. Character leveling is slow, to say the least. To summarize my playthrough, Universe 1 was exclusively the main quest, Universes 2 through 6 were all run-throughs where I skipped the main quest and rushed to the ending, Universe 7 was a run where I did most of the content, Universe 8 was another skipped main quest, and the beginning of Universe 9 was where I wrapped things up and solely continued playing for testing things while writing. Ultimately, it's a confused design. I don't understand the claim that Starfield is replayable with built-in New Game Plus while simultaneously not allowing a fundamental redefinition of who our character is. Especially since there are unique things that can happen in subsequent universes, like a universe where you meet yourself. That's not going to happen if each new character I play is truly a new character, but that is the only way I'm going to see those House Varun lines. I encountered my first unique universe within two days of playing, and that really cemented my decision against starting absolutely new characters as I had planned prior to playing Starfield. Unfortunately, this meant I just didn't get to see things like the parents trait or the adoring fan trait. And sure, that means there are lots of things to potentially see, but they're spread out very far apart amongst the same stuff you've already seen. Is it really worth replaying a bad questline 99% just to maybe see a couple new lines of dialogue? This is confusing to say the least. It makes sense being there was no design document to resolve which method players should ultimately be encouraged to use for multiple playthroughs. So we got both. After a universal reset, we appear in orbit of Vectera on the first day we played, in possession of both a starborn ship, but also the frontier. Somehow, Vasco will complete the delivery of the artifact we originally found without us, or the ship, and the ship is no longer hobbled by Protocol Indigo. However, in Universe 5, somehow Vasco and this universe's version of Malcolm Reynolds manage to deliver the artifact without the frontier. In every other universe, I don't know what happened to the native Malcolm, but apparently he ran off after Crete. So I guess normally we just have a clone running around being unaccounted for. Hope he appreciates those bounties. Either self-inserting because that's the patrician way to play these kind of games. News to me, although it's unsurprising how many YouTubers did a similar thing. It's almost like we're narcissists. 
I don't really want to play as a fat, balding 40-year-old man. The problem, the Reynolds we meet is a wildly different character. He's still a former employee of Vargos Extractors, but his parents are still alive, and he's a UC citizen. That's wildly different from the traits I chose. I have a theory that this was actually the preset background that our voice protagonist was going to have, hence why there's so much content tied to your parents, for example. I really am fascinated by these mid-development build ideas, and it is a shame there's no making of documentary to talk about them. The story does establish that not every person in each multiverse is exactly the same, and there are gradual deviations that form. But the problem is that generally, Malcolm seems to be the same guy in each run who leaves Vectera to go join Constellation since our incarnation of this character is not the first version of us that the other Starborn have met. If the context for our character completely changes depending on what universe we're in, then surely our choices would as well. I mean, I guess that explains why we don't run into ourselves in every universe, but it also means that other people should be changing equally dramatically between universes. The differences between growing up in the UC versus being a free star settler are very significant, to the point that I would raise the obvious question about whether we truly are the same person or just have the same name. Do you see why you don't write multiverses? Why almost every single story in the last decade to try to tackle the multiverse has completely failed? If they couldn't nail the fundamentals of world building with Fallout 4, I don't see why they thought they should take it a step further and play on narrative hard mode. And this isn't even counting the potential universe where the Constellation Gang is missing and instead replaced with an entire selection of ourselves. I personally didn't see this universe, but this raises many questions for no reason other than to be a shocking revelation to blow fans' minds. It's like writing a story specifically for the kinds of people that fight console wars on Twitter, which is what Starfield boils down to as a game. Given it's a new IP, they could have written a rule set and explanations for all of my questions and points. It's not like there was a prior Starfield game with established rules they had to work around, as was often the problem for Fallout 4. However, this goes much deeper. I didn't know while playing because it was revealed a couple days later that the ending was a design consideration since the beginning. This creates problems. In Universe 7, I replayed the main quest. I am roleplaying as somebody who is roleplaying as themselves being unaware of future plot points. But it is a mystery story and the problems become apparent. After being initiated into Constellation, the leader Space Delphine, aka Sarah Morgan, takes us over to meet with the recruiter for the UC Vanguard questline who gives us information on a Vanguard pilot who patrols the Soul System, who has an artifact as decoration on his ship. I feel like the obvious point here to raise is that this quest could have been structured in a way that there could be a Starborn check to skip meeting with the Vanguard recruiter. However, this would also mean you would skip meeting the Vanguard recruiter, which is a problem as this questline is attempting to shill other storylines to you, one which has an upfront exposition dump to explain the background of this setting. I actually think my opinion of this game and its setting would have been much worse had I actually been forced to sit through this game's history lesson in the first couple of hours, instead of after I had a couple days to explore the setting for myself. I don't think the history lesson should exist. At all. The settled systems exist, and you should be learning elements about its history and culture through the narratives. I think a lot of amateur writers assume that history lessons are important for giving the audience the context needed to understand what is happening, without understanding that learning the context is an even more valuable component of storytelling. A well-documented timeline of events that defined the history of the settled systems is not something players should be seeing in Hour 2 of playing Starfield. Rather, a well-documented timeline of events that define the history of the settled systems is something that should be written down in a design document and then referenced throughout the entire game. Side note, I was going to make an effort to call them missions instead of quests, but it turns out that internally Bethesda never stopped calling them quests either. The other part is that quote lore unquote of the game is entirely functional. By that I mean, if there is a piece of information established in the setting, it's going to tie into a component of some kind of questline. The Vanguard storyline is definitely the most prominent about doing this. Like, realistically, Vanguard applicants don't need to learn specifically about a place like Londinian or Terramorphs, or if they do, they would need to equally learn about Earth or artificial intelligence. But because the Vanguard questline is specifically about terror morphs and a key setting of the questline is Londinian, those elements are included. It would be akin to including the Contras in a short presentation about American history. While it can be admirable to have a script so tight that every single piece of information is relevant to the storytelling, in Bethesda's case it shows off the game's rather anemic lore. 
You want tight lore in a tightly constructed story, which is what open world games are not. I have a theory that the pre-launch timeline they showed off was the entire extent of the game's setting that was written internally during development. The problem this creates is that Starfield does not feel like a lived-in setting. In Universe 1, this is a quest that is supposed to introduce what exactly happened to Earth between today and 2330. I actually think it's introduced at exactly the right time. Setting the tutorial in the Soul System would be too early, but sending us here now coincides with what is natural curiosity about what happened to our home planet. It's akin to people trying to find their house in Flight Simulator. There are some additional tutorials to this sequence, particularly for ships as it introduces stealth ship sequences, which aren't really a thing anywhere else, as well as the more useful skill of boarding. However, in Universe 7, I already know that the ship we're looking for is in Neptune's orbit. Despite that, we have to go to Sidonia and track down the bar the pilot frequents. But there is a Starborn check that skips straight to him telling us to go to Venus, which then sends us to a star yard near the moon before finally reaching Neptune. So even though we do have the option to skip something, what we're skipping is just a bribe or persuasion minigame, not really anything meaningful. So imagine my surprise when I confidently went to test this in Universe 9, only to find out that you actually can go to Neptune and find the ship's pilot. You can't do this until you've visited the Mast Building, meaning that you cannot do a hypothetical run where you collect all artifacts without involving Constellation, simply by remembering where you found all of them. But, I do have to give the game credit for allowing players to skip the more tedious parts of this quest, if they can remember where exactly they need to go. I would prefer if it went a step further by having Moara exist at the start, but I still acknowledge this is better than spawning him in only after completing the railroaded objectives. This will not be a consistent feature of this questline, but still. I hope you can understand the rationale for why I decided to tackle the storyline in this manner. By working from the twist first, I actually have come to a greater understanding and appreciation of Starfield. If I was just working off of my first playthrough of the main story, my opinion would be lower. Not much lower than it is, but still lower. It's not perfect. Moara wasn't at Neptune because of anything to do with us meeting Commander Tuala. It's akin to how completing a quest in Diamond City will cause a board at Fort Hagen to fall down, opening the path to finding Kellogg. Or how the mining operation at Ustengrav will only complete if you meet the Greybeards. It is linear quest sequencing for a story that is trying to be above linearity. At the very least, you can say that it's unlikely you can create a good roleplay friendly reason for why the player would seek out Fort Hagen or Ustengrav before their relevant points in the main narrative. For those games, I'm only doing that because I'm metagaming. But metagaming the narrative is now an intended part of the story. If your counterpoint is that I'm expecting too much, then you understand my argument completely. It is absolutely above Bethesda's pay grade to craft a narrative that can account for Multiversal 4 knowledge. This is still the team that made Fallout 4, after all. I mean, I will give points where they are due, but the deal is that you also have to remove your points from your score when you learn where those ideas fell short. And as I've presented, it's not like there are huge workloads involved to account for these things. I mean, Sure, an entire alternate campaign where the player keeps suspiciously knowing things they shouldn't know, that could get messy. But Moara existing early and being able to be found could result in just a generic confrontation that then leads into the skipped version of the main quest. Just something to think about. The quest itself is just more tutorial. After arriving in Seoul, we're directed towards Sidonia, which I think Bethesda counts as their fourth major city. I say believe, as it definitely falls short of the other confirmed big three. A lot of people groaned in unison when Sidonia was shown to have a prominent X hours since injury board, anticipating a horrible rerun of Outer Worlds style anti-corporate enlightened centricism. Luckily it's just boring. That's where we're at now, breathing sighs of relief when someone settles for being boring. One of those details people coom over in these games is that the hours tracker updates if an NPC is killed in the city. However, this happens almost instantaneously. It's not updated by a human. I guess people here just have life support monitors. Like, you do get points for trying and then lose those points for doing it in this way. I have to give credit for the game taking nuanced positions. There are evil mining companies and there are not so evil ones. There are evil spaceship corporations and there's decent ones. Sidonia is a terrible place to live, but it's a byproduct of our solar system drying up economically after the loss of Earth. 
I also think that it's a bit of an interesting introduction to what happened to Earth, as long as you don't actually ask about what happened. Immel has stated that he discourages his designers from doing lore bombs, even though he often ends up writing his own. But that's still a commendable idea. Because we don't want the player's interactive, interactive experience to just be sitting there listening to dialogue and reading books. And so this, what this is right here, lore bombs, no lore bombs. That's what we call them at the studio. A lore bomb is any time there's a giant dump of text or audio that explains something away. The player shouldn't be told what happened to Earth. Either a character already knows, or we don't care as it's just history at this point. The reason the question exists is because the player doesn't know. But again, I find it a compelling mystery and was more interested in the game because I actively avoided dialogue options that directly answered the question. There is a main quest that details what exactly happened later on, but you also get the Cliff Notes version here. But it's also a perfectly answerable question in its own right if you decide to explore. If you look at Earth on the star map, you can study its details to realize it has no magnetosphere, which is slightly important to our planet. As fun as the small mystery is, Earth was done supremely lazily. In around 130 years, almost all traces of life and humanity on this planet have been replaced by an endless ocean of sandy dunes. I suppose that's a nice segue. Earth was handled lazily, and I say that in context of what this game accomplishes elsewhere. There's a few key points. I decided to land down in West Virginia to set up a base, as it would provide amusing continuity from the Fallout 76 video. Well, if you thought 76 couldn't replicate the Appalachian Mountains, they didn't even try here. But let's back up. On the navigation screen, as long as we're in orbit, we can select any point on a planet that is not ocean and land there. However, this is really just a biome map, upon which the game takes your request and generates a roughly 64 square kilometer space of procedural generation. So you can land pretty much anywhere on Earth, not that you'd really want to. This game is capable of putting multiple biomes on a planet, including actual mountain ranges. So Earth being relegated to a giant sandy desert is bizarre. Especially since there are obviously recognizable geographic features from orbit, like mountains and continental margins that should have been their own biomes. I think the striking thing about Earth is how empty it is compared to other dead rocks in this game. Set down at a random spot on any given moon, and you're bound to find some facility and a couple ships willing to touch down in your little patch of nowhere. Like, Earth is still more resource valuable than 90% of the planets that only have helium and aluminum. I think the goal is just to showcase how striking a truly barren post-apocalyptic Earth is. Wait, post-apocalyptic? 200 years post-apocalypse with a recent war that touched all corners of civilization just 20 years prior? Oh my god, it, it really is Skyrim in space. But I digress. Invisible walls. The supposedly obvious element of exploration in this game that no one was talking about until some guy leaked it on 4chan a week before launch. At no point in the Starfield Direct did they say that we would be able to explore a planet in its entirety on foot, landing and flying through any area of the planet that we want to, a la No Man's Sky. That was not said. And that was deliberately not said because that is just not the case. That is not how the game works. Guys, Todd warned us this was going to happen. Once you do get on a planet, you are not free to walk all the way around it and end up back where you started. There seems to be some confusion out there about what was said by Bethesda in regard to walking around a planet. Um, at Bethesda, when I land on a planet, will I be able to explore that whole entire planet? Yep, if you want. Walk on, brave explorer. Stated by Pete Hines, former Bethesda head of publishing. I love the perpetual goalpost shifting on this issue. Things very quickly went from, they didn't lie about this, to, well, why would you even want to anyways? To list a few reasons, there are challenges on the internet to circumnavigate a planet in No Man's Sky. Perhaps I want to approach an area by complete stealth, landing some distance away and tracking there. Perhaps I simply want to explore, to do the challenge of seeing an entire planet on foot. 
Someone 100% surveyed every planet in the game, so it's obviously not unreasonable to assume that someone would want to be given boundless freedom to 100% survey a single planet. If you aren't reaching the map boundary through normal gameplay, that's not because you wouldn't ever want to explore past the bounds of the map. It's because the maps in Starfield are boring. Roughly speaking, it takes about 10 minutes to reach the edge of the map, which puts the playable space of a landing site at roughly the same size or smaller than most of the handcrafted Bethesda games. Which sounds great until you remember that not much handcrafting has been done to flesh out these spaces, so the majority of the map is just walking through proc-gen hills and valleys. Which is not something I'll complain about. I mean, I do think it sucks that I have to actually walk everywhere on the planet's surface. The lack of ground vehicles is very noticeable. For reference, there are 343 places in Skyrim and 367 places in Oblivion, as well as horses. For the same surface area, there are like a dozen in Starfield and no ground vehicles. I think an ATV could really help Starfield out. And no, the boost pack is not a replacement for a ground vehicle. This is because any given spawn on a planet, even ones that are the location of a quest, are effectively equivalent to Oblivion gates. Oblivion had 100 possible gate locations, with 50 radiantly appearing in addition to 10 fixed gates. However, those 50 non-fixed gates are randomly chosen from a list of 7 potential gate types, with an additional layer of randomness for 5 of those gate types having a randomly chosen sigil keep at the end. Planets are akin to gates, as landing on one is effectively rolling the dice on what you'll get. There are, of course, many more world slivers than there were gates, but are seemingly valueless to explore. If there is value, the game does a very bad job of communicating it. The simple fact is, you do a lot of running through empty spaces in this game, and there are only so many times I can run into generic space dungeons before I decide I value my time and go elsewhere. Starfield was originally pitched by Todd in 2013 as one of our games but in space, which is as meaningless a statement as one can be. Around the time uh, that Todd first pitched this to uh, our, our now departed uh, uh, chairman of Bethesda and Zenimax, Robert Altman, um, and he had this idea um, for wanting to do a space game, and this was eight years ago, mm -hmm. ten years ago, uh, and really, like, he had an idea, which was, I want to do a massive outer space game, and I want to call it Starfield. I think the inherent problem is that Bethesda's games have always relied on their world design to carry whatever other bad decisions they made. The companions can afford to be a terrible questline, because at least it takes place in Skyrim and gives you a platform to go get sidetracked. Even Fallout 76 is able to bear that weight simply by the merits of its world space. Starfield doesn't have that appeal for me. They claim that this game has the most handcrafted content out of any of theirs, yet it still feels like the scope of Skyrim, maybe less, and stretched far too thin. The world design has torn on this one. They relied on their greatest strength until it finally gave out. Um, as far as handcrafted content, more than any game we've done. Um, I've I've stopped giving out numbers. <laughs> um, and so the reality of Starfield switches from being a game where you freely explore to a game where you follow the narrative sequence hoping that it leads you to something interesting. Which is an alarming set of words, to say the least, considering exploration was the prior excuse for bad storytelling. A defense of Starfield invariably becomes circular logic, as whatever is currently being discussed is not the real reason for the game's existence. No matter what I talk about in this video, it will not be the real reason either. The circle will just keep spinning. Because, of course, the goal isn't to argue in good faith, just defend Starfield at all costs as a sort of tribalism. I think the most interesting failure of Starfield's world is the lack of focus on primary mission locations. True that it's unfair to expect a procedurally generated sliver with handcrafted buildings just plopped down on them to be interesting. But these consistent locations don't exactly fare much better. Saying that it is a different kind of exploration does not quite accurately portray the immense difference in design. And so we come to a staple question for modern Bethesda. Is the handcrafted content bad so that the radiant content is less obvious? Really, the important takeaway here is that Bethesda simply wasn't capable of making Starfield, not with their current design priorities. Let's return to the main quest. 
Artifact in hand, we've basically confirmed the theory that there is an entire set in need of collection, at which Constellation has several main leads for us to follow up on. This is as close to an official break-off moment as you are really afforded in this game. You're given three quests, each one leading to you picking up another of the four main companions. There's also not a looming threat against humanity or a missing relative we have to go seek out. Narratively, they have finally created a main quest that is low stakes again. Even though the game design was really hesitant up until this point to actually give us a solid opportunity to break off in pursuit of the side content, the hand-holding is finally easing up, several hours in. Of course, I was still pursuing the main quest under Pete Hines' sage advice that I need to rush the main quest first, a decision I particularly didn't regret. It's kind of ironic. A lot of attention is drawn to how unnatural it is that you are experiencing events through a reincarnation, but the reality is that I just didn't have very strong ties to my Universe 1, entirely because again, I was told I needed to rush the main quest first. So the game manages to be both urgent in trying to push you into doing the main quest, whilst also providing a strong foundation for why it's okay to go do side content along the way. As an example, it's here we meet Sam Ko, who is effectively Constellation's ambassador for the Freestar Collective. Universe 7 was interesting because I was mixing in faction quest lines with the main quest. The important thing being to make sure to bring along the Constellation companion closest in relevancy to the faction. This is more obvious for the UC Vanguard and Freestar Rangers, and less for the other two. But it is still weird to say that things open up after three or four hours, but I guess that's still preferable to saying something as insane as, the game clicks after 40 hours. I suppose it makes sense given that Todd said the game clicked for them seven years after pre-production. I thought we would find the answers faster, Howard admits, explaining that Starfield only clicked into feeling fun to play as late as last year. If there is a clicking point for Starfield, then that point needs to be moved much closer to the start of the game. There is no reason an entire work week of time investment is necessary for this entertainment product. It is seriously not that complex. It shouldn't take 40 hours. Anytime I've ever heard somebody say that a game clicked into being fun after 30 or 40 hours, I usually just think that no, it didn't really click into being fun. The Stockholm Syndrome just took over and you were really trying to justify your sunk cost by saying, no, no, I finally started having fun, guys. I think one of the most bizarre realizations about this game I had was two weeks before launch when I was re-watching the Direct and it clicked in my head that backgrounds are classes pretending otherwise. And it's strange that Bethesda is in denial that they've brought classes back. So we have moved away post, you know, Oblivion to a classless meaning you don't have a strict character class, warrior, mage, thief, whatever, um, in our games. In Starfield, there are 21 backgrounds, all of which are a description of the type of jobs we've had up to that point, affording us a selection of starting skills. In Oblivion, there are 21 classes, all of which are a description of the job we've had up until that point, affording us that you get it. Morrowind also has 21 classes. In those games, though, classes also define your character progression in the future, controlling how you level based on what skills you use. So it's not exactly the same, but picking a class does somewhat define your early game progression in Starfield as they unlock challenges you need to complete to advance. But backgrounds do maintain their relevance through the somewhat rare speech checks invoking our knowledge in a conversation. What's weird is they picked a really bad check to demonstrate this, which just came off similar to Fallout 4 charisma checks in order to just get paid more money. Whereas in Starfield, being a bounty hunter was not commonly referenced, and it didn't often make a huge difference to a quest. But when it was there, I often saw it as a strong contributor to a conversation, allowing me to roleplay as someone who actually lived in the universe before May 7th, 2330. And there was one big instance of it making a difference at the end of the Crimson Cringe questline. I mean, Morrowind didn't allow you to directly invoke your experience as a scout in conversations. Guys, I think I'm saying something positive about Starf- And of course, the inevitable pattern with this game continued. Something good in a sea of bad, lacking cohesion altogether. I already detailed the lack of character recreation, meaning any desire to try and see lines for other classes while also chipping away at your new game plus grind is impossible. The game is difficult to replay, yet endeavors to give you things to see should you decide to. I'm going to leave that task up to the historians to see how impactful these speech checks really are, 
That aside, backgrounds give you three starting skills, and I hate this system. Problem number one, no custom classes. This means you're at the mercy of the designers whether or not a good combination of skills are aligned with a class background you want to have. There was a leak a few days before launch of a PDF detailing all of the classes and skills in the game, which was valuable for coming to a decision before I had to play. Given its extreme specificity, I assume this was actually leaked by a very frustrated employee. I picked Bounty Hunter over a background more lore accurate to Malcolm Reynolds because Bounty Hunter is the single strongest starter class in the game. Most of the classes have two strong skills and one bad skills, and a few classes only have one strong skill. However, the reason I suggest the PDF was released by a frustrated employee is because the background and skill system is really bad. It upfront expects you to pick three skills based on vague descriptions of what they do, without any numerical elaboration. The problem with picking a class for a combat skill is that you have no idea if you're going to stick with the chosen weapon type. Space Scoundrel sounds like a great pick for Malcolm Reynolds until I found out that I really don't like how pistols play. But another component is that there are a lot of mandatory skills in Starfield. It's like they heard about the mono build problem Fallout 4 has after level 30 and decided to make an entire game with that in mind, as the goal. The majority of people I've talked to about Starfield seem to invest very few points into augmenting their ground combat abilities as there are simply too many other mandatory skills to buy first. Bounty Hunter is the only class to have three of those skills. Piloting is mandatory as it gates access to higher level ships. You need the first level of targeting control if you ever want to board non-essential ships. Yes, non-essential ships. And boost pack training is also fairly mandatory for all characters. For reference, after 100 hours, full run-throughs of the major quest lines, some side content action, and some new game plus grinding, I was only just above level 70 which means only 70 perk points to distribute. I think that roughly there are minimum 50 universal perks you need to pick up before you even really start to invest in combat or flavor abilities. So with that in mind, those three perk points up front start to become a lot more significant. As an example, here's what you would get out of investing in pistol certification. Up front, it only tells you that pistols are popular. What it actually does is increase your damage by 10%. Yep, yeah, that's it. But there is another added layer to the insanity of leveling in this game. See, to actually unlock rank 2 of pistol damage, you can't just drop a perk point. You also need to get 20 kills on enemies with a pistol. Not bad, in fact, very easy. Given how glacial leveling is, you will knock this challenge out before you even have another perk point to spend. But not all challenges are built equal. For example, leveling piloting to get access to those higher level ships you need requires you to destroy ships. This means there's a strong incentive to get cracking on some of the more tedious challenges early. Any ships you blow up before unlocking rank 1 piloting is just not counting towards that challenge progress. A strong motivator for progression in Starfield isn't just the mandatory abilities you need to pick up to unlock mechanics, but making sure you are picking up skills that unlock the challenges you need to unlock more skills as you complete challenge progress. So you'll just drop perk points in the most tedious skills to level early on, right? Wrong. See, skills are tiered, and you need to invest points in the skill subtype to unlock the skills you want to unlock the challenges for in order to ensure that nothing you do in this game is wasting challenge progress. And of course, because the leveling is glacial, wasting potential challenge progress is inevitable. And remember, I only got this far because of New Game Plus. A full playthrough of all four faction questlines in the main quest representing roughly 60 hours, eh, about 20 levels, four hours grinding through temples in New Game Plus, five levels. But the challenges themselves are a mixed bag. You can carefully disarm the system by engineering situations where you can grind challenges that are tedious, and some challenges are straight up underestimating the player. For example, I leveled the wellness challenge instantaneously by using a single med pack. Starfield does not have a good leveling system. It is an unholy fusion of Fallout and Elder Scrolls, perk points being unlocked through experience gained from quests and activities like Fallout, while challenge progress is unlocked through skill usage like Elder Scrolls. But that lack of a design document seems to be indicative that the quest designers were not exactly clear how much experience they should be rewarding for doing quests. So often you'll get 250 or 350 experience for completing an entire quest, but 100 from killing a moderate level enemy and 300 from blowing up a ship. And let me be honest with you, I'd rather get zero experience from crafting than one. In a game where levels are measured in the thousands of XP points, that's just petty. 
Turns out I was not big-brained enough to realize that crafting is an easy passive XP grind, even at just one experience point per craft. My bad, I didn't think to spam adaptive frames. Again, I'm sure whoever decided that needed to be the case was probably just unaware of how exactly leveling was balancing out across the board. They just didn't want to hear about crafting spam, but then they did it anyways. There is some metagame stuff I learned, like how you can massively supplement your XP by scanning every gas giant you see, because when you scan gas giants, they instantly complete the survey and you get the survey data, and it's decent money too. But I digress. I found it funny that I would complain about how long it took just to reach 70, only to find out that a lot of other people were 30 to 40 levels behind me for the same amount of time. And once again, this flares up against the general problem of being unsure whether I'm supposed to replay the game through New Game Plus or by starting a new character. For example, maybe the designers didn't intend for one character to do everything. Maybe I'm only supposed to get those really high level ships on a dedicated pilot character that only ever reaches level 25. Except that runs completely contrary to certain other progression mechanics this game has. Do you see how many problems that basic question and design going unanswered caused? But as a result, investing in combat skills is better in the late late game, when the game starts getting more tedious anyways as enemy scaling starts to catch up with weapon scaling. But this means that actually distinguished character builds take a lot longer to spool up. Or maybe you invest in combat first to define yourself in that aspect and then find yourself critically behind on tech and science skills needed to even access certain mechanics as you run out of content narratively and the leveling starts to slow down. Because there is a heavy mechanical imbalance between the difficulty of ground combat and space combat. Both are on the same difficulty meter, meaning one more reason to justify investing yourself in upgrading your ship over upgrading your guns. I also had a ton of stinker point investments I grabbed simply to level up the broader subtype, a good example being commerce. This is because valuable perks end up gated behind the tier system, but remember that you can't just rush leveling something useful like persuasion, because I also have to complete persuasion checks to unlock the ranks. You also can't refund invested perk points, which makes it interesting because Bethesda is ride or die on this one hardcore idea when every other major RPG out there is offering skill point refinancing at this stage. Even modern Fallout 76, which I'll be honest is just straight up better than Starfield at creating a system where you have distinguished combat build theory crafting, mixed with the essential home economics abilities that everyone needs without cross-contamination of the two. Short of a Cyberpunk 2.0 style rework completely overhauling progression by taking into consideration all of the sources of experience to speed up leveling, the easier solutions would be to either double all experience gain or double the number of perk points you gain per level. If that were the case, I'd be around level 140 instead of 70, which still wouldn't have half the total perks in the game, but would be a much more mechanically well-rounded playthrough. With our return to Constellation bearing an artifact, the main quest branches in three directions before returning to a central point. This is so that three new companions can be introduced. These are the other three of the big four constellation companions that received primary attention in development. There are supposedly 16 other named companions, but these are the main four with quests that can also be romanced. Four of them are from constellation and have the most story and interaction with the player, but all of the named characters have their own backgrounds and can follow you around and carry your stuff. When we first began Starfield pre-production, we often looked back at our previous games and realized how popular and effective the companions were. So they were a big priority for us, and we really wanted to tie them directly to the main quest. This information came from the Constellation Q&A, which took place on Bethesda's Discord server. See, throughout the marketing for 2021, Bethesda had emphasized that those who became Todd's kittens had a chance to have their questions answered. I almost thought they were going to go back on their word with this, but precisely two weeks before launch, right as review copies started to go out, the Q&A happened. Now historically, Bethesda has done these kinds of things before, but usually on forums that are easier to archive and access. Now it's all official Discord servers. And who would even be engaging with the community? Why, of course, Will Shin and Emil Pagliarulo. I even tried adding them, but they never accepted my friend request. Then, after Will left, they deleted his Discord account. Emil's is still there, though. Funny stuff. 
Anyways, the Q&A was all tame and boring questions, but as far as I could tell, were actually asked by humans and not just generated by the community manager, like Blizzard did. Given they had years worth of questions built up from Bethesda and Xbox fans, it was easy pickings to find 16 questions to answers that would not reveal anything useful about the game. It was funny knowing that Immel had to see my profile picture pop up as a super react while typing up an answer. Yeah, they didn't disable reactions. It was a mess and a waste of time, and one more reason why I don't believe anybody who says they didn't have the ability to explain Starfield properly. No, they did not try. This is also where the main quest started to falter, so I suppose let's jump into it. We first pick up Samco at the Lodge. He'll be heading with us to Aquila. Oh, Aquila City, specifically. This is because the city shares its name with the planet Aquila, but personally the name just bugs me. Actually a lot about Aquila bugs me, but let's stay focused. Upon arriving, I book it into the hills and find an unmarked point of interest guarded by some gang. This is me once again using my starborn foreknowledge to head straight for the artifact. However, the expected happens. The door just straight up doesn't work until we find the map that points us here. Unlike the prior quest, the game is not open to us sequence breaking. The map is in possession of Sam's father, but his house is completely locked up until we head into the local bank's vault. The bank is locked up too until we resolve the hostage crisis. Ah, I see. Aquila City conforms to the classic Bethesda roller coaster city design where a bunch of preordained events are supposed to happen upon our arrival in order to set up the local faction storyline. In this case, in order to create an inn with us to join the Freestar Rangers, there needs to be a hostage situation that we can help resolve because otherwise, the Marshal wouldn't have any reason to want us in the organization. But the hostage situation is independent of coming to Aquila with Sam Co. There is some extra dialogue if he's present, but he's not necessary to complete it. The Rangers are not gated behind doing the main quest, but my first run, where I did exclusively main quests, there was a single Ranger quest in my completion log. The quest objective here literally tells you to complete another quest first. So, Sam's quest is pushing you to join the Rangers, just like Sarah's quest pushed you to join the Vanguard. This is also so that, once we are in the vault, we find out that Sam's dad has taken the map we need in order to force his son to have a conversation with him. Sam is the only one of the four main companions to be written in a way where you are forced to learn personal details about him relevant to his quest. Every other companion reserves those details until you spend time with them. See, when Sam signed on, he also insisted we take his daughter with him, which is not a terribly unusual request until he joins your crew and continues to insist his daughter ride along with us. Sam is a healthy heaping of unwelcome family drama. We have to help with his daddy issues, in both the sense of being a father and dealing with his own father, to get the map we need. What's funny is that Sam's father mainly uses the argument that Aquila needs Sam, but is vague about for what? They also switched the active quest objective on you to the ranger quest instead of the constellation quest that we were already doing. Even now, I couldn't answer what exactly is more important than space exploration in Aquila, and of course, the map is located within a room that cannot be accessed until the correct trigger is hit. And I mean literally, the door is not locked, it's straight up non-interactive. I'm pretty sure this is the first time they've ever done something like that. Let's pause for a second so you can better understand. The other two quests we got are to search for Barrett from the beginning as well as a yet unintroduced companion. In both of these quests, there are some objectives that need to be completed to find out where they are. However, you could also go straight to where they're located and find them, akin to going straight to Neptune earlier. I bring this up to emphasize that so far, it is literally only Sam's quest that has been designed to almost completely disregard this facet of Starborn foreknowledge. There are still Starborn dialogue checks to skip a few things, but our actual memory of where to go is disregarded, similar to every Bethesda game post-Oblivion. Which is ironic, because I needed my footage from Universe 1 to know which planets to go to in order to complete the other quests. Sam's is the only one where I actually remembered exactly where I needed to go, largely because it takes place in the same world space as the city, which is another unique element of this quest. There are, to memory, no other instances of being sent from a settlement out to a location within one or two kilometers of that settlement 
in any of the main storylines for this game. Technically not true, the Vanguard questline has one. It's just boring and I didn't remember it when I was writing the previous sentence. But uh, this quest is different for sure. And you can probably guess why that is. No design document. Whoever designed the staging for this quest was literally not on the same page with the rest of the team in many different ways. It's fascinating because while it is disappointing that I could not sequence break the quest, the quest also stood out to me for the simple fact that it felt more like a traditional Bethesda game mission where I leave a town and go out on an adventure without any interstitial menus, fast travel, or loading screens necessary. So of course there was a devastating visual bug. When I was heading out to the empty nest, the shader cache for my game corrupted and planet Aquila turned into the shadow realm. Since this happened literally on launch day, even diagnosing the problem was a small challenge. It was kind of cool, but also made it hard to navigate interiors. Eventually I got lucky and someone else on the Steam forum had the same problem and I found out it was a shader thing and managed to fix it by deleting the shader folder. I guess file verification doesn't check the shader cache. It fits that out of all the times in the entire game it could have happened, this was where it did. Also, there's a consistent issue with Shaw's idle animation and dialogue. She's supposed to be resting a gun on her shoulder, but it was animated around the lawgiver, which two out of three times I did this quest, she didn't have. You might say, wouldn't that simply be fixed by making her consistently have a lawgiver? And yeah, it would. I don't know why this is an issue. <laughs> Aquila City, I'm not a fan. I don't know where to start. I mean, visually looking at my footage of the city should be setting off alarms. I suppose we'll start with this. It seems the artistic decision was made not to tackle the world-building issue of handling the effects that various planets' different gravities would have on the human body. I mean, outside of a single-player trait, that is. So the player can be the only person in the subtle systems affected by this, barring any potential side quests I happened to not do. But that's kind of the thing, if you decide to not handle the topic, that means you can't use it in your storytelling. Aquila and their ally Neon are both planets that are around 1.5 times Earth's gravity. What that means is you weigh 1.5 times more on these planets than you do on Earth, but with the same muscles that are conditioned to support your current Earth weight. New Atlantis, meanwhile, is at 0.9 times Earth's gravity, meaning you would weigh less with the same muscles. The reason Earth is specified, of course, is that, you know, all knowledge of human physiology stems from an understanding of how humans develop and operate at one times Earth's gravity, with a more limited pool of knowledge in the past few decades for how human bodies react to living in zero-g. However, this is a video game that often had issues sinking a dungeon's gravity with the planet that dungeon was on, defaulting to 1G. So it's not really surprising that Bethesda would not be keen on tackling a topic that a lot of science fiction either avoids or only pays lip service to, because this is absolutely the kind of thing you need a design document to tackle correctly. A lot of the core planets that are featured in this game don't really exist, which means that they can't be fact-checked, and that they can make up pretty much whatever they want to about these planets. The problem is, it is difficult to get on Starfield's wavelength when it comes to designers' understanding of science because they make some pretty basic mistakes. Neon is cited as a pleasure city, while Paradiso is cited as a vacation destination. Nobody would vacation on a planet above 1G. If you were conditioned to life in New Atlantis, you would suffer the world's worst case of interstellar jet lag, combined with extreme physical discomfort. But where this really falls apart is that mechanically, the game accounts for different gravities and their effects. Not only is jump height and oxygen exerted affected by gravity, but fall damage distances are as well. It's a bit trippy realizing I actually have to pay more attention to my fall distance on Aquila, let alone any planets I visit above 2G. They even added a status effect for injuries acquired through fall damage. Whoever came up with this system was not talking to whoever decided that vacations were going to be done on high gravity planets because what would invariably happen is that someone acclimatized to a level of clumsiness permissible on a lower gravity world would end up breaking their bones from simple trips or falls. But of course, this ignores the fact that soldiers from Aquila and Neon would basically be super soldiers compared to those from Jemison or Gagarin. And this was as easily avoidable as just lowering the gravity numbers to be a little less ridiculous. Or leaning into it and saying that yeah, that was part of why the Freestar Collective won the war. 
And the reason all this matters, beyond the fact that I am a huge nerd who didn't get bullied enough, is that Starfield is LARPing. That's all it's good at. It's into NASA and science bazinga, but then it half-heartedly actually thinks about these things. It knows that life seems to like 0.5 to 1.5 Gs. It knows that humans need 20% oxygen on Earth and around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. No, I will not use Celsius. It is literally f inferior to Fahrenheit and Kelvin in every application. And no, I will not elaborate further here. We do not have time for my literal hour-long presentation on this topic. But pressure is not a factor. 20% oxygen is worthless if it's at one-tenth the atmospheric pressure of Earth. Any more than that, and we start to suffer from oxygen poisoning. Ultimately, realism in science fiction is only worth as much as the creators are willing to utilize it. When you have a bunch of different departments at Bethesda all getting to play cowboy with the rules, you have a bunch of different visions about how important realism should be to the game. Whoever designed the mechanics around gravity obviously cared a lot about realism. The level designers that decided airlocks were going to be present, even if they massively slow down exploration, obviously care about realism. The marketing push that the artists cared about the practicality of designs for spacesuits and ships. It was disingenuous to say that people shouldn't care about realism in games with mutants and dragons and ghouls and cat people, but it's literally a marketed component of Starfield. But the writers, among others, don't care so much about it. A big problem in the media landscape is that writers are effectively gatekeepers of creativity, and they are currently really bad at creativity. It is truly disheartening that no matter the amount of raw talent involved in a project, that there is one room full of people that can and have been destroying projects, and not just because they're like out of touch purse holders. In my view, there are two valid ways to write. Either make a story good, or make a story functional at delivering whatever is good. I.e. if your combat is good, then your story should just be an excuse to do it. But that's not a default prize, i.e. if something is good in a game, that doesn't mean the story is functional at delivering it. A functional story for a strong combat system endeavors to not waste the player's time doing things that are not the combat system. So if your movie is just an excuse for a bunch of talented visual artists to work, the story needs to not get in those people's way by being so bad that it distracts you from whatever strong element you're supposed to be seeing. And then somewhere along the way, Someone at Bethesda played Red Dead Redemption 2. Aquila's concept art is quite different from its in-game portrayal. That happens a lot, for sure, but not quite in this way. It's not so much that the limitations of reality prevented the game from being fully realized, like how this is obviously a settlement located near mountains in a cold environment. No, at some point, things obviously changed. The music for Aquila does not convey its current theme, and there are songs that do that theme in the soundtrack. I'll play the Aquila theme and then the other song, and you tell me which one fits the visuals better. So at some point in development, the intentions behind Aquila went from rugged isolationists living in a steppe environment to cowboy town. I'm going to wager a wide range of time this happened in, and I do apologize for not being able to give specific dates. I'm going to guess it was sometime between 12.01 a.m. on October 26, 2018 and October 29th, 2018. You know, the weekend Red Dead Redemption 2 came out. I have no doubt in my mind that following Monday, Aquila's fate changed forever. Uh, the other, I would say, two non-Bethesda games that I got little little vibes from were No Man's Sky and Mass Effect. Well, clearly, those other games that are science fiction, I think you might look at and say, okay, this is science fiction, it's like that. I think the minute to minute, obviously on the ground, it has similarities to Elder Scrolls and Fallout and the things that we've made and how it feels in your hands or some, some certain mechanics. But believe it or not, it's the games that, that put you in a world, that transport you to a place. So I think it, it probably also as a flow probably has more 
of a feeling of like a Red Dead 2, right? Like I'm living the Western fantasy. Yeah. Nah, Todd. No Man's Sky is a good comparison. Let's not kid ourselves into thinking this game plays in any way similar to how it feels when you play Red Dead Redemption 2. That is just straight up delusional. I mean, even the full context that Starfield is supposed to make you feel like a space explorer, the same way Red Dead Redemption 2 makes you feel like a cowboy, again, not really true. But when it comes to the visual aspects, I'm going to be honest. I fucking hate Aquila City. Oh, we're cowboys with six shooters and double barrel shotguns and stone walls and wooden palisades on a planet that at best has shrubs, and we wear leather dusters and have unpaved roads and call our bar the Hitchin Post, even though they're aren't any horses, and we value the rugged individualism of the West, and laws are enforced by rangers, and seriously, unironically, please stop making things. I don't care if importing wood is a solution, they're literally protecting part of their city from giant rampaging monsters with wooden barricades when steel and concrete are options. As someone whose family were still doing the cowboy thing until the 1970s, please stop appropriating our cowboy culture. Okay, but seriously, when space is described as a frontier that will one day recreate the conditions that defined the American West, both historically and in terms of our retroactive cultural obsession, that's a metaphor. The difference between Aquila and something like Firefly is that Firefly went out of its way to explain why people were living like that. Towns had unpaved roads and buildings were made out of wood because those were typically poor settlements located in the middle of literal nowhere, so remote that the government could not be bothered to help them. So they used the only resources they had access to. Sure, Malcolm Reynolds used a six-shooter, but during the war he had an automatic weapon. Also, they were literal cowboys, as in there was an episode where they herded cows. It wouldn't bother me so much if it wasn't for how obvious of an inspiration things in 2018 seem to be for this game. The other main city in the Freestar Collective, Neon, is literally just Night City from Cyberpunk, but much lamer, because Cyberpunk 2077's super iconic demo came out in 2018 too. Emil shed some light into how these ideas work, and basically it's just an exchange between him and Todd where Emil pitches ideas, but his ideas aren't, and then this thing is this way because it represents this idea or concept. But rather, when brainstorming the United Colonies, he thought of things like Battlestar Galactica or Starfleet. For example, the United Colonies as a faction. That starts with conversations with Todd. Alright, cool. What do we want the big factions to be? I was thinking this. So, like, the United Faction is Battlestar Galactica. Starfleet, the structured society. Military type of stuff. For that sort of power fantasy, that sort of vibe. So we would talk, we'd agree, and then we'd go off and find a name for that. The United Colonies was one of them, and there were others on the list. A lot of the work early on goes back and forth through email. When we signed off on the United Colonies, I would start the process for building the lore from the ground up. When Firefly was being developed as a setting, the Old West was chosen as a visual element, in part, because the story was supposed to be an allegory for the time period following the American Civil War. And because taking the space frontier metaphor literally allowed it to stand out from other sci-fi shows at the time. In essence, the reason why Starfield seems to just copy so much from other franchises seems to be precisely because they are. Where things get uncomfortable is that conceptually, Aquila is effectively a clone of Amber Heights from Outer Worlds, a remote settlement of rugged individualists fighting against an oppressive, freedom-hating government, living out in the wilds against a dangerous wolf-velociraptor hybrid that threatens their walled settlement. Saying that Starfield was already in development when Outer Worlds came out so they can't have copied them is being very generous to content thieves everywhere. It's particularly the detail with the Raptodons that bugs me. Even if it were a coincidence, and it absolutely could be, I would certainly still feel uncomfortable having an element of my game being so directly comparable, especially to a studio that was part collaborator and part competitor. And it's all this for something that's so boring. It's not a cowboy town because Bethesda has something to really say about cowboys. It's a cowboy town because someone wanted to make cowboy things. Aquila should not have been a main faction hub. If it was just some tiny settlement out in the fringes that was cowboy themed, I wouldn't care as much. I am of the extremely controversial opinion that if you're going to make something, that you should endeavor to have that thing say something. Anything, please. Red Dead Redemption 2 has a lot to say about the topic of the West. Were there any thoughts about what that game was trying to say beyond, hey, cowboys are cool? 
Neon and Aquila are two sides of the same anarcho-capitalist coin. One side of that coin reflects the cowboy, the man who wanders into the wilds and sets down roots through his blood and sweat to create a world where he is truly free. The other side of that coin is a world where corporations control everything, where everyone is free from the oppression of the central government, but not from the oppressions of contracts and financial systems more powerful than any individual has the power to resist. It is in this common philosophy of libertarianism that these two disparate groups can cooperate, and when presented like that it's obviously a critique of the philosophy. Somewhere along the way that basic message was lost. I don't think the people in the trenches really had a clear understanding of what they were creating, or what it was really supposed to be about. I think at a high level in the project, these kinds of ideas are present. Emil has this kind of stuff in his head, and thinks these things are what his games are about. But he has admitted that he doesn't really play his own games. Once they're out, it's no longer his problem. Like, he only recently replayed Oblivion. On this eve, the eve of Starfield's release into the wild, I'm playing a game I haven't looked at in over a decade. Tez 4 Oblivion. Emil outright stated that when he wrote Father in Fallout 4, his motivations were supposed to be sympathetic. When I wrote the character, I understood his motivations. It's very sympathetic. Obviously, something went wrong between when he wrote that and what ended up in Fallout 4. And I think this speaks to a simple fact that he is not very good at translating his high-level ideas in his head into an actual message that comes across in his art. And he similarly struggles to get his subordinates to work within those themes. So as an example, I recently played Death Stranding for a video, but didn't really pay active attention to its story. Criticize it however you will, even if you skip all the cutscenes, you would still understand the basic message. How it's about people needing to come together and form connections between one another instead of walling themselves off from other people. Whereas playing through the Ryujin and Rangers storylines at best convey that the Freestar Collective is a corrupt system. I mean, look at literally what they are copying. Red Dead Redemption 2 conveys that the American West was not like it has been romanticized. Life was brutal, short, and unfair. The system was corrupt and the virtue of absolute freedom seems worthless when it comes at the cost of all of these characters you interact with. Cyberpunk 2077 is about making a choice between a stable but unfulfilling life and going out in a blaze of glory. Until that blaze of glory actually happens and you start dying and realize how much of an idiot you were for glamorizing this lifestyle and thinking that your life was truly worthless. Starfield though. Starfield just wants to be a theme park of things that its developers were into when it was being made. As much as they've relied on copying other things for their own game, it's almost impossible to copy Starfield for how little of its own flavor it adds to the mix. Starfield is a huge game. Starfield is a deep game. It's a philosophical game. It's a game that will consume a lot of... If you want to play Starfield, it'll consume a lot of your being um, but I believe that after Starfield you will be a bit of um, I wouldn't say like changed person but it will definitely give you a um... <sighs> but it only makes sense the game has no clear central vision it's entirely an amalgam of all of the whims of its hundreds of developers over the course of years Every solid creative project has had a central vision. If you don't have that, then it has to be substituted with something. But the big problem is that if Starfield is about exploration, then there has to be something new to discover. I don't just mean in the places we explore in-game, but rather in the art itself. Starfield as a game can't be explored. You can't make a story that is almost entirely quote inspired unquote by other things, because that means if I've played those things, I'm not discovering anything new. Cool. So you really got into Red Dead, Cyberpunk, and Destiny 2 since we last hung out. Did you do anything new or... Oh no, wait. That's a group of religious extremists who worship a giant cosmic snake. Okay, so you're not just copying other things, but also yourself. The phrase, there is truly nothing new under the sun, is not supposed to be a design motto. I really wanted to hammer home just how much I dislike Tequila on principle, because it's a major content hub. They really rub your face into the mud on this one. That's it. 
and it is right there. This is by far the best inventory. You know, you just take all the ammo. Seriously, we're still doing underground merchant containers. The other two main quests do, as I stated earlier, allow you to skip straight to finding the missing companion. Barrett's is more impressive since there's a small investigation involved where we go back to our old employer, track down our kidnapped former co-worker, and then finally rescue Barrett from some randomly non-hostile crimson cringe members. Starfield's rather inconsistent as pirates in the main quest will randomly decide to at least entertain talking to the player, or sometimes they just come out guns blazing. Sure, we had to kill a dozen of them outside the building, but now they want to chat. The problem is that Barrett is not affiliated or even amicable to the Crimson Fleet questline. So far, each quest has introduced a side questline, however, that actually ended with Sam. Technically, you can get an in with the Crimson Fleet by joining the Vanguard, and there's another backdoor later on, but obviously that is the Vanguard introducing the fleet, not Constellation. Point is, there are four companions, and two of them are well suited towards being brought along to participate in the storyline for a faction. It seems random to break the mold with Barrett, who, while willing to make friends with pirates, isn't actually keen on doing those pirate things. The other person we meet is Andre- uh, hang on, let's hang on with her name. Really, we're only skipping Vlad's introduction, but don't worry, we'll have plenty of things to say about the game's main antagonist later. After that, he points us at two artifacts and asks us to track down the fourth companion. It's pretty much 50-50 from here if you'll land at the right planet first try. This is where we meet Andrea, and look, I'm going to use the pronunciation of the name that 90% of languages, including the one I natively speak and another I'm trying to learn, use. She doesn't introduce her own name, so we can only go by what other characters call her, which is an uncommon Portuguese pronunciation, Andreja. But she doesn't have a Portuguese accent, and she's actually voiced by a woman from Idaho. Perhaps. I suspect Vladimir worried you might find me on the ground. Still. Like, these are not the kinds of questions that you want to be asking about one of your main characters. So, I don't want to hear that I use the wrong pronunciation, because I'm not interested in building a bad habit for myself for a character that they clearly didn't care enough about to properly portray. Which is a shame, because I really like Andrea as a character, and I wish somebody had actually written down which ethnicity she was supposed to be, because Portugal and Eastern Europe are pretty much as far apart as they can get from each other, let alone if she's actually supposed to be Brazilian. I'm guessing that what happened is that the recording director wasn't given notes on what accent Andrea is supposed to have, nor what the correct pronunciation of her name was, so the English-speaking voice actors used the letter J the way English is designed for, for a name that is not its English variation. English drops the J in the name Andrea. And Andrea's voice actress was told to do an accent, which given she voiced a character named Olga in Half-Life Alex, ended up being vaguely Eastern European. Maybe the person handling the recordings could have done a better job if they had some kind of resource documenting decisions made by designers, but I digress. Andrea is supposed to be a mystery. I say supposed to be, as it couldn't be more obvious that she belongs to the one mysterious faction that exists in the setting, House Varun. She has a moment where she reveals this information when she trusts us, but it wasn't a surprise because well, having someone from House Varun among us is a new experience. I'm certain they're unsure if you even wish to be approached at all. Give them time, Andresia. They'll come around. I promise. While this game is a nightmare of unintended character interactions generally, I feel like if you're writing a character to have a big reveal moment, you should put some work into making what they reveal be a mystery. If her odd mode of dress, foreign accent, and the fact that we walk into her shooting some Varun zealots isn't obvious enough, maybe it would be prudent to make sure her passive conversations don't give it away. For example, if it's supposed to be a secret, then Sarah should have a euphemism to refer to Varun. You know, since she's supposed to be this conscious leader character who can read people. Or maybe you don't have the dialogue trigger until the quest stage passes where the secret's out. I would also go so far as to include a couple other mystery factions in the lore as red herrings. Varun's problem is that I can fit an entire discussion of their faction into a small side tangent. I was actually shocked at how little House Varun content there is. They are a noted absence in the story. Just no more unauthorized jumps in House Varun space, okay? What Varun space? Where? I'm guessing that Varun is 
probably cut content, possibly for the promised Shattered Space DLC. It's bizarre because they were marketed kind of heavily, and Emil even has a tattoo for the faction, which confuses me because I have zero idea what the tattoo would even be of. If it's just a generic snake tattoo, there's only like a billion things that could reference. So Andrea is representing a faction that is ostensibly just a variation of space bandits. I mean, let's take a second to talk about Elder Scrolls. Part of why Tez is great with lore is that the writers took the time to write about factions that exist on the other end of the continent. So not only do they have a wealth of content to draw upon from past titles, but also a great number of factions that have only ever existed in flavor text. So for example, if you want shadowy organizations, you have the Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhood, the Blades, the Morag Tong, the Kamana Tong, and the Shadow Scales. And these are just groups referenced through storylines in three games, but you're able to fall back on name dropping them. It helps the world feel bigger than it actually is by creating connections outside of the direct setting. Lore in Starfield almost isn't actually lore because it's all functional to the direct storytelling in the game. Varun exists for Andrea, the main quest and the UC Vanguard quest lines, and beyond that is fodder which uses energy weapons instead of ballistic weapons. It is flavor, for sure, because a Starfield without Varun is definitely worse off, but it was kind of a shock how late into the game I realized there was not going to be a Varun questline out there waiting for me. Which is kind of bizarre. Sarah and Sam were both vehicles to introduce questlines, but then Barrett and Andrea turn around and don't introduce questlines, but of the two, Andrea does represent Varun. She has to, as she's one of the only characters in the game who can. So, with our four companions recruited, we finally return to the lodge. Hey, Asia. we're back. Thank goodness. The newest we're member worried. of our little family really pulled through. Why? Us. Was there a concern that I would not feel it with them, them, can't you? Oh, Ever since I found the second one, at the visions, being around them is just comforting. Yeah, so it seems the designers didn't consider that someone would complete all three quests and turn them in all at once. This is where the quest reconvenes as Vlad wants to send us to a... a... oh... oh no. Vlad's next mission refers us to a rather common activity for the main quest. Temples. These structures are the source of our mysterious space magic. Vlad's primary role in the story is to figure out the locations of artifacts, as well as send the player on a repetitive, radiant quest to visit temples. Man, I don't even know where to start. I've actually written out 10 variations of paragraphs trying to even broach this subject. In summary, temples are short, repetitive, radiant quests given to the player that unlock space magic powers. Need to wear your patience thick. Man, he was not kidding. Something I'll mention here because Lord knows I don't know where else I would is the live action trailer. I love this trailer because it really fits with Starfield. Watching someone go through beautiful areas in order to complete a radiant quest. Taking the magic out of space magic by making it as routine as fetching the mail. And once again, doesn't entirely make sense with what's in the game because there's no design doc. Sometimes you can get these temple quests by being in the same system, but a lot of times you need Vlad's help to locate them. Which isn't even true as there are some universes where Vlad is dead or missing, so you can skip talking to him and just use his space station to locate them instead. We don't need Vlad, we just need the eye. And you want to skip this dialogue because it is oftentimes sluggish to begin, waiting until Vlad completes some animation before starting, and then saying the same couple of lines over and over repetitively. Hello, I am satisfied. A stranger from beyond. <laughs> Even for an old crimson fleet, that's that's a new one. Did about a year's lucky I knew. The eye was one of the first visual elements confirmed about Starfield in its announcement teaser in June of 2018. Which is hilarious because its only purpose is to find temples. They literally started with this and it's still this bad. Temples are even on the box art. Having to repeatedly warp back to the eye, dock, run to Vlad, wait for his animation to complete, talk to him for two seconds, and then fast travel to whatever system he points me to, this is not gameplay, to say the least. Take, for example, Skyrim. 
Arngear has a similar quest to help you find word walls. The difference is that you could also just explore to find them. The Nordic burial crypts were easily spotted at a distance, and unlike Starfield, you don't even need to complete any main quests or be Dragonborn to find and unlock words of power. A rule established is that there is one temple for one artifact. In theory, there might be one temple for each. It's a strong theory. Couldn't find that planetary anomaly without the data from the artifact. We'll need one to find the other. However, the system does not work very well. Sometimes it doesn't work at all and randomly breaks the rules. The artifacts are named after Greek letters, and there are 24 powers, so 24 temples, per universe. Because the powers have ranks, and you can level them up by visiting temples in repeat universes. However, every temple is exactly the same. You land, figure out where the temple is, this is supposed to be a puzzle, but sometimes you can literally see the temple during the rather loud landing animation. Walk somewhere between 500 meters to 2 kilometers to the temple, and then you go inside. There's a small room where the gravity is disabled, and some rings appear. What exactly we're supposed to do at this point wasn't obvious, but I managed to finally notice that there's a swirling thing of energy randomly spawning around the room. You fly into this thing five or so times, and then the rings line up, you enter the middle, have an extremely loud vision, wake up outside, have a power either unlock or rank up, and then generally an enemy spawns that you need to kill. Rinse and repeat, mm, 70 times. The enemy only shows up after a point in the main story, afterwards they always show up. It is so repetitive that in one variation, I learned the exact point that the enemy would spawn and could throw down a cryo mine to freeze them literally the second they materialized. Every level of the temples as content is terrible. Playing through Starfield where I track down and do the temples as I play the quest lines at least spaced out the awful at a pace that it wasn't so bad. It felt like a reward for exploring or, you know, at least getting out there. However, people are predictably neurotic, even to a higher degree than I am. I just wanted all 24 powers. Some people wanted all 24 powers at their highest rank of 10 before they wanted to start really playing. This is pretty much all I was doing on my second day of playing Starfield. My logic was that I was told I should rush the main quest, so on day one I rushed the main quest, built the armillary, and went straight to universe 2. Then I went to bed. Then, when I woke up, I figured I should grab all of the powers quickly so that I can use them throughout the rest of the game to make analyzing them easier. That was a fucking mistake. Getting all the powers is not straightforward, and literally everyone I knew was equally confused about the system. Okay, so each power corresponds to a specific temple, which itself corresponds to a specific artifact, which corresponds to a specific letter of the Greek alphabet, because of course it does. So for example, the Void Form power is always at Temple Omicron, which requires you to get Artifact Omicron. Except one time when it sent me to the temple before I found the artifact. Again, it, just, it, will, it will randomly break the rules. So for example, Artifact Ada is the one you found at the beginning of the game on Vectera, and it always leads to Temple Ada, which gives you Anti-Gravity Field. The final temple is combined with its artifact and is always Mew. You also aren't told directly which two artifacts Constellation found before you arrived, having to discern those via process of elimination. I believe strongly they are artifacts Alpha and Sigma, which is a funny choice. In your first universe, there are eight artifacts found through quests in fixed locations. I verified this information with the help of private sessions, who helpfully supplied additional data for me to use. There are then four artifacts, which are in Radiant Dungeon templates. There are two at the Lodge, and then there are nine in the hands of the antagonists and one at the final location. As you can see, even in our first universe, there's a level of unexpected randomness to the system. For example, private sessions went to three planets that I never visited. Turns out there's a reason for that. In New Game Plus skip runs, you run six Radiant Dungeons, are given eight by Sarah Morgan, who allegedly runs the main quest using your notes, even if she's your companion the entire time, then you get 9 from the antagonists and 1 from the final location, but there's a twist. See, you run 6 Radiant Dungeons, but the planets are fixed to your save file, meaning that every single New Game Plus skip run uses the same dungeons at the same locations on the same planets.
The dungeons can also be per save file. For example, private sessions had to repeat the cryo lab each time, but didn't have the mech graveyard like I did and vice versa. But the artifacts inside those six dungeons do change every run. Outside of the four fixed artifacts of Alpha, Sigma, Eta, and Mu, the 20 remaining artifacts are completely random. So to be clear, six random dungeon artifacts, five random artifacts that Sarah gives you, nine random artifacts that the antagonists drop. These random artifacts are not in pools. What I mean is you can have an artifact that the antagonists exclusively drop five runs in a row. And then in the sixth universe, it shows up in a dungeon. If it's confusing, yes. Now imagine not having any kind of resources to look this stuff up. Unironically, it was in the fifth universe that I finally sat down and started up a spreadsheet. Even then, what I was doing wrong still wasn't immediately obvious because what I was doing wrong was just getting unlucky. You do have all 24 artifacts at the end of the quest line. However, there are multiple characters who suggest doing all of the temples before completing the game. Again, it bears verbal statement. At the stage you are told to do all of the temples, you will only have 14 out of the 24 artifacts. If you haven't found all those temples yet, now might be a good time. If I were you, I'd find as many of the temples as I could. You'll need all the power you can get. The mistake I made was listening to them and not doing all of the temples after completing the quest line. The final artifact I needed was Pi, and I simply got unlucky five universes in a row. But in universe six, bam, it showed up in a dungeon, and within a couple temple quests, I finally had my final missing power. Of course, the temple guardian decided to celebrate by falling to his death. Another temple that plagued me for a while was Tau, and this was because in the universes prior, Tau was given to me at the very end of the quest line, while in universe four, Tau was given to me much earlier by Sarah Morgan. However, the RNG doesn't stop there. Vlad can only give you temple quests for artifacts you have, but which temple he points you to is also random, and for some reason, Vlad insists that you return to him each time, even if he's not at the eye anymore. In Universe 2, Vlad seemed to indicate that he was no longer going to find temples for us now that the armillary had been completed, but you just need to talk to him again and get him to keep offering temple quests. There should probably be dialogue lines here where it's suggested that you should keep looking for the temples before you reset the universe in order to help prevent confusion. You have to bear in mind that because of their repetitive nature, temple grinding is so mind-numbing that I challenge you to do it for six hours and three play sessions straight and then actually retain any information NPCs in Starfield say to you. They're lucky I was not watching YouTube on my second monitor while Starfield was muted at that point. But just think about that for a second. Random artifact order, random temple order, 240 temples. I don't think the game is necessarily encouraging people actually do 10 rounds of New Game Plus temple farming, especially since that would take like 40 plus hours of grinding. But I think the goal was just to make a system where players could keep finding temples forever and leveling up their powers in small ways and that they didn't realize just how much RNG they were putting players up against. I would not be surprised if most of the designers were using the command PSB to unlock all of the powers, and there was simply a note that said the temple system was being added soon. Bethesda tests for glitches, not user experience. I can very easily see the problems going ignored until it was way too late. I will admit though, it is pretty ballsy to have 240 temples available for the player and exactly one template they all use. I mean, there are minor variations, the exteriors do change, and there are two places you can wake up outside. Actually three, but that third only showed up once. And that's about it. Okay, so I've laid out that if you want all the powers, you are going to be doing temples somewhere between eh, 23 and 70 times. I mean, even if I managed to know what to do in Universe 1, which I will remind you, for me, was the very first day of release, that's still 23 runs of the same temple. So you arrive at a planet, either pointed out by Vlad or occasionally discovered by arriving in a system where there's a temple. My run where I got my 14 artifacts and then warped into every system in the game hoping to find the right temple through this quest could not work because I didn't have the right artifacts. It might not have worked anyways. Honestly, there's still a bunch about this system I don't know. 
It can also be a bit tricky using save scum tactics to get Vlad to change his temple objective. It's not as simple as quick saving right as Delvin's line finishes and reloading. You actually have to replay quite a bit each time. It goes much faster once Vlad actually comes down to the lodge. Let's just say that I personally considered Vlad to be the game's real antagonist. You arrive at the planet already knowing where exactly to land, but somehow the game pretends that I'm not going to know where the temple is. Even though I could easily make sure to note the location before or during the landing sequence, and sometimes you can even see the temple during the 17 second landing animation that seems to play for every single temple run. Focus. Focus. There is the odd time where I landed on a planet with low visibility due to the weather, so I actually had to do the scanner minigame. Basically, you just look around until the scanner distorts and then walk in that direction until you get to the temple. There is a specific layout where you see the temple way out in the distance and realize just how long of a trek you're in for. There is seriously a lot of walking to complete temples for no reason. Why not make a mini game where you just scan the planet like probes in Mass Effect, but once you find the temple, you just land and arrive directly outside? Or, you know, some kind of land vehicle. Like, I said earlier that I enjoy walking around the planets, and I do, but it was like Starfield really wanted to challenge me on that statement by making me do it for half a day. The RNG also worked against the game because the day I streamed Starfield, the game decided to put two of the temple locations with the longest runs back to back at the very start. And surprisingly, like, Space Delphine She's kind of on board with it. She's like, yeah, all right, let's go explore around. Like, we're, we're explorers mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, she kind of, like, embraces you just running off on your own. She's not sitting there busting my balls being like, you know, we really got to go get that thing. She's like, oh, this is a cool place. Thousands of people had their experience of Starfield be defined by boring temple runs, which is completely accurate to the experience. So, you know. Even getting inside is tedious because there's not just a door, but also a set of pillars that descend that block the door. It's not a security feature because there's a gap between the pillars and the door. It's literally just there to try to waste your time while you get inside. Then you have the interior sequence. It's particularly annoying because these energy things seem to share a timer, so being late to any of them lowers the time the next ones hang around, resulting in there being a common element of the fifth energy thing disappearing long before I can reach it, artificially extending the sequence for no reason. The power visions are also pointless. They're too abstract to really glean anything from casually, but so repetitive that you might not even realize there's a unique vision for each power. Then you exit the temple by waking up outside. Our companions seem like very awkward additions to this, participating in the temple sequence but not really having much to say about the whole ordeal. They could get magic powers if they wanted, but most of them don't seem to want to even try. Barrett and Alternate Reality Us allegedly have quests to get powers, but I never received either of those quests. When the other Starborn starts showing up, you have to kill one. If they kill you, you realize an autosave was not made and you need to repeat the temple sequence. However, this is unlikely as the Starborn are massive pushovers. The only time I died to one was because the temple upgraded my unrelenting force shout, thereby unequipping it from my hotbar and getting me killed. Then you fast travel off the planet and return to Vlad to do it all again. And I must emphasize, even if you remove the temples I did as a mistake, that's still too much. Even then, was it really a mistake? I did in part need to know if leveling up the powers actually results in any kind of meaningful change. So I was probably going to do all those temples anyways. And the answer is still not clear, because being Bethesda, the only numbers they used to denote the power's effectiveness was mana cost. We will not talk about the powers yet, but this is the point where you start to unlock them in the main quest. I also have nothing to say about whether or not you can sequence break the temples or not. There is some humor in going to Vlad for the temple location, having the conversation play out like it isn't our first meeting, because he should have something to say about us ignoring him and still managing to find Andrea. So the other members will be impressed with the whole essence absorption thing and will ask if you can do any magic powers. Of course you can. 
See, you can't get the Dragonstone without learning the first word of Unrelenting Force, and you can't fight Mimolnir without getting the Dragonstone, and the game will actually unlock the first word of Unrelenting Force for you. Oh. Sorry, I, I was so used to Bethesda copying their Skyrim script that I decided to copy my own Skyrim script as well. Somehow Vlad and Noel know that we've acquired magic space powers. I say somehow, as Noel knows before doing a body scan I did not consent to, noting our unusual physiology. If she just did this apropos of nothing, say to record us after our initial vision, she would have learned a while ago that we exhibit the unusual signs that she denotes now. You know, in case the destiny armor and the obviously alien spaceship, the magic powers I use in front of everyone, And the multiple instances of us predicting plot events wasn't enough of a signal for these guys that something is seriously amiss with our new member. They insist we use our new ability, which to their credit is not unrelenting force. We'll get that power at the next temple though. Instead, it's an anti-gravity field, causing objects and people to float upwards in its area of effect. Of course, we're asked to demonstrate this, but they made it so that the Constellation members would specifically not be affected by our ability. Because nobody ever used Unrelenting Force on Irolith. It's like whoever made this quest was explicitly anti-fun. Speaking of, Vlad offers to send us on more temple missions to catch up on the six other artifacts we're in possession of. Hey, since power acquisition is tied to being the one to unearth the artifacts, Surely we couldn't get powers from the first two that we didn't even unearth, or some of the others that are also already unearthed by the time we find them. Or maybe the artifacts and powers are separate, like you just need the artifact to find the temple, but then anyone could really could get powers, which we know isn't the case because Barrett and Alternate Reality Us can get powers because both of those characters had unearthed artifacts. So maybe you need to unearth an artifact and unlock its power and then from then on, you can unlock any other power at any other temple. It's almost like the system only exists to explain why we can get space shouts. Walter has an idea which is unfortunate, because it means we have to talk about Walter, aka Elon Musk. Rich businessman who makes luxury vehicles, taking his wealth and investing it into space exploration firm. Todd Howard owns a fully kitted out Tesla, talks about visiting SpaceX, and even has an interview from 2019 where he was on stage with Musk himself. Plus, Elon has a thing for trying to get himself featured in science fiction. How do you want to be remembered in history? Alongside the Wright brothers, Elon Musk, Zephyr Cochran? I had to put a Star Trek Discovery scene in one of my videos. That's what Starfield made me do. It's weird how Super Rad didn't talk about Elon Musk in the game that has a stand-in character for him. You let your women go out in public, hold jobs, wear clothing, and you wonder why your marriages fall apart. Okay, I'm dogging on Walter a bit here. He's not a terrible character, but he's pretty close to the bottom of Constellation. And they did him dirty in the direct by quoting him out of context. Anything goes as long as you have the money. Oh, exceedingly. The free market there is in full effect. Anything goes as long as you have the money. We'll be taking advantage of that. I think part of Walter's problem is that he's attached to a pretty terrible quest. It's funny too, because they actually let you make a decision later that changes things, causing you to skip a quest. But of the upcoming next three quests, let's just say the one they'd skipped was surrounded by two that they probably should have instead. Not only was I shocked that they actually let you change the questline in a major way, but my jaw hit the floor when they revealed that they were going to skip the one quest I actually wanted to replay after being forced to do one that I did not. A designer had to look at the Neon quest and say, yeah, players in New Game Plus are really just gonna like redoing this one. Or perhaps their ego was so large that they didn't want to allow players to skip their work. Neon has a death touch and that pretty much Anything in Starfield that is related to the city has something wrong with it. Like, it starts as soon as you land. New Atlantis has this problem as well, but the way ships take off practically scrape the city, it doesn't even look good. Wouldn't it be better to have a shot of the ship flying away from the city? It would visually help reinforce that the player is actually leaving a location by having the city get smaller and smaller in the background, while our ship remains the same size.
Instead, the camera lingers in the city while the ship flies away before snapping back into the ship in the next shot. Visual language is important for helping establish a sense of travel, especially since we really aren't actually traveling between two locations, we're just teleporting and watching a dynamic loading screen. They did this correctly with the landing sequence, emphasizing that we are arriving at a location, but it's confusing because it feels like we are constantly arriving at places and never leaving them, especially with how you can fast travel off of planets but not directly onto them. Now you might logically intuit that you are leaving places, but your subconscious doesn't. That's the point of visual language, to help immerse your subconscious into the narrative. Then you get to Neon Proper and see that it's Night City mixed with the Groundbreaker from the Outer Worlds. Only a really, really low fidelity part of Night City. Where's all the trash? Where's the people with messed up implants that are stoned out of their gourds on Aurora? It really is unfortunate for Bethesda that CD Projekt Red decided to drop their big rework for Cyberpunk 2077 less than a month after Starfield, and an even bigger power play that they sent me a code four days after I wrapped up playing Starfield. If I were to make a comparison, playing Cyberpunk after Starfield is like a big drink of water after being thirsty all day. You ever just devour an entire container of water like it's the best thing you've ever tasted? I mean. Cyberpunk is not the best thing I've ever tasted. I just think it's brutal how badly that game slaughters Starfield. If you haven't played it since 2020, I suggest giving it a spin with the recent rework. Hell, given you can explore the world in Cyberpunk without going through four loading screens, I'd say it's even more faithful to Bethesda's formula than Bethesda is. I think a good example is in the Astro Lounge. You hear this super generic Fruity Loops beat that could be made in literally 10 minutes, and then the bartender acts like this is some next level cutting edge music. Meanwhile, Cyberpunk has multiple different clubs with distinct musical styles. And it doesn't help that there's no radio station equivalent for Starfield, but I guess they no longer had the 1950s to rip off. But it's a noted absence that Starfield has no in-universe musical flair to it. A term they used a lot in marketing is NASA punk, which is just an insult. There is literally nothing punk about Starfield. The game is the antithesis of the idea of punk. I know some people think otherwise, but the term punk means more than just a consistent visual art style. Obviously the NASA, which is the rigid, hard function over style, and then punk, which is all about style. If style was all you wanted, then maybe you're looking for a term similar to cassette futurism. Punk has world building and narrative connotations. For example, steampunk can be equally political compared to cyberpunk. So when you label something as NASA punk, I'm expecting something to comply with the virtues of non-conformity, anti-corporatism, anti-consumerism, anti-greed. Which obviously makes NASA punk an oxymoron because the people at NASA have to live rigidly structured lives and have a chain of command. Plus, can the people that shilled a watch that broke after a month really say that their aesthetics are rooted in those ideas? Of course not. I have to wonder if that's why East Van Peely looks dead inside during the sequence where they show the watch. You know what is punk? Standardized uniforms for spacesuits. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Being space cops, working for corporations, hanging out with bougie explorers. Yeah, I'm really feeling like a rebel here. And it's not even trying to be ironic, like making a statement that most people into punk today are just wearing it as a fashion statement. It's just legitimately that out of touch with reality. There's no sharp edges to Starfield. While we're on the topic, player appearance customization is honestly at the lowest point I've ever seen for a BGS game. I've never had more trouble getting a character to look good than I have had with Starfield. There is a severe shortage of drip, both for spacesuits and clothing. Skyrim was decently solid at making armor look good. Fallout 4 and 76 were alright. Not amazing, but it did somewhat encourage a visual aesthetic that matched the setting with its armor system. Then you have Starfield, and I have to wonder how they even thought of pitching the idea that the items are functionally designed, let alone stylish. I find all of the Varun stuff to be the best looking, just a nice smooth layered style that flows, 
but a lot of the clothing is just noisy or overdesigned. And I think all of the spacesuits, aside from the Daft Punk suits, are just ugly. Like, it's really hard to make a good looking spacesuit that's supposed to be reminiscent of the NASA spacesuits, because those obviously prioritize the function of keeping human beings alive in space over the style that you would want in a piece of fiction. That's why a lot of sci-fi tries to make sleeker, more form-fitting spacesuits. I just found Starfield to be aesthetically boring. I think NASA Punk worked alright on the spaceships. I found myself having a lot more of a connection with the ships I designed than the outfits I was wearing, which really disconnected me from my character. Plus, they have a skin section, but as far as anyone's been able to tell, only the pre-order bonus skins use this category. It feels a bit gross knowing that the designers were relying on future DLC and mods to make aesthetically pleasing designs. As for the characters, people say Bethesda characters have always been ugly. Untrue. They look much better when they're modded. How much motivation can a character artist have knowing full well that their work is guaranteed to be replaced? Ideally to optimize their designs, but more realistically to serve as wank fodder? Like, they emphasize that they adopted this photogrammetry pipeline to make more realistic characters, and then this was the output? Starfield's characters were outdated in 2021, and it's crazy people are pretending otherwise. I mean, more than just its ugly background citizen character models. There's a really uncanny look to skin, which when exposed to the awful lighting creates this plastic effect. There's also a weird stylization to the eyes where the irises seem simplified, but the rest of the face is realistic, giving every NPC in this game a dead-eyed and soulless stare. The eyes are the window to the soul, which is why they are drawn with shading or gradients or reflections to help give character. When you portray eyes this way, it makes it seem like the characters are dead inside. Also, the facial animations don't help. It's not just that it's a real doll's face, but also a stilted way that they speak in dialogue. And the fact that there's so much dialogue, and they zoom in on the faces in a forced perspective. Like, part of what helps Skyrim and Fallout 4 against Starfield is that they don't zoom in on the player's faces, forcing you to stare at the ugly. Walter's plan is to just buy the artifact he has located. I mean, in fairness, his job at Constellation is literally to just be rich. However, I'm not really sure what he's contributed. What I mean is, Constellation already had the Lodge before Walter. The frontier as we found it was a total junker from a century ago, despite the fact that Walter runs a cutting-edge starship design company. So pretty much it's just the credits we get paid for missions and purchasing Constellation's space station that he's done. Which, I mean, does raise an awkward point about the Lodge and New Atlantis in general. Constellation is right in the middle of the wealthy district of the settled system's most advanced city, one that is suffering a massive housing inequality problem. We get told about how bad the well is, even though it seems fine, and the fact that most of Jemison is habitable yet straight up unoccupied. And no joke, I walked a couple hundred meters outside of the city, across their scenic lake, and set down an outpost to store materials, park my ship, and do some interstellar freight operations. I'm sure the Class 1 citizens were super thrilled at having their Lakeview apartments tarnished by this eyesore. In fairness, I wouldn't want to live in the quote nice unquote part of New Atlantis either. In the entire city has to constantly listen to spaceships landing and taking off in fear that one drunk pilot could slam their spaceship into their apartment building completely by accident. Yeah, you thought living next to the train station was bad. Point is, Bethesda seems stuck in 2015 when it comes to their mentality towards riding cities. The settled systems have enough space for everyone to live in 500 acre plots with a homestead. Habitable planets aren't rare. I'm guessing that maybe somewhere there might be a plot point raised about how the UC wants to preserve the ecology of Jemison, in which case I have no sympathy for anyone living down in the well. I would have bombed the Mast Tower if I was told I had to live in a sunless ghetto because they were worried about displacing Mantis aliens. There's still plenty of space to expand and build parking lots before you endanger any species. But like, nobody ever talks about how Constellation has this premium location for their base of operations. Instead, people somehow know about Constellation, but think they're washed up. It's bizarre, because realistically, nobody should even really know about this organization if they're that obscure. There are millions of corporations that exist in the United States that you've never heard of because it's just some guy parking his rental property in an LLC. But they want the trope of Constellation being famous has-beens, specifically so that they can fail to make a point about the value of space exploration. I say fail 
because you do very little exploration of space during this quest line. This could be an important story for helping to educate people about what exactly the value of investing in space really is. And like, I agree that that's important, but I want to disagree because of how badly Starfield bungled the topic. I get that you're making a point about people being backwards on the issue, but they kind of have a point. Constellation isn't exploring space, they aren't expanding the bounds of the settled systems. We are constricted to operate entirely within the bounds of already explored and, you know, settled star systems. We barely discover any artifacts that aren't already at the end of a mine or a science lab when we arrive. Most of the temples were already found. Some of them are within visual line of sight of established human structures. What if there were a few dozen star systems in this game with no humans living in them at all? We're one of the first ships to arrive in that system, seeking out an artifact or temple, but along the way surveying these planets in the process. Maybe the survey data for these systems are especially valuable to settlers and corporations. But no, this multiversal mystery is entirely located within 500 light years of Earth. Sol isn't even the central most system, in fact it's near the edge of human habitation for some reason. You would think that human colonization would have spread out in all directions from Earth instead of just one direction. Man, we're really off topic, I guess I really don't want to talk about this quest. So we take Walter over to the headquarters of the company he runs. He has a short conversation with his wife and we get an objective to investigate the cellar before our meeting. Note that none of this can be sequence broke. The things you need to find do not exist until the correct stage of the quest. So you can't, for example, track down the cellar and steal the artifact, thereby bypassing the entire quest, because after all, the game has big plans in store for us. Knowing his motives and paying off the club, it's time for the meet. You can see the seller at this point, but he's essential and you can't interact with his briefcase. It's also funny that the second we're tasked with tracking down someone with a briefcase, a bunch of NPCs decide to bring theirs to the Astral Lounge. The Astral Lounge does not come off as a seedy nightclub where people are doing drugs and dancing their worries away. It reminds me of the dances I went to in primary school. I think this is how Christians picture raves. It's the kind of club where I'll pick a fight with the bouncer because I know being thrown out will be more fun than the club itself. It doesn't help that the club's VIP wing stays in a static state. For example, the case the artifact is in stays at the Astro Lounge forevermore after you do the quest. But what's funny is that as soon as we head up to the meet, you can just walk in, kill the guy, and take the artifact. This is not an accident. They are fine with this guy dying so long as they get you into this tiny room. The game did break. A lot. Some triggers didn't fire correctly because all of this was necessary in order to put us into a situation where as soon as we leave we get confronted by a guy demanding the stolen artifact back. If he doesn't catch you on the way out, then the whole quest breaks. I'll be keeping an eye on this as it unfolds. You can always use a little bit. We find out that our ship has been impounded on one of the only landing spots for Neon. Something's gone wrong, has it? Slayton has put a bounty on your heads. He squeezed a few palms. Your ship's been impounded at the spaceport. There goes our way out. Okay. I even went down there to see if there was someone I could just bribe to let me go. Of course not, because there was an intended sequence for us to play out. We are to meet with the artifact's original owner, but it's not that simple, for some reason. If you go to the Slayton headquarters, you'll get trapped in the elevator. For no reason, because the end point of this little dungeon they've created is just us arriving in Slayton's office through the elevator, with as many armed guards as there would have been had we just been brought here. Unless his aim was to just trap us in the elevator until we died, I guess. Note that you cannot, for example, climb up the outside of the trade tower and go straight to the door we used later to bypass this trap early. Like, you don't even have to do any kind of advanced parkour to do this, there's a staircase that takes you there. Issa doesn't even think to mention this as an option despite how many security guards' lives could be saved by going straight to the top because the door will be randomly locked. You can find an elevator control panel in a utility hallway and gain access to the executive floor, bypassing the receptionist, but Slayton still figures out that we're here and traps us anyways. Issa even controls the elevators later, so, you know. We must be trapped so that we can see one of the worst player dialogue options in the entire game. Some of the dialogue seems to have still been written with the Fallout 4 mentality of every dialogue needing a fourth sarcasm option, 
Thankfully, they stopped doing this at some point in development, so it's not a constant barrage of dialogue cringe. I really tried everything I could think of to sequence break this quest, or just make it interesting on a third playthrough. But it's not! It's a series of tight bottlenecks leading us to a short sequence where Walter's wife gives us directions on how to sneak through this building. And it's not even like she's a notable character, literally her only trait is that she has a weird voice. Hello, Walter, dear, are you there? Issa? Took longer than I'd like, but I managed to pay off one of Slayton's security consultants. They've patched me in. We are not presented with a building to sneak through, Walter warning us that he really doesn't want the blood of guards and employees on his hands. It's just a linear sequence where we follow the instructions to sneak through. I mean, if you want, you can shoot your way through the building. It's kind of amusing, really. Everything about this quest was so that you could end up in the elevator trap, but it has no conviction to follow through afterwards. There's no strong judgment for slaughtering your way through the level. We meet up with Slayton, and he's willing to let us go at this point. He just wants us to judge the thief and we can leave with the artifact. This is setting us up to potentially look like a hypocrite in the next quest when we ourselves steal an artifact. That's it. That's the point. To try and make us look like a hypocrite. But also so that we don't do what we do every other time and just immediately try to fast travel back to the lodge as soon as we have the artifact because there is another bottleneck in this quest. As we go to leave, we get confronted in orbit by a mysterious ship of a design we've never seen before. They said, standing on the bridge of an identical ship. We even get to have a dialogue where the mysterious person acknowledges our starborn status, of which the crew is able to listen in. And Walter just writes it off as, eh, it's one of those secrets we all have. No, Walter, at this point, I have outright admitted that I've been lying this entire time. That's a little different than Andrea being a member of House Varun sent to spy on you. Walter has to say this because otherwise, the developers now have to account for Constellation asking the big question of who exactly we are. And it would be really, really interesting if they did. Like, if there was a path of the main quest where we don't tell Sarah Morgan everything up front, but we get caught out simply because we do a bad job at hiding our Starborn status or act too brazenly out of character to get away with it, Starfield could be my favorite story of this year. Instead, they opt for the Bethesda way of simply having a few moments where the story can deviate slightly, but otherwise simply account for what should be major revelations by hand-waving them away. Funny thing is that the conversation is long enough that you can see Voli Alpha drifting across the frame. Wow, they counted for orbital physics, guys! Except that we should be in the planet's orbit. The planet shouldn't be moving relative to our perspective because when we took off, we still inherited the planet's inertia. It's cool that planet orbits are calculated and you can watch them move in the skyboxes, but it's really jank that it's independent of the player's ship. I'm guessing the occasional shot every couple hours of a gas giant or a moon orbiting overhead wasn't frequent or noticeable enough that Bethesda really wanted people to notice. That or they were just lazy and didn't think someone would spend long enough in orbit to even notice how absolutely silly it looks that the planet is just leaving us behind. Also worth noting, at least for later, is that this mysterious ship attacks us for refusing to hand over the artifact. Just worth bearing in mind. Starfield's main story is comparable in scale to Skyrim, its main difference being built-in replay value. However, it was made by an even larger team with more experience and more time to flesh these elements out. I don't think it's unrealistic to have more than one and a half ways the quest can play out. The questline plays out in these ways. The main line of Universe 1, the skipped line that jumps past all the main quests and basically just jumps straight to the end, and the main line, but you skip one mission. If the goal is to tell a multiverse story with a focus on how things can be different in different universes, then there should be way more variations of events to really allow things to go in crazy directions. There are several times that the dialogue does not account for our Starborn status and only provides us with the dumb limbing options as though this were the first time that we were seeing these events. I'm actually convinced on my third playthrough that the designers didn't even anticipate that players would replay the questline in a way where the companion would die on a repeat playthrough. Like, I don't think they anticipated that would happen. The best way to explain would be like a movie where a second viewing has you paying more attention to characters you didn't before, now that you're aware of the big revelatory moments. Maybe some of the dialogue has a second meaning on a repeat playthrough. You have to remember that the storyline was designed from day zero, with the idea in mind that every conversation in the main questline is intended to be seen at least twice in character. 
With our big revelation in hand of there being some new force in the galaxy interested in the artifacts, Constellation has a meeting to discuss this new force. It's conversations like this that really disappoint. At this point, literally everyone here has more than enough evidence to accuse us of withholding information about the artifacts. And the thing is, this is not a game logic thing. Our ship does not appear to be a regular ship to normal people. Bethesda went out of their way to write dialogue during the UC contraband checks and at ship services to acknowledge that other people can see our obviously alien spaceship. Additionally, it gets easier to account for decisions the later into a video game you are, which means the further we are in the story, the more plausible it is to create that alternate scenario where we get caught out as a liar. You might be wondering why exactly the Starborn have unique armor and spaceships, and that's a really great question. Vlad has some new quests for us. He sends us out to track down two artifacts he has detected. These are just quests where we run dungeons, but this time we get ambushed by Starborn at the Arta and they're dead. It's really kind of embarrassing. Theory 1 is that they knew when the player would encounter these guys in combat, that they'd already have space magic which would basically disable them as enemies. Most of the space magic definitely takes away from the challenge of single target encounters, and yet, the Starborn are single target encounters. You will die in shame, Theory 2 is that they didn't know because there wasn't a central design document to help plan out the pacing of Starborn encounters to keep up with the player's own power escalation. In essence, by the time you encounter the Starborn, it is already too late for them to be a threat. So they end up just being a speed bump of artifact hunting. They aren't even necessary to getting the powers like dragons are in Skyrim, the quantum essence they give you is just a mana potion. You also can't loot them, which is pointless because it's not like they have unique weapons we could not get anywhere else. Additionally, these artifact missions are the same as the ones you do during the skipped version of the main quest. Just more repetitive content that exists probably because they didn't, or couldn't, Think of an actual mission for you to do to unlock them. And with that, we get Vlad's own artifact hunting mission. I mean, besides the template ones. Template, not temple. It's a bit weird to be talking about Vlad as a human character and not as a breathing mission board. There's something rather obviously off about Vlad, though. He says the rock ain't for sale for any price. Think we're gonna need a crowbar and bag for this one. Worf from Star Trek was raised by his adoptive human parents who were Belarusians, this in spite of the fact that he was an alien from a hostile warrior race. So a black Russian certainly is not impossible. The problem is that Starfield goes for progressive representation without doing any of the legwork. And don't think it's just a Vlad thing, Sarah is awfully white for being from New Atlantis. It's literally as straightforward as just having dialogue that sets up what Earth nations settled which parts of space, leading to the settled system's modern makeup. For example, and this is me writing for Bethesda, you could say that Africa saw the rise of multiple major powers by 2070, cooperating to create their own space agency, and that New Atlantis was actually initially founded predominantly by Africans, hence its ethnic makeup. The problem is that you should not write for the writers. Just because there is a plausible explanation does not mean that there is an explanation. Natty Onai is a good example. They explain that she is at Hogwarts because her mom transferred here to teach. They use her character to explore a part of the setting that was generally unknown prior, and that in turn informs us about various aspects of the setting that we did know by showing the contrast in cultural values between African and European wizards. Without an explanation, Vlad comes off as just having been randomly chosen to be race-swapped mid-development to meet a quota, which is a bit awkward to have the reformed criminal character in Constellation be a black man who teaches the little white girl lockpicking and is the only one to get along with the foreigner. Wouldn't it be hilarious if, like, if I could, like, out of this ragtag band of misfit friends, the black guy could pick the lock? What? <laughs> Where the hell did you learn to do that? A book. Oh, and Vladimir. 
I told you nothing good will come from those. And what, have her raised by Jacob, my dad? I'd sooner ship her off to Vladimir. But if you say that a large number of Russians took to space piracy and that Vlad was adopted into that lifestyle by regretful pirates who murdered his biological parents and decided to raise him as one of their own as penance, bam, explained. It's that easy. Or you could say that Vlad wasn't always black but actually had the race-changing surgery that exists in setting to help hide from his past with the Crimson Fleet. Probably the more controversial option that they could have picked, but it would have been an interesting exploration of that kind of body modification. You think that would raise some interesting questions. Maybe it would be an opportunity to explore what it really means to belong to a race in a post-Earth setting. But it's Bethesda, they barely want to even acknowledge race exists lest they be called racists for not including enough Native Americans. I never find myself asking these kinds of questions when I play Cyberpunk. There's a Haitian gang made up of refugees because Haiti got destroyed by climate change. Checks out, thanks for clarifying through completely natural and incidental dialogue I ran into while playing. It is a shame because they have room to do some interesting things with their premise. They are reflecting an exodus of people after near future Earth circumstances. We should be seeing a lot more distinct cultural exploration since Fallout was a bit stifling with what you could represent by nature of its setting. For an obvious example, Asian cultures. They didn't really get a chance with that in Fallout. And they do some stuff, but you'd expect more given the new opportunity. Instead, it's a very American brain rot approach to representation where everything is black and white. Literally. Since Vlad is a former pirate, of course his artifact lead is in the hands of some spacer, and he wants us to steal it from him. And for some reason, our highest affinity companion decides to go with us. I wonder what that's setting up. This is the mission that gets skipped, by the way, so I guess before we talk about it, let's jump ahead. The reason Sarah insists on going with us is that most of our companions decide to help out with upgrading the eye to scan for artifacts deeper in space. This is so that upon our return from this mission, it will be revealed that the eye is being attacked by a starborn. We are forced into a choice, either go up to the eye to rescue one of our dying companions, or stay at the lodge to protect whomever went with us to the scow. That's really it. It's just a choice between either the companion we have the highest affinity with, or I guess the second highest. Which in universe 1 was Sarah, so they had to settle for number 2, which was a roll of the dice since I hadn't used any of the others, and it landed on Barrett. In New Game Plus, you're given two chances to warn Constellation right before accepting the scow mission. This forces them to evacuate with the artifacts and saves everyone's life. I mean, everyone besides the people on the scow. What, in Miss Sam's funeral? Which is when the Starborn who attacks the Eye arrives on our ship to tell us that he didn't expect this change, and so he went ahead and grabbed the artifact on the scow for us, destroying the ship in the process. So, I guess the moral is, it's okay to save lives as long as it's your own friends. That's it. That's the one big questline changing moment you get. So you might wonder why that Starborn ship earlier let us go, and why this Starborn here isn't killing us despite being so close to the artifacts. Yeah, we'll get to that. So the scow. This is the mission that Sam Co. died for me to replay. Which is funny because I don't like Sam. So to get him killed you need to raise his affinity, meaning you need to use him more as a companion. I just used a console command to bewitch him into being in love with me, which did the trick. In Universe 1 though, I really didn't have an attachment to Barrett, and I was trying to bang Sarah so the choice was pretty easy. It's an emotional death sequence that did not resonate with me because I had not done any of these guys' quests yet, because I was rushing to get into New Game Plus as was advised. It really is funny that even something as simple as a tragic death scene is too rushed to land. Also it bugged out. Which is thematically funny because the Starborn ship we ran into tells us that we should not be reliving our old life, but honestly, Universe 7 was above and beyond living my old life. It's really weird to think about having mild attachments to these characters and then realizing I was doing so after having already pressed the Universal Reset button six times. Because the questline obviously fails to get you to like any of these characters in time for you to care when any of them get killed. Again, my entire motivation for saving Sarah was simply a desire to see the cringy sex dialogue for myself, which I didn't, by the way. It is hilarious going from having characters force ERP upon you in Baldur's Gate 3, 
then going to Bethesda, which demands dating and therapy before marriage and sex after marriage. Like, this is the same company that got in trouble for having boobies hidden in the files in Oblivion. And bear in mind, Starfield is still an M-rated game. It's literally the same rating as Baldur's Gate and Cyberpunk, but no breasts, one penis on a statue, no vaginas, and no sex scenes. Is a full, highest rating that I can issue, 10 out of 10, and it easily earns a badass seal of approval. I don't think you necessarily need any of that, I just, it's just funny. Other than that, everyone in Constellation is just a vehicle to gain space powers. I don't think being pushed into psychopathy was the intended goal, that's simply the outcome when you design a game to not open up until after New Game Plus. Anyways, the Scow is a floating museum owned by a scavenger turned collector. Vlad already knows its owner, Russian Mercer Frey, isn't going to want to sell us the artifact. You are given options on how to get aboard, and by options I mean either disable the ship or talk your way on board. However, the ship is essential. I referenced this earlier, so I'll elaborate. Like in PCs, ships in Starfield can be essential whenever the game specifically doesn't want you blowing up the wrong ones. However, I think this is a missed opportunity. The artifact will survive the process of a ship blowing up around it, as that's what our Starborn friend did. So let's imagine the route of last resort is that you have to attack the scow, but then you're put in a difficult position. Either you need to board the ship via the established mechanics, or blow it up if you've come this far without learning how to do so. So we either need to talk our way on board, or be correctly skilled enough to disable the scow's engines and board it. Oh, but you see, we can't expect players to have a single perk point invested into a tier 1 skill at this point in the main quest, am I insane? But that logic only works if this is a one and done encounter. Maybe routinely running into quests where I screw up and end up blowing up the wrong ship pushes me to try harder in New Game Plus to have the right skills and equipment to reliably board ships. This time I'm going to be more careful and try to save everyone's life. If you are going to write a game where players are repeatedly living their lives, you should push the players to fail, and somewhat often, but no. Let's bake in a decision where we can prevent someone's already preventable death, but not put in skill-based moral dilemmas. Why is their death preventable? Because what got someone killed was that the Starborn could turn invisible. Something we already knew about and just kind of forgot to tell Constellation during the two instances where we fought and killed Starborn who turned themselves invisible. It's not foreknowledge, even in Universe 1 we knew they had that power. But hey, it wasn't in the script. How can the designers be expected to account for a completely different quest if they don't write these things down? For all the designer who was creating the Starborn attack sequence knew, the player probably didn't know Starborn could go invisible yet. Maybe at that point in development, this was intended to be our first combat encounter with the Starborn. Nobody writes this stuff down, so one of those plans changed. On board the scow, you're presented a similar dilemma, talky or shooty. I really don't know which one is faster. We can convince Petrov to show us the artifact, but all routes lead to stealing it from him and getting a bounty. I'm all for a quest that tries its best to force you to break the law, screw the lawful good whiners. But yeah, they could totally do better than hard scripting a bounty to be magically placed on us. I'm pretty sure the goal of the bounty is just to get you arrested in UC space so that you can be extorted by a faction called Sysdef, and be given the option from there to go join the Crimson Cringe. But if you are a veteran Bethesda player, then there's no way in hell you're actually accepting a bounty be placed on you that you don't want. Which is why a lot of people hate the forced bounty. Luckily, you can just throw a bounty board down at an outpost and wipe it remotely. This used to be a faction perk, you know? Weirdly, the fourth faction over on Neon doesn't have any kind of constellation connection. Not that I blame them, I would pretend Ryujin didn't exist too if I was making this game. The scow is weird though. It's clear that they tried to do something with it. It's got all kinds of side passages and corridors and even a distraction for the vault guards. But then someone decided to make a guy with perception level 100 over here see through stealth and invisibility to call us out the second we walk in and try to bypass the very first guards. I mean, in fairness, how exactly are you going to write a stealth scenario where the first move is us docking our giant spaceship to their even bigger spaceship? I mean, that also begs the question of how nobody in the galaxy questions when a giant spaceship lands less than 100 meters away from their space bandit base. 
This was a decent opportunity to work with some space stealth mechanics, but of course you can't write an occasion to use a mechanic that might not get implemented. I'm sure many of my viewers have already forgotten about the space stealth thing I mentioned earlier. So we have a stealth mission that goes out of its way to make sure that we know in advance that they already know we're here to explain how they know to give us a bounty, which made me wonder why you would even bother to sneak through the ship. Like if you can avoid the bounty by stealing the artifact without ever being detected, credit. But either their big plan for this mission didn't pan out mechanically, or they just didn't have the heart to tell whichever poor level designer was adding all these side passages that they should just stop. And that was the good mission. With the scow down, we return with the artifact and the eye gets attacked. An enemy known as the Hunter is on his way down to get the artifact, so we need to set up defenses. And then almost immediately, Walter up in the bar gets grabbed by the Hunter and knocked out. Yeah, the Starborn can actually teleport when plot convenient. Don't they know that's illegal? We, of course, do not have that power. I do like this encounter because it is fairly overwhelming in Universe 1, but totally doable in New Game Plus when you've already potentially beaten this guy. It's getting kind of hard to dance around the topic of the Starborn without elaboration on what their deal is. Their actions only make sense in context of the mystery plotline. Like us, the Starborn are attempting to collect all of the artifacts. The Hunter's game plan is always to allow Constellation to find many of the artifacts, and then take them by force when they get too close. There is supposed to be a big reveal moment in New Game Plus if you skip the attack when he says that he always goes out of his way to mention the word Unity, because it triggers Mateo on the next step to finding more artifacts. But since he didn't get to attack the Lodge, we'll have to say it in the Hunter's stead. I don't even think it leads to an artifact. Also, I'm not sure what he's talking about because the Unity quest doesn't lead to an artifact. It leads to finding the ancient ruins, which leads to you meeting the Hunter and the Emissary. So, why does he say Unity then? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't help him in any way. I legit just thought of that in, like, the voice recording booth. That's how much is wrong with Starfield. I'm just, like, any more time spent thinking about it just exposes more and more things that are wrong with this game. I say supposed to be because Big Reveal and Unity Quest do not go together well. There's also a bit of jank to the Lodge Quest sequencing. If you go up to the Eye, then you kind of just say hi to the companions up there before you go back down to the Lodge. We don't offer the life-saving medical treatment that companions needed to survive should we have stayed in the lodge. I guess our presence is just moral support. Noel will be in the basement with all the artifacts, and that's when the hunter shows up. Whereas if you stay at the lodge, the hunter shows up immediately. Like, it's just an extra travel step to make the choice. Nothing really plays out differently. Then Constellation flees through the well to escape to our ship with the artifacts. I liked this sequence the first time, just the hunter causing pure chaos, but again, it's something that doesn't make as much sense once you have all the context. There's even a state of emergency when you return to the city. You see securities lock things down, people are wounded, things have been on fire, there's a big shutter gate where something clearly tore through it, and this state that New Atlantis can be in is not tied to quest stages, i.e. it doesn't last forever as we leave to go do entire quest lines outside the city until the day that we finally return to the lodge. Life will go on without the player. Neat. Then they did the same exact thing with the UC Vanguard questline, and it made more sense there than it did here. Attention. The spaceport has been secured. Safety precautions remain in place. But hey, if you've got a neat trick that will delight players, make sure to use it multiple times so that it wears out its neatness really fast. The designers are like toddlers that figured out how to make their parents laugh, so they just do that thing over and over until it's not funny anymore. Don't think too much about how quickly the hunter was able to meet us in orbit, so he wouldn't have been in the city much longer than us to justify throwing up all these barricades. Or how the UC patrol ships just ignore him despite what he just did to their city. Or how there's a rather pathetic reward for beating the hunter in a fight, but they level scaled him like crazy to try to make the encounter always feel overwhelming. I don't want to talk about the unity. You can't make me talk about the unity. Combat has been identified as one of the many aspects, other than graphical fidelity, to continue seeing improvement through Bethesda's titles, other than the one we don't talk about. 
Starfield's combat is better than Fallout 4, which was better than Fallout 3. And that's true, but not because Starfield is some amazing combat experience. It's because Fallout 3 is really bad, and anything compared to that would demonstrate a mastery of combat design. Still, I will admit it's one of the better things in this game, I guess. We already talked about how the progression system discourages investment in combat perks, meaning there is little build variety in character progression to pursue, which harms the game's replay factor quite a bit when it comes to the combat. However, actually investing in perks is cement for weapon choice. It's hard to use a different kind of weapon when you've already committed several hours worth of levels into a type. Additionally, they've opted for an interesting system. In essence, instead of a bunch of different types that are all independently leveled, each weapon has two types it will belong to. So for example, ballistic pistols versus laser pistols, ballistic rifles versus laser rifles. So if you're unsure exactly what weapon type you want to use, you can instead invest in ballistic weapons, which will cover the largest selection of weapons in the game. A decent idea. But on the flip side, someone forgot to put more than one base electromagnetic weapon in the game. The Starfield Wiki, which is run by the same group that runs the UESP, has a chart listing all of the weapon types, if you want to see how sad the energy weapon selection is. Actually, I don't know if I want to inflict Starfield on the UESP guys, now that I think about it. In addition to figuring out which weapon type you want to use, you also have to learn the rules about how they progress. See, an AK is not an AK by itself. It could also be calibrated, refined, or advanced. These are just flat stat upgrades based on what level you are, but also what level the area you are in is. This is another one of those ideas that seems to exist because the designers wanted this game to be a mix of Elder Scrolls and Fallout. In Fallout 4, a 44 revolver does 48 damage. It doesn't matter when or where you find it, it'll do that much damage in its base configuration. The only way it'll do more damage is if you level up a perk or modify it. However, in Skyrim, the amount of base damage a sword does depends on its tier, which is affected by player level. The big difference is that there is an obvious visual difference between an iron and a Daedric sword. There is no visual difference between a tier 1 AK and a tier 4 AK. In Starfield, I had the same exact weapon drop within 90 minutes of each other, an anti-personnel sidestar. But one was tier 1 and the other was tier 3. What I'm getting at here is that item progression is heavily influenced by when and where you are leveling. In essence, there's not much point in getting married to a weapon until level 50 anyways, and even then only marrying weapons on level 50 and up planets. Because what level an item drops is influenced by where you are when it drops. So for example, I decided to explore some points of interest on Jemison. After all, I figured if there was anywhere in the settled systems where I could land at a preset point of interest and maybe find an interesting side quest by exploring, it was going to be one of the main planets for the game. Of course, upon arriving to the science facility, I was given a radiant quest to go find some scanner trait in a different biome. So I walked around looking for other stuff to do and ran into a dungeon. Now, this particular configuration I have already done 11 times. That's not hyperbole, because it's one of the main quest dungeon preset types you'll encounter during each New Game Plus run, but also just because it's a very common prefab area. What tickled me was that all of the enemies were at level 5, so even though I was on very hard difficulty, there was not much of a challenge. But all of the loot was also at level 5, meaning that there was an additional level of pointlessness to the whole endeavor, because, well, nothing that drops here is going to be of value to me as a player. Even stripping the place to make credits is pointless because high tier generic weapons are more efficient loot to sell. Also, fun thing to note about the tiered weapons is that they don't consistently go up per rank for each weapon. What I mean is, the Eon's damage goes up 110% when going from tier 1 to tier 2. The 1911 only goes up 47%. Every single weapon has a different value behind the scenes of how it goes up. So if you pick a weapon type you like, it is a gamble if it's going to maintain that value later in the game. New Game Plus runs were probably the most interesting simply because it demanded that I continually adapt to use new weapons as I would get separated from my old ones. Which of course is antithetical to their traditional design where you're supposed to date many weapons and trade upwards until one day finding the final weapon you were destined to marry because you can't ever replace it. Not that they stopped trying to do that, because in addition to having four tiers of leveled loot, 
They also brought the legendary weapons from Fallout 76 to Starfield, with little alteration in the basic premise. Fallout 4 introduced legendary weapons, which was really just taking things that exist in a setting without magic and granting them magical enchantments a la Skyrim. And then Fallout 76 took that idea and made it so weapons could have even more effects packed onto the same weapon type. They are essential to helping the game have a distinguished build variety, but it also introduced an unhealthy level of neuroticism to the game. Because in Skyrim, if you want an enchanted dragonbone sword, at high levels you can just make what you want. In fact, objectively, what you could create was better than what you could find. In Fallout 4, if you want an enchanted item, you find a place which you can easily roll those enchanted items and save scum. In Fallout 76, you farm a currency with a daily cap and then roll a slot machine hoping for the 3-star legendary with all the effects you want on it. In Starfield, if you want an ideal weapon, you need to figure out what you want, then farm points of interest on max level planets and hope you run into a high enough level legendary enemy that will actually drop a 3-star item, and then does drop a 3-star item that you want at its highest tier. Oh, and there's no consistency. Sure, the legendary enemies have a ranked system indicated by chevrons, but I've seen unranked enemies drop 3 stars and max ranked enemies drop 1 stars. No consistency. Of course, as neurotic as that can be, it's also not necessary because Starfield is criminally easy on its highest difficulty. Pretty much the only reason you need combat perks at all is to complete dungeons on max level planets at the highest difficulty settings. So for example, in Universe 7 I had a really good weapon drop. It was a 2 star tier 4 breach shotgun with an extended magazine and staggering effects. Despite making the decision this time that I wasn't going to use shotguns, Starfield dragged me back into the lifestyle almost immediately, so I already had points invested in both shotguns and ballistic weapons. And even then, despite how good this weapon is, it could have had a third legendary effect. I still really missed this weapon after the universal reset. But really, what I missed was having a weapon that could one body shot kill most enemies. I managed to replicate it with a regular weapon, and it was almost as good. Really what I missed was that it magically had 12 rounds in a 6 round cylinder magazine. Then I found a magazine that made the... magazine have 7 rounds. What the fu- One thing I want to address is that a few people have stated that Starfield has colored loot. This is referring to a loot system like Diablo or World of Warcraft, where there are tiers of items with color codes, and the general rule is that purple and yellow items are better than green or blue ones, as long as they're in the same expansion. This is not the case for Starfield. A yellow item, which is 3 stars, will do the same damage as an item with no stars, provided that item is the same tier, has the same mods, and doesn't have an enchantment giving it additional damage. The colors are just helping denote how many effects an item has, and is generally pretty useful in helping players to parse which items they should pay more attention to. Technically, they've always had the bones of a colored loot system, just without the colors. But the colors do not correspond to the tiers of items, just their effects. So unless the complaint is that they improved the inventory management slightly by using color in their UI, it doesn't apply. Another thing is that Starfield is another Bethesda game without the ability to upgrade items through their various tiers. If the aim is to get me to explore different weapon types, then I really need the ability to bump items up from tier 1 or 2 to tier 4, because there were many neat looking 3 star items I received that I didn't use because they were too low tier. For example, this Tesla boosted lawgiver. It looks kind of neat, and then you see the damage value and realize it is a tier 1 lawgiver, meaning there are unaugmented tier 4 pistols that will do more damage than this weapon. I don't know how good I can really say a combat system is where the end goal is being able to instantly kill the enemies. Now you can do that with many more weapons on a lower difficulty, but that means fewer legendary enemy spawns. Fewer of those means less experience, which means slower leveling, and of course fewer shinies. Combat is the connective tissue of Starfield, which is to say it bears the most connections to other gameplay systems of any system in Starfield. The goal of a decent number of quests and exploration in this game is to put you into positions where you can engage with the combat system. Although a lot less than Fallout 4, there's actually quite a few quests that explicitly refuse to put you into combat positions. So having a substantive progression system surrounding combat is important. But it is hard to have any of that without any real difficulty. I would compare this to something like the 2.0 rework for Cyberpunk. 
Cyberpunk on Very Hard really punishes mistakes. You either do something cool or you get flatlined. End of story. It's a good system for pushing players to try to innovate and keep improving their character. And it makes sense given part of the point of Cyberpunk is the casual brutality of Night City. And if you come up with some cheesy dominant strategy, it still makes sense in the setting. Chances are there's some character you'll encounter in the game who's also doing mass contagion quick hacks. Additionally, because I didn't really engage with it until after I finished my primary recording, I haven't really talked about how combat skill progression works, which itself is a funny topic. One of the consistently amusing components of Private Session's Skyrim video series is watching him bash his head against the wall that is Bethesda's obtuse perk descriptions. Treasure Hunter is no bargain either. What it really does is increases the chance of finding one extra weapon or armor item, possibly enchanted, in generic dungeon chests from 10 to 15%. 15% is still not much, so you're getting lockpicking up to level 70 and dropping 5 points into frankly worthless perks just to get an extra 5% chance to find gear in one out of maybe 20 containers you'll be looting during a dungeon. Wow. Suddenly that Fallout 76 has 13.5 million players line that Bethesda keeps repeating makes a lot more sense. You know, if you count every dollar the average American makes, they'll be a millionaire by the time they hit 40. We just have to assume they never spent a single dollar. Which, I will point out, in Cyberpunk is very direct. There's no question whether or not perks will stack, either they will or it will say that they don't. In Starfield, in order for me to know exactly how the system works, I sat down for 10 minutes and used the console commands to determine how the damage formula calculates upgrades. They could have put basic disclaimers in the perk screen to tell the players this basic information. For example, when I buy a perk, am I replacing the existing effect I have or adding on to it? It would make sense that it adds on because, for example, rank 4 shotgun certification adds a chance to stun enemies. I assume that chance to stun enemies does not delete my 30% damage modifier from rank 3. So in turn, I would guess that rank 3 would not delete the rank 2 effect. In Skyrim when you upgrade a combat damage modifier perk, the old number gets replaced with the new number to help communicate that it is not stacking our upgrade with our existing perk, but replacing it with the higher number. Starfield has all three numbers on screen at the same time, making it confusing. Is rank 2 going to replace rank 1, or is it going to add the modifiers together? Or is it going to multiply the modifiers? How exactly does the formula work? Basically, it takes the damage of the weapon, multiplies that against your first perk, then takes that outcome and multiplies it against your second perk. This means that having rank 3 shotguns and rank 3 ballistics results in a roughly 40% damage increase. However, if it added the percentages of both perks together, it would be a 60% damage increase. If it added all ranks of both perks, it would be 120%. And it's funny that they messed this up, because even Fallout 76 does it better. Individual perk cards replace the old number when leveled up, but there are also multiple cards that allow you to stack the same damage effects. It's both straightforward, and gives you a decent idea of how the system works so you can start theory crafting without having to actually stop playing the game to check the numbers. Oh, and you can unslot cards without losing them, so it's not a big deal to switch from a shotgun to rifle build mid-playthrough. Additionally, considering Starfield perks don't add up the ranks, it makes their effects rather pathetic. But I suppose not wanting to allow players to even double their damage makes sense if you consider that they likely balance the perks around the combat difficulty balance being super easy. Each combat perk is also challenge gated by enemy kills. This is not that bad, however. Rank 2 requires only 20 kills and rank 3 only 50. Rank 4 tends to not be a damage upgrade, but rather some kind of function change for weapons. However, there really isn't any point. Shotgun kills grant a small chance to stun additional targets with shotguns. I can already easily stun targets with shotguns by aiming for the head. And what even is a small chance? 20%? 5%? 1%? 0.1%? Combat was an area where I thought I'd occasionally have to dump some points in just to make sure the challenge progress would keep flowing. Turns out that wasn't even necessary, because the end game of Starfield Combat, once you've maxed out your combat perks, is equivalent to just setting the difficulty to very easy, and never wasting your time or perk points by buying any combat perks. I want to stress that I never played below normal and was playing on very hard at the end. Ship combat, on the other hand...
Ship combat and ground combat are both on the same difficulty scale. And ship combat is much more difficult by comparison. Part of this is because of how staggeringly brain-dead simple the system is, and not in a, it's simple but it just works kind of way. The best way I would describe ship combat in Starfield to an outsider is to say that it is Fallout 3 combat, but in spaceships. Just a numerical damage race between two sponges. But add more sponges and you have more problems. It was interesting watching through a search engine as the Starfield subreddit turned on the space combat over the course of just a few days. See, while the ground combat is super easy on all difficulties without any investment, ship combat requires heavy perk investment just to stay functional even at normal. Part of this is the lack of cover in space. I managed to make some encounters much easier if there happened to be things floating in the area to use as cover. Part of the problem is the way space levels are designed. In essence, ground combat heavily benefits from maneuvering and positioning options and limitations. Now imagine that same Starfield ground combat, but is in a completely blank white room with no cover or verticality. One enemy and you can maybe control them through staggers. Two enemies and you'll be at a disadvantage. Another issue is that all ship combat encounters start within weapons range, whereas ground combat gives you options about what range you engage enemies at. And you know, to do stealth. But the metaphor doesn't even work because typically you'll have a companion for ground combat to help mitigate enemy attention. Companions cannot pilot other ships for space combat sequences. But even in an even playing field, I wouldn't really say that space combat is particularly fun. A glaring weakness exposed by some crafty people was that the auto-aim applies to enemy ships too, and this can be exploited by creating a ship that's off-center by having two large poles sticking off the top and side. This causes the AI to miss you when you're facing them dead on. Starfield Space Combat doesn't aim for fast-paced dogfighting or slow-paced tactical battles, which is interesting because I think it could become either of those. For example, there's a rather infamous questline finale that involves a space battle against around 8 ships. Like a lot of people, this was absolutely destroying me until I figured out that as soon as I arrived to the battle, I could flip my ship about and boost myself to about 10 kilometers away. The AI would not pursue me because of my two essential wingmen who stayed endlessly battling around the station, but not scoring any kills. So then I saved and began to slowly approach to about 2.5 kilometers, and began firing on a single ship at range. I could usually pull one ship off from the encounter, pull back to 5 kilometers, and engage that single ship. It was not amazing, but I did feel like it had some strengths. Like the game was actually operating at a pace where I could consider moving my energy pips to different systems. You are not often afforded tactical options like this, in this instance this was only possible because of my pre-scripted AI wingmen. Most space combat encounters start well within weapons range, probably just to minimize downtime, and I think that's a mistake. It's leaning into the dogfighting aspect of up-close space combat, which is not where the system plays well. I do think there are some interesting mechanical interplays between hull mass and engine thrust or using vertical and horizontal thrust to increase turn speed, but desiring the thrill of getting in close to see the enemy ship is a very difficult design goal. It isn't just that the enemy AI has really good aim, but particularly how they maneuver that gives them more time to be aiming for the player. When Bethesda pitched the space combat, the idea they showed was reallocating power to different systems and targeting specific enemy systems. In essence, a sort of dance where you trade blows and focus on their individual systems in combat. We're on the defensive, so we allocate our points to engines and shields, then flip to the offensive and reallocate those same points to weapons. We target their shield so that they hasn't recharged by the time we get our next chance to attack. Space combat doesn't actually take turns like that in Starfield because it's too up close to do so. I also think that specifically the whole health in Starfield is too low to actually see how any of these mechanics play out. For example, in theory you could target an enemy's weapons to lower their offensive output. In practice, if their shields are gone and you don't plan on boarding them, then there really isn't going to be a huge amount of time between disabling their weapons and outright destroying their ship. In fact, whole health is so low that disabling engines for boarding is actually somewhat of a challenge, and I've more than once blown up a ship I was trying to board accidentally because my weapons were just too powerful. Shields, meanwhile, ensure that you can't do things like immediately target weapons out of the gate, so you cannot turn any 3 versus 1 around by targeting weapons or engines early and then moving the fight farther away. You know, that classic Fallout thing of shooting Deathclaws in the legs so they can't catch up with you. 
Honestly though, the most surprising aspect of Starfield ship combat is that it's not easy. I actually expected it to be catatonically easy because Bethesda would be terrified to put something difficult in front of their core audience. But their solution was to make ship combat opt in unless it's part of a quest. Like if you don't want to do ship combat, that's what the grav drives for, right? Like yep. Ah, I see. If you don't like it, just don't use it. The staple argument in the arsenal of Bethesda fans. Grav drives spool up so quickly that you can jump out of any combat encounter within seconds, no problem. So the only time you have to fight ships is if it's part of a quest, and that's usually made easier to compensate. You can even reliably avoid starting ship encounters. Ship encounters spawn in space randomly when you arrive to a planet's orbit. However, it usually takes a couple seconds for anything to happen, so as soon as you arrive in a planet's orbit, you can select your landing spot and just bypass whatever random bullshit spawns. There are some planets I pulled up the planet menu faster than it could load in, meaning I never even saw the orbital phase of travel before I was loading into the ground. Travel is a whole other can of worms. What I can say is that while ground combat is what Starfield aims to make you do, the same is just not true of space combat. Which is funny since the designers did remember to put space combat in most of the quest lines at some point. So it was always supposed to be a new feature for Starfield to have. Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag is a game that took a gameplay minigame from Assassin's Creed 3 and expanded it into being a core mechanical concept. It marries together the traditional ground combat of Assassin's Creed with ship mechanics. It's also fairly controversial for the series since it is the least like the others. If ship combat doesn't click for you in this game, you will not like it. But all the same, it commits because it's a setting where ships are integral to the storytelling. Even Ubisoft is not so cowardly as to give players an option to opt out of ship combat. But Bethesda doesn't see it as cowardice, rather the quote they often use is, how can we say yes to the player? We try to do games where, you know, we say yes as much as possible. And how can we say yes? Like, I wanna land on that ice ball. And it's, how do we say yes as much as possible? And where your mind kind of goes. And we want to, as much as possible, say yes to the player. Like, can I do this? Can I do this? Yes, 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 yes. And we try to say yes as much as possible. You know, we try to say yes to the player. So can I open this? Yes. Can I take all of this stuff? Yes. The problem with giving people what they want is that you end up with a bunch of fat dopamine addicts. Sometimes you have to say, no, this is the pirate game. You're going to captain the ship. What kind of pirate captain doesn't have a ship? It's funny too, because ship progression is so much more solid than the ground combat progression in Starfield. Fully kitting out ships is a real money sink, which is good because the economy in this game is, frankly, insane. I feel bad for David Pierce, Frostfall mod dev turned Bethesda employee. Not only do I feel bad for the mod authors who got hired, who will forever be outsiders who get used for the marketing, but they also threw this guy under the bus by blaming the game's economy on him. Still. Where it works is in ship design. I am tentative about singing the praises of the system as some people have. What has to be said about it first is that it, like a lot of UI elements in this game, is completely disconnected from the others. There is neither a consistent control scheme nor visual design style for all of the menus in this game. This is because some parts of the menus and games were actually outsourced to other parts of Bethesda. So for example, Sandwich Lady's team in Dallas handled the ship design and mission boards. Side note, this is the only time I'm going to acknowledge Sandwich Lady and no, she does not get a name. The joke arrived expired and hearing people parrot it is akin to the years people thought Arrow and the Knee memes were funny. It's really sad how well this kind of corporate boardroom produced humor managed to overshadow legitimate skepticism about the game's marketing. Greatest demo ever guys, I promise. It is interesting though, ground combat progression is entirely dictated by what you find in the world, whereas ship combat progression is entirely dictated by what you purchase in settlements. So you cannot, for example, find rare ship components at abandoned factories or by doing space combat. There is no progression for space combat through exploration, as is typical for a Bethesda game. There is one exception of two components being made available through a quest, but that's it. I guess in theory you have a couple freebie ships or the option to steal upwards, but I think using the Frontier as a ship of Theseus as you invest around half a million credits into it over the course of a few dozen hours just works better. So the skinny on ship upgrades. There's a tiered classification system where components come in ranks A, B, and C. Weirdly the tiers are backwards, as in C is the top tier and A is the bottom. 
Your access to components is gated through multiple perks. You need piloting to upgrade your reactor to the highest tiers, which you need to unlock to buy the other components. You also want starship design or some components are just randomly gated behind having this perk, but since the piloting challenge is to blow up ships, something you won't do often unless you abuse the simulator and the vanguard questline, it means you're forced to get out there with your lower tier ship as you rank it up. I want to stress that this was weirdly a part of the game that was working for me, but it's very fleeting. Because you aren't forced to engage with the system, it's easy, even on New Game Plus, to avoid space combat encounters until you have your fully kitted out ship. So there's no strategy in figuring out how to make enough money to upgrade your ship to take on the more dangerous encounters. Having an upgraded ship is not necessary to reach the higher level systems, which is where the easy money and levels are. So for example, how far you can grab jump is tied to the level of your engine and how much fuel you have. Note that fuel is not a depleting resource, but simply a limiter. It seems you can jump end to end in this game by having more than 500 fuel. So, in theory, you could gate access to high-level systems by making it so that low-level ships cannot complete the distant jumps. And in Universe 1, this was kind of how it worked. I was expected to increase the range my ship could grab jump to reach the final planet. But of course, it is a trivial matter. Likewise, if orbital encounters were forced, you could gatekeep access to the high-end content by first being expected to win starship encounters in orbit. But because there's no commitment, probably because the team rightly thought the system wasn't very good, they made it all optional. Starfield's pitch did not include a clear outline of how these systems would cooperate with each other. And without a central design document and several distant teams working on different ideas, I think trying to give players mechanical outs out of weak systems just became the reality of a development studio that heavily relies on things just coming together at the end, but for Starfield, it never did. Starfield was simply too big, but not from a scope perspective. Outside of Radiant Location, Starfield's really no bigger than any of their other games. No, Starfield became too big of a development. Too many moving parts and creative visions that did not agree about what the intended experience was supposed to be. One example is fuel. They were, at one stage, going to have fuel as a resource in the game. You can even see the remnants of this with Helium-3 and fuel tank modules, as well as some lines of dialogue. Hell, after this, we'll have enough jump fuel to bounce from one end of the settled systems to the next. Uh, and the system lasted a long time before they ultimately decided it wasn't fun enough. But it has a tone of, there's some effort involved, and we've dialed it back as we've been making the game, whereas we used to run out of fuel you jump and get stranded, which on paper was a great, like, it's a great moment when you get stranded and you have to press this beacon and you don't know who's going to come. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that's not like, it just stops your game. We found, you'd be playing the game and I ran out of fuel. Okay, I guess I'll just wander these planets trying to mine for fuel so I can get back to what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, it's a fun killer. That's too realistic of a simulation of the human condition. Yeah, no, the idea was, well, it's for, you know, games do that. If you had like a hardcore, <laughs> you're right, a hardcore survival mode, that's the yeah. kind of thing you would do. Maybe we'll do it in the future. So now you've got this vestigial system where players can strap fuel tanks onto their ships, but it doesn't do anything mechanically beyond determine how many back-to-back -back jumps it can automate for you. And since it's so cheap and there's no real progression, you can just buy the best fuel tank in the game and forget about the mechanic entirely. It's a shame because there's something special about designing a ship and then seeing it physically present in front of you. Seeing it in landing cutscenes, the ship is very close to being its own character in the story like the Jackdaw is in Black Flag, but it's not. I have a few gripes about this system. I struggled to make a ship I really liked aesthetically. Part of this is that the designer does not allow you to clip structural pieces or fine mold them, and I'm not really clear on what the intended method of blending all the shapes together is. So I just gave up and started making flying bricks. And the interior of the ship is also a nightmare. There are three interior types across five exterior type manufacturers. There's no in-game preview, so you need to watch a video online to actually know what the interiors of the modules look like. But they're also spread out, so you need to visit different systems to get access to all of the possible components. The interiors of the functional modules don't seem to have been designed by people familiar with the game, and you can't actually decorate your own module using the game's built-in outpost decorator. Fallout 76 had a good system for allowing the player to create a workspace that caters to the player's sensibilities, whereas here, you just get a list of preset modules. So the ship doesn't really feel like a mobile player home as much as it should. 
Interior modules also get laid out dynamically rather than by player choice. This means specifically how the doors between the modules connect. So for instance, in a ship I tried to design as my forever home, the modules connected together in this random snake pattern that made it difficult to use. Sometimes companions would insist on sleeping in a passenger module that was two floors down and required many twists and turns to reach. The ships also feel very claustrophobic as there are modules that can create a wide space but no modules that create a tall space. Additionally, modules come pre-cluttered. That's fine until you modify the ship or crew and that clutter gets deposited into your cargo bay. And even just by tweaking your ship's weapons will completely reset the ship interior, closing all doors, replacing all the clutter you sold, and removing all weapons from weapon racks. I guess I should consider myself lucky it doesn't also regenerate the pathway through my ship, so I don't have to constantly relearn the interior. But having my weapons get reset meant my aim of a weapon rack adorned entirely with old earth AKs was very short-lived. The system encourages some level of continual modification and tweaking of your ship, Resetting interiors is simply punishment for trying to do that. The main thing I struggled with when conceptualizing writing the section was understanding if combat was a draw for Starfield, or simply something you have to deal with. This runs contrary to what we've discussed earlier with how the story is just a device to put mechanics in front of the player. Remember, Starfield is nothing but circular logic, which is accidentally thematically relevant. In fact, it's amusing how many things accidentally align. Starfield Direct was good marketing accidentally because the schizophrenic direction and editing became an accurate advertisement of the game. It jumps all over the place without much flow or reason because Starfield does the same. Starfield does not display much unity with its design. Unity is a terrible quest that you cannot force me to replay. It is the equivalent of the quest the molecular level and institutionalized from Fallout 4. These were the quests where you build the teleporter and first arrive at the Institute. During the Hunter's attack, or at our own mentioning should we prevent it in New Game Plus, Mateo hears the word Unity and realizes that it is a prominent element of Keeper Aquilus's speeches. Starborn check, skip a bunch, we rush to a place called the Ancient Ruins, do a puzzle, and then go to a specific planet where we meet the Hunter and the Emissary. The latter is the guy who contacted us above Neon. You can't rush straight to the meeting, you do have to visit the ancient ruins, which point to a static position but don't indicate a time for the meeting, so I guess the majority of this riddle's existence it points at nothing, because nothing to do with the starboard makes any fuck- Also it's weird that the hunter indicates that this is a necessary step in order to complete the artifact hunt, like it really isn't, it doesn't lead to the discovery of any more artifacts. If the hunter just waited a couple more days, Constellation would have found the rest of the missing artifacts, and that would have been that. But I suppose it shouldn't be surprising that the Hunter's attack is also pointless. As to the quest itself, this is pretty much the bulk of religious storytelling in this game. No, really. This is the thing that caused Emil Pagliarulo to have five different crises of faith. First we speak to the, um, I guess he's the leader of the Sanctum Universum? If only there was a quest with a focus on religions in Starfield. Yes, the Space Pope lives a block away and not in Hammer Space because Matteo actually says he's a block away. It's right here in the city, just a block or so from the Lodge. Aquilus' speech is to piece together the meaning of the unity through some parable that was important to the three religious factions in the setting. The Sanctum Universum are space agnostics, they believe God or something is out in the cosmos. I say, or something, because that's basically it. It's a religious group of people saying that something is out there. It's just an entire religion of people that don't understand the universe, but also don't want to suggest they have the answers. They actually got a Jesuit theologian to write this. Which is Matteo's entire contribution to Constellation, to wonder if there is a religious angle to the artifacts. Then there's the House of the Enlightened, which are organized atheists. Yeah, so the Enlightened are a group of atheists serving the functional role of religion, just without any of the spiritual aspects. And finally, you have Varun, but rather than the Keeper having us visit the Varun Embassy, or asking our Varun companion who could potentially have died at the Eye, instead we go down to the jail and ask a random Varun Zealot. And I emphasize her potential death as Andrea doesn't have much to say on the matter, because she could be dead. We can't use a companion that could potentially be dead. 
This quest doesn't really introduce you to their religion so much as just gives you their mission statement and sends you away. And they are all as stupid as something is out there. Enlightened atheists and religious crusaders, truly, what an amazing religious trichotomy you've created here. The pilgrim's story in each leg of the quest points us to a planet where the pilgrim who planted these ideas in the heads of the religious founders camped. Yeah, the camp is still here, yet Earth is just completely gone. This is so that you can read all his journals and then complete a multiple choice test to get the next location. No, seriously. You have to read the journals and then take a test to make sure that you read the journals. The writers are officially English school teachers who can't think of any other way to make the kids read. But instead of classical literature, it's the teacher's own fan fiction we're being tested on. You know, it was kind of inevitable post-Creation Club in Wild Appalachia that they'd get tired of the quote storytelling unquote being skipped by the players. Then we find the ruins, which themselves point us to a system, and we somehow automatically know which planet in that system to go to in order to run into the Hunter and Emissary. Dot. 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 What the actual- I guess if someone were to figure out the Unity Parable while we were at Slayton Aerospace, then they'd show up to Oberim 3 and find nothing, because the Starborn would be too busy chasing us around. It gets worse. So we have an in-person meeting with both characters where some big reveals happen. The Emissary, whom I forgot existed because they barely introduced themselves at Neon, is revealed to be whichever companion died most recently. However, their voice tends to fluctuate between that of all the companions, and the whole point of the mask is so that they can reveal their identity here. I guess this is supposed to be a big twist, however the fact that their identity can change means it's not. I think the writers are counting on the player initially thinking that they are literally the same person rather than being multiversally the same person. I went through Universe 1 not really knowing this element of the story and still immediately figured out that there was an alternate universe's version of this Lost Companion. Which is not a particularly shocking revelation, but because of their nebulous identity, the game can't really commit to writing it into the Emissary's character. The other Starborn, the Hunter, is revealed to be Keeper Aquilus. Not literally, but from an alternate universe. Until it's revealed that actually, Aquilus, the one in New Atlantis, is also a Starborn, and may have even been the Pilgrim who planted the seeds of the system's religions. And here's where I take the story even more non-linearly. Towards the end of the questline is a quest called Entangled that someone introduces the concept of multiversal realities. I'll summarize it here. The researchers were messing with Artifact Lambda, and their security was so tight that the entire facility became a closed system. Not really because they can still radio out, but whatever. Then there was a Half-Life reference. In one reality, a man jumps into a room and manages to survive a fire. In the other reality, the man goes to a control room where he can avert the accident, but dies in the process. The premise of the mission is that because of our powers, we can hop between these two realities. In essence, multiverses exist based on the outcomes of decisions. A bold stance for Bethesda to take, given their history of writing branching decisions. But, two missions later, we reach the Unity, a cutscene plays that seems to portray the entire history of the universe before we return to May 7th, 2330 in a different universe. In essence, the multiverse is not a series of parallel universes, with the same universe infinitely repeating with minor variations that account for small decisions that can be made. Like us, the other Starborn we encounter also reach the Unity, but they are not native to this universe, just as we aren't native to the universe of New Game Plus. Okay. So how does any of this work? The writers had to have a list of rules written down somewhere that... Oh god, there was no design document. Oh f In their defense, when Starfield was being planned out conceptually, there was not a line of properties jumping off the bridge of multiversal writing like we have today. If they had made their planned release in 2021, they could have been early. If they made their publicly announced release date in 2022, they would have been in the middle. There would have been more egregious examples. But by coming out now, they're late and stand out very badly for it. I'm going to be blunt, writing the multiverse is hard, like insanely difficult. I think that like time travel, in order to be qualified to write a good multiversal narrative, you need to have a really strong, fundamental grasp on linear writing. In essence, you need to not be the team that wrote the story for Fallout 4. 
While I do think that interactive mediums might be a good use case for a multiverse, like being able to in-character replay a narrative with branching decisions, I do not think there are many individual writers or studios that can competently handle the challenges yet. In order to write a multiverse, you need a couple things. You need to have a firm grasp on scientific thinking. You need to have a central rule set that, even if not explained to the audience, still exists for the writers to use. But most importantly of all, you need to have one person with a really strong vision who has the authority to shoot down other writers. If that sounds antithetical to Bethesda, that's my point. They have an open-ended approach, which works best at creating a diverse array of stories, but that approach will never write a good time travel or multiverse narrative. In every universe, we run into the Hunter and the Emissary. Even in universes after the Emissary decides he won't go to the Unity, he still appears in the next universe, serving the same role. We can only assume how it works based on how it works for us. Every time we go to the Unity, we come out on May 7th, 2330, the day we touch the artifact. We do not replace this universe's version of ourselves, hence why Keeper Aquilus and our companions still exist in our universe. We have to assume this is how it works for the other Starborn. It's good to have the player abide the same rules as the other characters because it's the most direct way the player will learn and understand your rule set. And that works fine until you learn that there can be multiple Starborn of the same person. There are two Keeper Aquilus Starborn. One is the Hunter, the other is Aquilus himself. Technically three if you count the universe where I failed the final speech check and had to kill the Hunter. So when I brought universe 5 Malcolm to the Unity, Universe 6 should have had two Starborn appear in orbit of Vectera. Now, I easily accept that there could be duplicate Starborn. In fact, the story rather clearly makes a point that each universe's version of a person is not the same person. Both versions of Aquilus believe radically different things. The Hunter wants to keep going through the Unity so he can keep leveling up his powers, but Aquilus wants Starborn to stop hopping realities, and the Emissary wants to gatekeep the Unity because Starborn keep messing things up in repeat universes. This is fine as long as Keeper Aquilus is not supposed to be a future version of the present Hunter, but rather they were created separately. But then who are these random Starborn we run into? How do so many Starborn keep making it through the Unity? If it's possible to still reach the Unity despite someone else building the armillary, then why is there a competition for the artifacts? Can Starborn ever actually die? When we reload, are we actually switching universes to one that played out differently? Do the universes run in parallel, hence why you can summon parallel versions of yourself? I knew things were going badly when during the mission where you engage with the two realities at once, the designer forgot to account for loot tables. So you can loot the same container in each version of events and a completely different set of items will be in each container. This is not something you have to go out of your way to notice as right next to a spot where you can switch realities is a locked chest. If the Universal Division was truly Raphael's split-second decision, then every single other facet of both realities established prior to the incident should be identical. By not accounting for this extremely simple detail, it shows that the designers at Bethesda do not have the commitment to truly explore these ideas. But additionally, this entire sequence is dissonant with the rest of the narrative, and transparently so that the designer can do their variation of the parallel level idea akin to a crack in the slab from Dishonored 2, Outer Persephone from Bioshock 2, or Effect and Cause from Titanfall 2. Weird thing, all sequels. If the game had a strong central vision on how to execute its multiverse, either the multiverse would have been written to the rules established in this mission, or the mission would have been cut. The problem, of course, is that this mission does not explain the multiverse in a way that allows you to do New Game Plus. This is because it's adhering to some variation of the Mini Worlds interpretation. In the MWI, each quantum measurement produces an offshoot universe. Note that at the quantum level this operates upon, there should be many more parallel universes available than just two. For instance, a universe where Raphael tried to reach the control room but died before he could stop the fire from spreading or universes where nothing noticeable changes because the difference is as minute as a single electron's recorded position. However, nothing about the MWI accounts for time travel. If the Unity sends us to a parallel universe, things would be different, but the same amount of time should have passed. So if we spend a week in Universe 1, then we should come out on May 14th, 2330, not May 7th. Instead, the Unity seems to operate on a cyclic model, 
Cyclic models posit that the universe has not only experienced the Big Bang, but is in an infinite loop of expansion and contraction resulting in infinite Big Bangs. Then if the universe is deterministic, it would result in the same formation of cosmological structures up until the creation of sentient decision-making and quantum-observing life forms. In essence, this might not be the first time you're watching this video. Note that I am vastly, vastly summarizing an extremely complicated and controversial field of theory. The point is, we aren't being sent back in time to May 7th, but forward in time past the end of the universe and into the beginning of the next one to the same date. Now of course, I don't think both systems are mutually incompatible, just that it pointlessly adds confusion to the narrative to have both. The narrative reason you have a mission like Nishina is to give the player a practical demonstration of the rules. The questions still remain. If other Starborn can reach the Unity after us, then what is stopping there from being an overwhelming flood of Starborn in each subsequent universe? But the next question is, how are the universes able to stay so similar if things can be drastically different? For example, there are universes where Constellation has been killed or gone missing. So there's zero guarantee that any universe we visit will actually be the same up until the point of our arrival. And it sure would be a nightmare for the writing if Starborn have been able to exist for centuries, able to influence history. Surely there would be universes where the Colony War ended in a victory for the UC, or universes where the Freestar Collective never decided to aid Narion, or where Jin and Varun never started a religion. The problem with posing the premise that each universe can be different in New Game Plus is that you start to question why there aren't more differences. Differences that are obviously well beyond the scope of Starfield, but not No Man's Sky. No Man's Sky has a similar ending, except when the universe is recreated, it is genuinely recreated. Obviously, being able to entirely proc Jin a universe had its advantages in storytelling, but being shown up by No Man's Sky is still poor form. And for what? So some people can be excited when they realize the game can possibly change a little bit in subsequent universes? You made this promise, I hope those fleeting moments were worth it. But fine, let's erase that. Let's assume it's not a problem. The Starborn still suck. The majority of Starborn are faceless and nameless. Almost all of them attack you on site despite being capable of forming alliances with each other. The player is never afforded the ability to join a Starborn gang. There are not other points in the main story where you meet different Starborn characters and get their perspective on things. This is in spite of the fact that reaching the Unity and becoming a Starborn is something that takes a modicum of intelligence. Each Starborn should be intelligent and have their own philosophy. Outside of scripted moments and quests, Starborn will not communicate with anyone. They don't negotiate, they don't make demands of subservience, they don't even gloat. They also don't retreat, nor are they intelligent with what fights they pick, they don't strategically burn farms and minor settlements, they just sit on mountain peaks and occasionally fly off to go get killed. Sorry, reading from my Skyrim script again. Yes, Starborn have the same exact narrative problem that dragons have. Each Starborn is supposed to represent an intelligent human being who went through the journey similar to ours and made it through the Unity, possibly multiple times. I think it's telling that they not only repeated the dragon mistake, but decided to make it worse. Someone not familiar with the Elder Scrolls lore who isn't paying attention can at least think dragons are supposed to be giant monsters. Starborn are obviously humans. Given the sheer number of Starborn who show up, it is hard to believe that it's any kind of competition to actually get to the Unity. There's really no reason for them not to work together, and they do, just not with us. If anything, once the Unity's been run through two dozen times, 24 Starborn variations of the same person could make a pact to each collect one artifact and then all go to the Unity together every time. There's all kinds of interesting things you could do. A bunch of Starborn could be variations of Constellation members who had different backgrounds or life outcomes, characters who didn't make the same mistakes our version did, characters who made more mistakes. Because the whole reason writers do multiverse stories is to explore their characters, not just explain why you can replay the game, to do what-ifs and team-ups that couldn't normally happen. The Starborn revelation should be followed by a bunch of character-driven multiverse exploration. But, of course, it's hard to do that if one of your characters is dead. The real exploration was the friends we made along the way. <laughs> Still, New Game Plus could see us running into more Starborn characters. Instead, the Starborn are just another human enemy type for us to kill. Do you know what's worse than being shown up by No Man's Sky? 
being shown up by Yik, a postmodern role-playing game. From 2019, we're still tracking inspirations. Yik is also a multiverse storyline and even has a mystery component to figure out what's going on. But the reveal happens much sooner and is used to explore its characters. One of the party members is not from our universe. We meet alternate versions of characters. We meet alternate versions of the protagonist. We go to other universes. Things change. And like, Yik is awful. But even that game knew what the narrative purpose of the multiverse is. Even if its goal was to have the multiverse so Alex could simp over an IRL dead girl the developer was fascinated with. Once I made the connection, I just laughed. I imagine the Starfield main character you know, I don't actually know what their meta title is. Anyways, I imagine them monologuing at a temple about how they've never really felt the love of a woman before. You are probably wondering how the Hunter and Emissary see us if we ourselves are Starborn. I do find the interactions slightly amusing. The Hunter and Emissary are playing this game with each other and have established mutual rules about how it plays out, and we are the newest member to this weird community. The Emissary does not approve of us reliving our universe one life, while the Hunter finds all of our actions that challenge the status quo fun. I think it really helped highlight some of the missed opportunity it was to not have more Starborn characters, because I at least find the notion of interacting with characters who are going through this process like us more interesting than just Skyrim NPCs, but in space, as we often get with the normal non-Starborn characters. However, then the Emissary, if you're replaying the main quest, demands that you go visit NASA to see how Starborn screwed things up for humanity in order to learn perspective. You aren't able to say, Nah, I don't think I will. I'll just let the other Starborn already on their way there collect it for me and then ambush them outside. Because that's the thing, nobody can achieve the unity unless they have all of the artifacts. We have the most giving us the most leverage over the other Starborn. We should be able to use that. At the very least, we could use threats to skip the more tedious quests, with maybe a line from the Emissary that threats are why these two have rules. It seems like of the elements that would actually change the most on a second playthrough, everything to do with the Hunter and Emissary would be the big one. Neither have lines to really acknowledge things you've done in the past and will outwardly forget you're a Starborn when certain things happen. But weirdly, they're as equally stuck in the time loop as Constellation is. They watch the same events play out in the same order and think nothing of it. I literally convinced them through persuasion to skip the final fight 9 out of 10 universes with the same basic arguments. The Hunter being caught in a loop at least makes sense, he's a metagamer who's figured out how to reach the unity with as little effort on his part as possible. The Emissary though, he fails 7 for 7 and never thinks to change the status quo. If you don't want people going to the unity, have you ever thought about holding one of the artifacts hostage? It really is sad to think about the possibilities and knowing that they had the full eight years to plan and do anything, and their main idea was memes where Sarah Morgan is a potted plant or where every member of Constellation is you. And this is part of the reason why I find claims that this is Bethesda's best main story baffling. Pretty much the only way you can defend that take is by liberally excluding a majority of their library. Even Fallout 76's base main story is better simply because it works within its own limitations. Ambition by itself is not admirable if you can't execute your big vision. Starfield's main story is simply the product of a studio that thought Fallout 4 was good. Don't listen to the critics, as long as the money printer keeps going, you did a good job. Sales equals quality. I mean sure, Fallout 4 sold less than Skyrim, but that's only because it's newer and Skyrim was sold multiple times, it's no other reason. Which is why I'm mostly going to wind down from here. We are not done with the main story, but I'm also not going to repeat myself. I think I have demonstrated fairly clearly why this premise does not work and why it was a bad idea. If Bethesda was smart, they would demote Emil to just a rank and file designer and put someone in charge who does not delude themselves into thinking that they are capable of tackling the big philosophical ideas. Constellation should not be about the multiverse. It should be about space exploration. Travel to new systems should be expensive, and the majority of quests not related directly to exploring should be about helping a diverse cast of characters raise funds and resources. That way you can push players into the side content and keep things low stakes, and then every Constellation member could have a pet mystery they're working on. Sarah Morgan just wants to expand the scope of the settled systems. Sam Coe wants to find Solomon Coe's final resting place. Andrea wants to find the Varun homeworld, Barrett wants to find his character arc, etc. 
since there is already an increased focus on the companions, you could have had the storyline lean into telling just a basic human story. The next quest is a premise for how the storyline could work. It's about uncovering what exactly happened to Earth. Instead of being sent here by the Starborn teaching us about the philosophical importance of not interfering with future universes, maybe it's just Barrett who wants to explore the legacy of NASA. And in the process of uncovering that mystery, you accidentally stumble upon a hidden truth about the evacuation. Upon our return to the Lodge with our new information about the Unity, we announce that Sam is actually alive. But he's not. He's not the Emissary. Because the Emissary is already Barrett. This is yet another instance where the designers just are not accounting for multiple playthroughs, and they do bear mentioning as counters to the idea that Starborn runs are meaningfully different. The designers seem to have forgotten that the Emissary does not reveal himself to have a new identity should a different companion die. But the quest staging checks who died and answers Sam, so that's the response we get to give. Unless, of course, the Emissary is actually supposed to be all companions who could die combined, hence why they are referred to with plural pronouns. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not even gonna try to figure out how the rules would let that happen. Two Vix from hell. There is a three-way split here. You can go back to the lodge to report your findings, where Vlad will give you two more artifact missions. One is a generic dungeon, and the other is a multiversal dungeon we talked about earlier. It really gives credence to the theory that a lot of these generic artifact quests may have been intended to be filled out with handcrafted quests in development. Putting a generic dungeon next to the NASA and Nishina quests is bold. The Nishina mission in particular is painful on repeat runs. They try to account for this with Starborn checks allowing you to skip most of the mystery components of why you're phased in between realities, but having to do the sequence and walking around, reality hopping, grabbing key cards, and overriding security lockdown, it's just, it's, it's tedious. Which is funny because in the skipped version of the main quest, Constellation uses our foreknowledge to get all of the artifacts. But that should theoretically be impossible for Nishina because you have to have a Starborn power to switch universes, and nobody seems to have gotten any without our help. So, who went to Nishina? Also, materials taken from the alternate reality can be transferred into the main reality. So using robots, we should be able to store a bunch of rare materials and resources inside Nishina, activate the experiment using robots, enter the facility, and extract the duplicated materials from the alternate reality, and then exit and deactivate the experiment. This will result in resource doubling, and it's ethics-free because nobody gets deleted in the process. Speaking of, though, I'm not entirely clear on why Nishina couldn't have been evacuated prior to us making a decision on which reality to save, but maybe there's a line I missed where the whole closed system might collapse if anyone native tries to leave. Nishina just isn't particularly impressive, both in the design of its mission and the world building it does. But of course, can't say that without talking about the one primary mission to take place on Earth. We already touched on the disappointment that is Earth. Prepare to be shocked. We arrive at the NASA facility to get a touch of environmental storytelling that Bethesda is known for. Which of course means posed skeletons with some written terminals and audio logs. In fairness, the latter two are actual improvements for the series. I generally opted against reading terminals in the Fallout games due to how sluggish they were to actually use, whereas they're far more responsive in Starfield. There are also a lot less journal entries scattered around than in Fallout 76. Additionally, audio logs in Starfield now feature full transcripts. Still limited in the playback controls, but at least I can just read the audio log and get it over with faster. Because of course, rather than spacing out the logs to play during our slow exploration of an almost entirely enemyless dungeon, they bunch up multiple logs in a single spot, so you just have to sit there and listen to them. Project Log. So you can probably already guess what this dungeon is going to reveal. Say it with me. They dug up something on Mars that gave humanity access to faster than light travel. The revelation of that something eventually dooming the Earth. Yeah, yeah, Emil, we know you like Mass Effect. They found an artifact on Mars and it was key to developing grav drives. However, the final revelations of the dungeons reveals that there was a flaw with grav drives that interfered with Earth's magnetosphere. Um... Oh, and the guy responsible did so under the direction of what was likely his starborn self. Now let's be fair, that's not a temporal paradox. Victor Aza was the first person to find an artifact. He managed to figure out grav drives and probably had enough of an understanding of the artifacts to look for more. It especially wouldn't have been too difficult, 
as most of the artifacts would be in their original untouched positions and he wouldn't have any other Starborn to compete with. So he spent some time doing this in the real Universe 1, went to the Unity, and then first thing went and found himself in the real Universe 2 and changed its history. This is all plausible within the rules established. The problem is, the timeline and motivations don't make much sense. The Hunter suggests this was done in order to speed up the process of finding all the artifacts. Earth was intentionally destroyed by a Starborn in order to push humanity out to the stars. However, I doubt it took Aiza more than 200 years to find all 24 artifacts on account of old age being a thing, unless finding a temple conveniently triggers the Starborn transformation that stops the aging process. Even then, it would still be 200 years before anyone else even noticed there was an artifact hunt to be done. There's also no indication of there being a Starborn Aiza, only that he had visions telling him what to do. I did read a theory that the Hunter is actually Aiza, whom is also the Pilgrim and Keeper Aquilus. I don't know though, at that point it just seems stupid, like the Hunter is this blanket character that we are going to blame everything on. He's Starborn's Thalmor. Plus, it doesn't really track. If the Hunter's goal is to speed up the process, then how and why does it take 200 years between Earth's collapse and the artifact hunt starting? It seems really inefficient to wait around every universe for centuries for an explorer's group to be founded and for them to figure out the artifacts are even a thing to collect, when you could just learn the underlying technology to detect gravitational waves and go dig up the artifacts yourself. Remember, Constellation only started investigating the artifacts after Barrett found the second one. The Hunter could have sped up the hunt by decades if he just thought to go get the second artifact and have it mailed to the Lodge. That's not even the dumb part. The dumb part is that the first generation grav drives had a minor flaw that caused them to strip Earth of its magnetosphere. This is akin to saying that the first combustion engines had a minor flaw that caused them to produce fissile material. Not even joking. Sure, the parallel is obviously supposed to be climate change, even if they didn't commit to it. I don't think the writers even know what our magnetosphere is, or what the sun is. I say that because our magnetosphere is Earth's shield from the power of the sun. I don't think you realize how strong it has to be to serve that role, or how and why it even exists. Our core is full of molten material swirling around, mostly iron and nickel. This is important because it means that the majority of Earth on a scale humans struggle to comprehend is ostensibly one giant magnet. Now to say that something humans at the end of the current century create could counteract those forces is insane, and that the flaw could be invisibly patched from all future grav drives with minimal effort is even crazier. Can the drives be fixed? I'm working on some designs that should discreetly solve the problem under the guise of an emergency update to the fuel and pumps. This means that every single ship flying around the settled systems is some minor modifications or malfunctions away from becoming a weapon of planetary destruction. You know, most sci-fi writers try really, really hard to explain why their FTL devices can't be used as weapons. It makes Starfield rather avant-garde for going out of its way to say, no, they're weapons, but nobody knows. All a faction with this knowledge would have to do is create a series of drones to repeatedly jump into and back out of the orbit of Jemison or Aquila or Voli Alpha. Yeah, the combustion engine metaphor is really starting to break down, especially since a time-traveling space wizard didn't tell its inventor to do it so that humans could do their job for them. I sure hope there aren't any factions in the settled systems motivated to do exactly that, or Starborn. This is why I can't take this game seriously. They wanted to magic up a reason why Earth was gone and went with, the FTL devices had a programming error. I guess it makes sense that Bethesda would write a bug into the foundation of their new setting. The pitch is that the error was intentional so that humanity would explore space and thus seek out the artifacts. Get it? because humans in our world aren't motivated enough to do so. How's this place even still around? Surely whatever destroyed 99.99% .99 of the planet would be capable of destroying this structure as well. <sighs> I don't even understand the lesson here. What does the Emissary think I could possibly do to make things worse? I literally spawn in a week before the artifact hunt concludes in every universe. 
It is a pointless lesson aimed at entertaining the player, not actually being relevant to the character we are playing. Plus, it turns out changing the timeline is based as long as it's in the interest of the game. See, the final artifact to be claimed is located at a place called the Buried Temple. But apparently, some Starborn set it up to where Ecliptic Mercs built a base on top of the temple. The Emissary doesn't seem to have a problem with that. You know, man, Ecliptic Mercs may be bad guys, but they're still people who had their lives ruined by your little Starborn tournament. Yes, of course. I forgot. Well, Danny kind of forgot. Speaking of space exploration, though, I thought about inserting a section about it sooner, but nah, this is fine. It kind of fits that we're talking about space exploration in a game where its main questline is about space explorers, uh, you know, right before the credits. World design and exploration is a staple crutch for Bethesda. Consider that Fallout 76 narrowly avoided shutdown by having just enough players to make money. Ironically, because of PlayStation, but I digress. Fallout 76 has only lived as long as it has, riding on the back of its good world design. So it was a risky and no doubt undesired play to move away from that. I say undesired because I doubt I'm saying anything the team at Bethesda didn't already figure out when developing Starfield. Starfield's problem is a copious amount of loading screens and menu hopping between its world spaces. In fairness, they managed to get the loading times down, as long as you run the game on an SSD, you see, something they managed to forget to mention verbally during the Direct was that an SSD is necessary to play Starfield. Not recommended, necessary. It was in the spec sheet, but the reason is that the game is borderline unplayable on a hard drive. The thing is, I was suspicious of this. Well, I was suspicious of how many loading screens there would be. I figured this would create an issue because historically, Bethesda games are slow loading. My thought process was that the loading times were finally fixed, Todd Howard would be shirtless on a stage screaming it to the world. The fact is, the load times are fixed, but announcing so would draw attention to the SSD requirement. Todd is already in trouble for telling PC players to just upgrade their machines, in the face of Starfield's terrible optimization practices being exposed. Why did you not optimize this game for PC? Uh, we did. It's running great. It is a next-gen PC game. We really do push the technology, so you may need to upgrade your PC for this game. Uh, we are so excited for our new partnership with AMD on Starfield. The cum and lollipop sticks holding this engine together are being strained, to say the least. They are relying on brute force to get out of their technical debt problems from years of not having the right team working on their engine. Thing is, I'm not one of those people who thinks the engine is the entire problem. Creation Engine is specialized to Bethesda's design practices. It's a good sentiment that they should replace it, but other companies do fine using and upgrading the same engine long term. Whichever game they change the engine for will only take longer to release. Which isn't my problem, because Starfield was the sign I needed and knew was going to come to have zero hope for Elder Scrolls VI. I've said before, I hope they never make that game anyways, so yeah. Switch engines now, delay that game until 2035, please make my day. The game is loading screen hell, even if the individual loading screens aren't as bad as Fallout 4. Doors on the surface, switching from surface to orbit, switching between different orbits in the same system, switching between systems, these all carry loading screens. Fast travel is the shortcut this game uses to avoid what would be, by my estimate, somewhere between 13 to 17 minimum loading screens per quest. Yeah, go ahead and say if you don't like fast travel just don't use it, that argument just doesn't work anymore. The problem isn't just the time spent loading, it's the hard division between load spaces. Players have always accepted that there are some loading screens between buildings, cities, the world, and dungeons. It's still the case that a typical quest in Skyrim is an average of six loading screens, usually with some time between them as you travel through the world. There's not an ability to meaningfully explore in Starfield without going through some kind of arbitrary division, not so much an open world as a set of isolated rooms. True. The number of rooms is large, but it's not one world. Some level of this was expected, but I doubt anybody actually thought it would be quite like this. Exploration is not quite. You can get an overview of every system in the game no matter where you are. You'll see how many planets they have, even get previews of their main points of interest. Because it would make the travel awful, you don't actually have to stop in any one system once you've got an explored route from one end of the map to the other. 
Annoyingly though, the map does not have the option to press a button and have all their names appear. This makes finding some systems an absolute nightmare if you don't have a quest marker to go there. However, the orbital sections are not particularly engaging, in big part because space is a series of locations for space combat, so you learn to avoid it as often as possible. Even when it's not space combat, the random encounters are often not worth the price of discovery. It is really hard to keep caring about seeing these encounters if you keep repeating the same events in the same universe. There are only so many times I can hear the same dialogue about who prefers what ship manufacturer before I consider the orbital phase pointless. There is no experience in Starfield that replicates exploration in any of the Elder Scrolls games. Once you do have a planet in mind to go to, you either pick from a list of prefabbed landing zones or pick one of your own. What I noticed is that unless it was part of a quest, all of the pre-generated landing zones just seem to be indistinguishable from the random ones, often using the same generic points of interest for the main location it advertised from orbit. On-foot exploration is also pointless. In fact, quite literally, you are better off continually selecting new landing zones when you're on the ground than actually running between points of interest on one map. The content is repetitive and unless it's a dungeon, very low in rewards as well. There is no reward for exploration, either in content or mechanical incentives. Out of curiosity, I decided to boot up another Minecraft mod pack to see if I could glean some insight from exploration in that game. For me, there are two dynamics of exploration in Minecraft. The first is base scouting. I've played enough times to know that I do not like setting down routes unless I manage to find the ideal spot, because I really hate the process of moving bases. The second is material. There are lots of reasons, especially in mod packs, to explore and return with various materials in order to progress. The problem is that they made outposts an optional subsystem. In Fallout 4 and 76, having a good workshop is very important to the flow of that game, whereas that focus has shifted to the shipbuilding being your mobile base. So there's not a strong incentive to find planets for base building purposes, and even when I did, there would usually be some random outpost habitation perk I was expected to have, further dampening things. The resources are also not necessary. For instance, I know off the top of my head where multiple mines are in Skyrim because there's a material incentive to know such things. Something that could help would be regional materials pricing. So noticing there is a huge demand for titanium and then exploring to find a source of that material that is not too far away to be expensive to transport. But no, universal pricing. Once you actually get onto the ground, it improves, but not drastically. There do not seem to be many unique points of interest to actually find. There also doesn't seem to be a system attempting to prevent repetition in the points of interest. So for instance, if I clear a specific dungeon type, for example, the deserted UC listening post, the game does not temporarily remove that dungeon from the pool of possible generations. Such a system would only be feasible though if there were hundreds of dungeon templates, which there are not. There aren't even more than a few dozen. This is probably the most confusing part of Starfield. For being the game with the longest development cycle and their largest world, and claiming to have the most handcrafted content, it appears to have the lowest actual number of unique dungeons and dungeon templates of any of their games. And this is not a quality versus quantity issue. These dungeon templates are not a step up from what you would see in Skyrim or Fallout 4. As of writing, there is no official final count yet on how many there are, but I have seen guesses from players with more than 100 hours between 20 and 30. For reference, Skyrim has 200 dungeons. I actually went through my footage and counted. I encountered 23 dungeon templates, aka repeatable dungeons that are not tied to specific quests. Seven of those templates were repeated more than three times. And I'm not counting dungeons I just ran by, I mean genuinely ones I did. I ran through this abandoned mine 11 times, or once every 10 hours. For reference, I am confident that Bleak Falls Barrow is the only dungeon in Skyrim that I have done more than five times, and that is because it is the dungeon you have to do to unlock Dragon Shouts. I do not understand how you spend more time making a game with more developers and end up with less content. It's to the point that I almost thought there was a bug where a bunch of dungeon templates just weren't triggering, but talking to other people really has affirmed that there are this few. 
Starfield is supposed to have the most handcrafted content out of any of their games, but I honestly struggle to believe that's actually true. In fact, I think part of the reason they aren't releasing the creation kit this year is so that nobody can look through the game files to verify just how little content there is until long enough after release for it to not impact sales. Overall, exploration in this game just doesn't work. Whether you're at the high-end level exploring a solar system, or the low-end level running around a planet, there is no incentive. It does not feel rewarding, it is not particularly relaxing or pretty to look at. And a lot of people notice this. Even some big shill channels like Matty Plays had to admit exploration was a weak point for Starfield, in the game that was about space explorers. You just risk it and say, oh, that's a little bit of a different name from what I've seen before with these kind of generic other locations. What is that? Let me check it out. And sometimes, oftentimes, I was just like, man, why did I do that? I should have just followed the quest path. I shouldn't have bothered exploring. So why is it weak? My guess is this is not the system that they wanted. This is the system they ended up with because it was the only way to get the jank machine to cooperate. No Man's Sky's strength is that its engine, from inception, was designed around the generation requirements of that game. You cannot seamlessly land on a planet from orbit if you don't have a system where you can fully explore a planet. I don't know the technical side for why their world spaces needed to be subdivided. Short of either not getting square cells to work on a sphere, not being able to get spherical gravity, or just being unable to keep it from having performance issues when players actually went too far away from the landing zone. And then pretty much everything stems from there. Lacking seamless cohesion between ground and space, they become segregated modes. They diverge in design priority. As weak as the world slivers are, they are still the stronger of the two area types compared to the orbital maps. Honestly, it's at the point that I do wonder why they didn't opt for Radiant Dungeons. They already have a tiled level prop system. It might actually be more appropriate if, instead of the same generic dungeons with the same named NPC corpses and props, if all of the template dungeons were replaced with Radiant Dungeons that were generated upon entry. Would it be repetitive? It is in most games that are already using such systems. But would it be less repetitive than running the same 20 to 30 handcrafted dungeons on repeat? Absolutely. Again, this is assuming they couldn't have just made more templates. Speaking of dungeons though, Starfield ends with a final dungeon. It's alright. It has to be, considering it's a consistent element of every New Game Plus run. You come here early, it's just the main facility and access to the Buried Temple is impossible until you have the final quest. But before that, we have to reach it. Masada is a system on the far end of settled space. It is kind of random that you'll go from the left half of the map to being thrust into the deep end of a level 70 system. It really stood out to me how much of the artifact chase was entirely localized around a handful of solar system within a couple jumps range of Alpha Centauri. Starfield's main quest didn't do as good of a job as many of their others at actually pushing the player to different parts of their game world. For example, Skyrim's main quest sends you to all of the major holds and most of the minor holds. This makes it a vehicle for further exploration if you get sidetracked. We first get confronted with a space battle. We're given the choice between siding with the Emissary or Hunter or going solo. I say choice, but you know that really just means which flavor of ending we get. Which is pointless in an endlessly repeating universe. If I actually gave a fuck what happened to these people, I wouldn't be leaving their universe. So ensues one of the few mandatory space battles. The starborn ships seem weirdly more capable of handling the giant L design compared to the regular ships. Also, don't bother finding the red swirling stuff in the background notable. That got reused from somewhere else as well. If you arrive to this area after this point in the main quest, then the native ecliptic mercs get replaced by a series of starborn boss enemies. You know, the starborn, the famous threats. The eclipse mercs, sorry, that's stolen from Mass Effect 2, the ecliptic mercs that are usually here are bigger threats than the Starborn. The first encounter has a handful of Starborn appear who can all duplicate using parallel self as well as using reactive shields. A shame they've got no defense against anti-gravity fields, or gravity wave, or gravity well, but the real Starborn killer power is phased time, which is just a slow time ability. The Starborn have no counter for any of these abilities. It's worse than dragons because dragons don't get locked up and bodied hard by basic shouts. I suppose the dual-wielded destruction equivalent of Starfield is semi-automatic weapons spamming headshots in slow time, which is a guaranteed power you get at the end of the first Barry Temple. The ability did help expose that the weapons are still operating on hitscan, which means there's no gravity mechanics for projectiles. 
But you can also see the shotguns modded to use slugs. No, no, I'm fine. Shotguns that use slugs still have pellet spread. These encounters are at least novel for a first time run. For example, the second encounter is a series of waves of reanimated ecliptic mercs. Isn't that neat? Generic, but I mean, I guess it's genuinely the most unique dungeon in this game. As well, the artifacts are stronger here. What? I guess I should have questioned the gravity magic sooner, but apparently it can also give us visions and desires to test our worthiness. Okay. Why? What's the parameters? Stories don't just randomly test the protagonist by unspecified parameters that seem impossible to fail. You just put these visions in here because of science fiction tropes, didn't you? There are three visions. The first is right before we pick up the artifact, specifically the moment when Lin sent us in. The second is a confrontation with the captain of the scow over that evil thing they forced us to do. The third is a universe where the constellation member killed by the hunter was us. Alright, pause. You may have noticed that each of these visions are disconnected from the others. One is a literal memory, the second is a judgment for something we did, and the last is something that didn't happen to us directly but rather we were told about. Notice how weird it was that I used a different type of sequential indicator when listing the examples? So what is the test in seeing the day that the artifact was found, exactly? If I was doing this scene, I would make it so that Lin tells Heller to grab the artifact instead of us. That way at least the temple is saying, hey, you almost weren't the protagonist of this story. Makes you feel a little bit insignificant now, doesn't it? Because I don't see the point of being reminded of this moment. The second is a condemnation for doing something evil, even though we were forced into it. That's the problem with writing a judgment scene, it comes off as forced if players aren't able to have done the right thing in the first place. It was probably out of their scope to write a bunch of scenes like this for all the moral decisions the player makes throughout the story, so they settled on a single bottleneck. Frankly, what I did to the scow was way better than what I did at Slayton Aerospace, and what I did at Nishina would probably make for a more consistent scene. The third scene is also bizarre. It's a reference to the hunter, who stated that typically, we are the one who dies, remarking that our survival is a new state of things for the Star Wars game. Honestly, I think the real reason is to just give the player a chance to kill Vlad. And you should, at least once, as revenge for all those temple quests. You can also just turn around and leave immediately, ignoring the conversation. <laughs> Again, what's the point exactly? As has been established many times, it's irrelevant that an alternate version of me died because that's not me. And we already know that the multiverse exists, so... Honestly, given how little investment I have in knowing what my character actually looks like, I didn't even immediately connect that it was supposed to be my character. And so, we've got three visions that barely mean anything on their own, and are not working together to make any kind of bigger point. Cool. It's funny too, because if you come here with the hunter or emissary, they'll explain the visions as though we have not had them before. Which is extra funny, because in Universe 1, I actually went solo and only picked sides in subsequent universes. But it's very obvious these dialogues are not supposed to be seen on repeat runs. Whatever. We're almost done. The second to last encounter is with a guy who duplicates yourself and whichever companions you have, so strip down and watch as ten naked versions of yourself spawn in. We finally reach the buried temple and have a final confrontation with whomever we did not side with. As I stated before, I solved most of these with words rather than violence. Which actually only gets easier thanks to a starborn check being added to the persuasion pool in subsequent universes. This quest is called Revelation, and yet nothing is revealed. Seriously, all of the information that is stated or shown in this quest was revealed in prior quests. We already knew about the multiverse, we already knew about the artifacts, we already knew about the temples. None of the visions reveal anything. We don't get any answers for why any of this is happening. There is nothing in this quest that constitutes a revelation. The emissary will lie about staying behind in this universe, the hunter will stow away on our ship and do nothing until we get around to actually building the armillary. They just leave, I guess, if we persuade them to leave. And that's kind of it. The companions all decide they want to go to the Unity. The non-companions decide they'll stay behind to do whatever it is Constellation does when it's not chasing the artifacts. I'll say it for the last time. It really is bizarre that we're at the end and have not been spending time with more Starborn characters. 
They came up with this really stupid premise and then decided to do almost nothing with it. You can't even make the excuse that the multiverse exists so that they can write interesting character moments. Why? Because the Companions team and the Quest team are separate. This comes across transparently as Companions ruin Quest moments by begging us for our time instead of just waiting until we're back at the ship. They also don't synergize with the writing, aside from a single line acknowledging that this isn't our first meeting and we should temper our expectations. There is no interplay between the Unity and the Companions. And I do mean they are separate. Companions were recognized as being a high point for Fallout 4 if only because the storylines were extreme low points. Remember Nick Valentine's quest? Anyways, they decided they wanted to expand on that for Starfield, so they got their own team. Which is funny because it ends up landing pretty similar to the Companions in The Outer Worlds, just a separate group completely unrelated to the main plot in their writing. I mean, let's compare this to a game that is completely fair to make the comparison to, thanks to all the things it ripped off from, Mass Effect. Like in Starfield, the Companions for Mass Effect serve as informal diplomats that are specific factions. However, the overall narrative for Mass Effect ties into these factions heavily. The storytelling is reliant on these quests to convey ideas to the player, and it tries to push the player into doing them by making the characters something you invest into. Example being Tali and Legion exploring the relationship between the Quarians and the Geth and how their societies work. It helps that the Companions themselves are written into the storytelling, if for no other reason, You'll do the companion missions in order to keep everyone alive through the final mission. Starfield has a different priority. Bethesda, if tasked with making this story, would have a hard time handling the possibility of Samara dying before her big moment in the finale, or for the possibility of not even having recruited many of the companions. Outside of their introductions, the companions are only used for a ritual sacrifice and then are left to have their own vestigial side story where you deal with some trauma they experienced a decade or two prior. Because they could have died in the Hunter's attack, the game has to become flexible enough to not have them exist at all. So for instance, Sarah Morgan stops being the lead voice in meetings because there's a chance that she's dead. It becomes a more lonely storyline as a result. Outside of a few comments you might receive praising or condemning a decision, they barely participate in the latter half of a questline. So when all of them decide they're going to the Unity, no. None of you earned a spot here. It's cute that you thought this was even an option for you. Maybe next universe when I'm meeting with the Emissary and the Hunter, you'll show some more initiative. So the only thing left is to go to the Unity. This comes in the form of building the armillary on your ship, somehow, if it's not a Starborn Guardian. Then you just power up the grab drive and get taken straight to where you meet. You made it. I hope you're enjoying the view. What the hell is going on? <sighs> I really don't even know why this guy's here beyond giving the voice actor a chance to be consistently seen if players aren't lucky enough to get the universe where you can recruit yourself as a companion. I mean, he's the narrative equivalent of that AI at the end of Mass Effect 3, just here to help facilitate the ending, not really interested in concluding things. Who created the artifacts, Temple and Unity? Uh, the creators? Stupid? Any more stupid questions? This little space is set up to serve as an interactive credit slideshow of the outcomes of all the quest lines you do. Which is largely that, whatever status quo you established in that storyline, it continues. Forever. The whole point of the ending slideshow is that it allows you to explain what happens after the ending without creating tons and tons of new assets. It's cheap, but it's the reality of development, and it at least allows the developers to showcase some kind of thought-out outcome to player decisions. Such a thing is not necessary for Bethesda because you can instantly intuit the consequences of decisions. One, because there barely are any, and two, because the writers don't really think about long-term consequences. And, well, you know why. Without a design document, most of the writers are only thinking in the immediate term. The whole ending is really just like so many other things, a compromise between Skyrim and Fallout. Fallout has endings, Elder Scrolls games don't. Starfield needs to be an in-between. And so we arrive on the final cutscene. Makes me feel... something. It's got this whole overture over striking imagery that makes it obvious that they're trying to make you feel something, but every time I saw it I was uncertain what exactly they wanted out of me. Am I supposed to feel sad? Accomplished? Pensive? All I feel is that it's obviously an element working in isolation, relying on someone else to write an ending that would actually merit an emotional moment like this, but no design doc. Funny thing, there's an issue with the credits where the music just stops.
the names scroll by without any sound playing. It's not like the song ends because the credits last for over 20 minutes in the middle of like the localizers. There are literally department heads still scrolling by when the music stops. That's not to say localizers don't deserve the same music that department heads get, just that it's unusual for both of them to get snubbed like this. But they made sure that you couldn't skip the directors and producers, and you have to see them every time you beat the game. The song ends after a minute 50, which says to me they just slapped a single mp3 in there and called it a day. Also, about 20 seconds into the song, it plays the sound of, like, someone banging on a metal door. It's honestly weird how badly put together the credits are. I always sit through the entire credit scroll when I beat a game, because these people presumably worked hard to reach this point. It's really weird to not even throw on some of the generic ambient exploration mixes that do exist in the files while the rest of the credits run. Like, it's the little things. Starfield can't even do credits correctly. And so we've come full circle, arriving in orbit above Vectera in our Starborn Guardian adorned in a randomized set of Starborn equipment. We can now officially begin to play the Starfield. All right, so that's 40,000 words down, roughly a thousand for every hour it took to reach this point. Todd was technically right on the mark with his call that this was a 40 hour story, even if more than half of that was actually me just grinding temples and new game plus runs trying to unlock all powers. Starfield's main storyline is a mess. It's ambitious, sure, but it misses the mark on remembering the Starborn angle on repeat runs that I'm not sure if we can actually credit all those sequence-breaking moments as intentional design or just oversights. In fact, some of them were obviously oversights. I honestly think the only convenience they legitimately thought to offer was skipping some minor bribery and saving a single person's life. And taken at face value, it's not much better. You may have noticed that the mystery itself doesn't pay off. The goal of the artifact hunt was just to unlock the ability to do it all again. Realizing there is no answer other than to be told that maybe if we do it a few more times and buy the DLC and sequels, maybe one day we'll find out who the creators are. Like we didn't already figure out the first run through that the amorphous creators are just the creators of the game who made the artifacts so a video game could occur. Except every other story written has had the same objective. You don't pull the curtain back and say, See? We did all this just to have fun. Wasn't that Slayton Aerospace mission fun? And that's really the crux of the problem. The issue isn't just that the story's bad. It's that everything in Starfield is bad. <sighs> the day after script editing for the section, Something Wicked Games announced that ex-Bethesda design director Will Shin was joining their upcoming project. Yeah, that's how his departure was announced. Granted, it was the same day as Pete Hines' retirement announcement, and I doubt optically they wanted to announce multiple departures on the same Monday. The lead quest design position at Bethesda is cursed, but I doubt it's because of any ghosts. It's a thankless and heavily criticized job, and I'm sure years of not having a design document and a mentality that everyone's idea is good, the only limitation is what's possible, war on the soul. Like, consider for a second that Something Wicked is making a fantasy game, as opposed to Bethesda, which is also going to be making their next game a fantasy game. So obviously the problem is not genre. It's not as though the developers who wanted to make a fantasy game decided to leave after Bethesda announced the next game was going to be Fallout 5 and then Starfield 2. I'm going to have to imagine that with COVID, the multiple delays in release, the strict non-disclosure agreements, and highly curated community interactions, and the Microsoft acquisition, Bethesda is not quite as fun of a company to work for as it used to be. I think that's why Something Wicked is emphasizing their existence as an independent RPG developer, collecting talent from many studios that have died creatively, such as Bethesda, Obsidian, and Bioware. It'll be interesting to see how it turns out. This is not the first time this has happened, though. Morrowind and Oblivion's lead designer, Ken Rolston, retired and then was hired by Big Huge Games, with another senior designer from Bethesda, Mark Nelson, joining to work on what would become Kingdoms of Amalur. So, you know, as long as something wicked doesn't end up owing the state of Rhode Island tens of millions of dollars, they should be fine. There was a point when I was running through the Crimson Fleet questline when I realized that House Varun was not going to show up and that I was closer to completing Starfield than I thought I was. 
It was also at that point that I realized that somehow, some way, this game was not bigger than Skyrim. But hey, at least we're in the real game now, right? To be honest, Starfield's side content isn't great. Or at least it's not significantly better than Starfield's main storyline. Given we're like five hours into this script, that should be alarming. I made the mistake of doing Ryujin last. It was a mistake because Ryujin is so boring that it has managed to snatch the most boring title from the companions in Skyrim. It really dragged the average amount of playtime I was getting per day down at the end. I really struggled to justify continuing to play Starfield to finish out the Ryujin line. It's fitting because it basically starts with four or five quests that you find out later are the templates for radiant missions for the faction. I did Ryujin last because the game introduced it never. I just randomly had a mission where my character felt we needed to apply for a job and literally the only thing that distinguished it from the dozen or so other identical side quests is that it had a logo instead of a generic quest icon. I think it comes from walking by one of their job application kiosks. That said, really stupid premise for a quest line. Why? Because there's no way to play Starfield and not have a greater purpose in life than trying to find a job. I like the idea in theory. The theory being a version of Starfield closer to the Morrowind approach to introductions. Because Morrowind also has you applying to join factions. But every Starfield character is an artifact uncovering chosen one driven straight to Constellation and handheld all the way through to the UC Vanguard, Sysdev, and the Freestar Rangers. And so Ryujin is just kind of the odd one out, only making sense in character if I'm roleplaying as a Starborn who is bored and seeing what else is out there even left to do in this game. As for the others, Sysdef gets introduced by proxy through the Vanguard after doing one mission, but should that fail they also get introduced the first time you're arrested in UC space. I had a 1 million credit bounty and so for the only time in the game, used the stealth ship mechanic of powering everything down because the UC guard ships didn't want to chat with me due to how high my bounty was. I basically had to sneak back into their space and catch one by surprise to get them to arrest me. Joining Sysdef this way is a bounty wipe, which other than murder, the only real use for is getting caught with contraband. Stealing just isn't what it used to be. The funny part is that you are arrested, transported to a UC cruiser, but they never actually take your weapons away. So it's pretty much just a request that you don't shoot your way out. And they still forgave the million credit bounty when I did shoot my way out. Both premises are kind of sloppy. The Vanguard are a civilian privateer force, so being invited to the secret base of a counter-terror group after only one supply delivery mission to lead an important espionage operation is silly. But trusting that upon some guy who got caught quote smuggling unquote Varun heretical texts that they actually just looted in a dungeon or just stole an artifact from some scav in a backwater is even sillier. If you can't tell, the game is trying really hard to get you to do this questline since it's also how you get involved with the Crimson Fleet. And it probably won't surprise you who made it. So I'll let you be a good person and still play with the bad guys. I think that's really cool too. Did you just say that? Are we using good guys and bad guys now? Yeah, let's stop dancing around and acting all politically correct. We're talking good guys and bad guys and we all know it. That's how you see us bad guys? How dare you! No pretense, the writers themselves considered the Crimson Fleet to be the bad guys. Not economically disadvantaged guys, bad guys. It's weird that they opted for two evil factions that wear red and black as their primary colors. Then again, there were also two evil factions in Skyrim that wore red and black, not counting Valkalhar, so... The Crimson Fleet slash Sysdef questline probably gets points for being the most ambitious, I guess. It tries the hardest, and it's also the most jank in the game. Don't be surprised when of the four, I'll have the most to say about it. The Vanguard and Rangers, I've already discussed how they get introduced. The Rangers probably have the best questline in the game mechanically, 
and probably one of the only ones I can say can match the quality Oblivion or Skyrim set out. Not amazing, but at least it gets you into the world and doing stuff. The Vanguard line has been getting a lot of praise online, but I would not be surprised if it ages similar to the Skyrim Thieves Guild, which was also praised a bunch at launch, and then spent a decade slowly being admitted to not be as good as previously claimed. And then you have the standalone side quests. These I did the least of, in part because exactly zero of them introduced as I played the game actually caught my eye as being interesting premises. The only one that could have was featured in the direct and was as stupid as I thought it was going to be when I first heard about it. You're human. We thought we were the only ones to leave Earth. This is a Fallout quest. Something that just doesn't make sense in in universe. <laughs> we were locked in this fridge. Yeah. For, for, for 500, 500 years. years. <laughs> They're bringing the vault premise to space. <laughs> you know that there's an idea about Bethesda of the submission box and like you write down a basic quest idea, put it in the submission box, it gets pulled out and turned into a quest. This is what that feels like. A uh, colony ship that hasn't seen humans in 500 years. Brilliant. Brilliant. Make Ship it. Stamp it. Ship it. And like they're proud. They're showing this off. This is the zany details that they love that defines their their games is yeah. quests that don't adhere to the world building of the games at all and don't make any sense and have no intentional design to them because it's just some random idea that somebody wrote down on a whiteboard that somehow managed to get turned into a quest that's now being marketed to us. You know what though? It's these sorts of quests that are out of the way, really hidden and stuff. It's great for content creators in six years. Yeah. <laughs> the truth behind the the USS Vault 94 or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I did end up looking at a few lists of what was, at least a week or so after release, considered to be the top tier side quests for the game. I disliked most of them as well, and I think it's kind of insane how highly rated the Mantis quest is. I got to the end of it and then did the meme of John Travolta looking around confused at where exactly the quest was supposed to be. Then I realized it was highly rated pretty much only because you're guaranteed to receive it when you kill spacer enemies, and it gives you free welfare gear and a ship. But it was pretty much on the level of a slightly higher production value creation club piece, the only real difference being that it had voice acting. So yeah, I'm not really going to be doing too many side, side quests. It seems the focus was more on the Elder Scrolls approach, main quest line and primary side quest lines, as opposed to Fallout that had a focus on a single main quest line and then singular side quests. However, there is a disturbing theory I've seen online, which is that Starfield is bare bones in order to serve as a content delivery platform. In essence, the canvas is largely blank, in order to leave space open for all of their DLC, and then afterwards a series of Creation Club pieces, and finally at the bottom layer, modded content. And they love it. They still play it. It's, it's almost infinitely playable, all of the mods and everything like that. When you think about the legacy of our games, you know, one of the reasons we're sitting here 10 years later is because of our modding community. What we want to do with games where creators can do that, and I think us being active in trying to make it more than a hobby for them, where they can make it their career, yeah. I think is really, really good and something that we're going to continue to do. Certainly, we're going to be doing extra content for this game, and we love our modding community. We actually think this game for our modding community is going to be a dream, um, because there's so much they could do. You just want to get back to what you're doing, so we've recently changed it where the fuel in your ship and the grav drive limits how far you could go at once, but it doesn't run out of fuel. Maybe there'll be an update or a mod that allows that, but that's what we're doing now. We're doing a lot of it, and I think one of the things that, that I'll call out is it's, it's important for us not just to enable that, but to participate, right? To make it easy for them, to make this where they can make it not just a hobby, but a career. We've had a lot of great success there, so looking forward to what everyone's going to do with Starfield, just like cannot imagine. Yeah, I think Starfield is going to be kind of a modder's paradise. Is it really an extreme theory to suggest that at this point? 
It's certainly entitled, both on the part of Bethesda as well as their customers. Now, of course, modding will do its thing. Of course, expansions will do their thing. For many, this will be exciting, especially with mod potential in the future. But that's really not shocking. The modding potential of planets is what I'm most excited about, but either way, it's still fun to explore. If you know what you like and you like Bethesda games, Starfield will go down in your book as one of the greatest games of all time. And once mods hit the scene, Oh boy, because that potential is ridiculous. And I truly believe this has the potential to be the most modded Bethesda game ever, which I think they know. Not every game gets the chance to have a modding scene, and you're not entitled to have modders make something you bought better for you. If Starfield is a modder's paradise, then is Bethesda actually going to do things to help the modding community beyond releasing the creation kit? As an example, not randomly updating Starfield in ways that create problems for mod authors. Will Starfield have a file format that is able to deploy content in its system independent of whatever future version comes out, allowing mod authors to have their content remain playable despite years of official content support? Will Bethesda create a means by which I can roll back my version of Starfield to increase compatibility with a mod load order? Will Bethesda announce and stick to a roadmap, allowing mod authors to plan around the updates they create for the game? Will Bethesda improve their transparency and communication with the community? These are all things that actually mod-friendly games do, which Skyrim and Fallout 4 are not. Just because Skyrim is one of the most heavily modded games in existence does not mean its modding scene was exactly a paradise. Beyond that, I think Bethesda and its community have burned a lot of the goodwill that surrounded Elder Scrolls modding. They've made it into something that is gross and exploitative. Morrowind released with a disc that had its construction set on it. Developers would write blog posts about their experience working with that toolkit. Even recently, Douglas Goodall actually participated in a mod jam for Morrowind, expanding some of the quests he originally created back in the day. And he hasn't worked for Bethesda in almost 20 years. Point is, during the days of Morrowind, Oblivion, Fallout 3, and early Skyrim, modding was a fun and optional component of the games. You could work with the toolkits to make a custom house or items for yourself. It was a very chill and unique component of being a Bethesda fan. You could affect their games in ways few other studios allowed. But increasingly as time went on, it started to be expected more and more that the community was going to mod their games. If players want Skyrim to play like Oblivion or Morrowind, then they just need to mod the game to do so. If players want to play well-crafted stories, then they'll still have to pay us to play someone else's mod. The fun of modding was removed proportional to the amount of time I had to spend setting up a load order to make their games fun again. And I don't mean I wore vanilla Skyrim out and needed mods for it to be fun again, I mean I needed mods just to make Skyrim as fun as Oblivion, which itself needed mods to make as fun as Morrowind. And it's debatable if such load orders truly succeeded. I wouldn't exactly say they were replacement experiences, but it also became obvious that Bethesda was just abandoning their old games and basic fixes they could do to leave it up to the community. They could have fixed games for Windows Live patches being necessary for Fallout 3 at any time. They just didn't for years. And then they got greedy. Paid mods, abandoned VR ports, the Creation Club. It was obvious that Bethesda wanted to be paid for the continued player base Skyrim and, more minorly, Fallout 4 had. Fallout 76 even charges you money if you want to change the difficulty settings, and is still being held hostage by the threat of shutdown due to being a live service game. But I would look at Fallout 4's modding scene as a sign of where Starfield's modding community is liable to go. I think Starfield might go a little farther by merit of being a space game, but it's not going to challenge Skyrim. Skyrim was a fluke of modding scenes, and part of that is just how much goodwill there was at the time, as well as coinciding with a boom in PC gaming. But that goodwill was burned, and the novelty is over. I think a lot of people would prefer to just buy a functional and well-designed game, or at least one that needs only one or two mods, over putting hours of their life into putting a mod load order together for a game as barren and inauthentic as Starfield is. To deflect criticism against Starfield because it might be modded one day is just sad, and an admission that Starfield isn't good. I have 800 games in my Steam library, 
and maybe 5% of them even have a modding scene with more than a dozen active modders, let alone one big enough to actually fix their game. And trust me, plenty of games I own released toolkits and still never had a modding scene. However, an even bigger problem than the expectations that modders are going to fix your game for you is the expectation that modders are going to make the content for your game for you. At least one person at Bethesda looked at what Sky Oblivion or Project Tamriel or Fallout London or Indoral was doing and assumed that, with so many planets to use as a resource, that players could entirely fill out their own custom areas with their own factions and storylines. And with AI voice acting, players can even take a stab at trying to redo the storylines in the game now. Expect there to be mandatory story overhaul mods when you suggest you're going to play Starfield in 10 years. But why? Why is there such a loyalty to these games that there is an expectation that every single game Bethesda makes deserves modders to put the work in to fix them? Especially since each game comes with more and more things that need fixing behind the scenes. More systems, more bugs, more complex scripting. I can't imagine it's gotten any easier to work with. And it turns out it hasn't. I was alerted to an incident on the Bethesda Discord server, which they killed their forum for, where the lead on the X-Edit project was censored due to concerns raised about changes in design practices for Starfield that would make modding far more difficult. These concerns were deleted and labeled as just a conspiracy theory. Sweep it up, Janie! X-Edit is a tool for detecting and correcting compatibility conflicts between mods, and the lead in question has worked on this tool since 2007. After stirring the pot a bit, Elminster reached out to me to help clarify some of the issues he's raised. While the Bethesda employee responsible for working as a liaison for modders just gave the usual NDA response. There is no point in having an official Discord server if every response to every issue is either censorship or a boilerplate message that marketing has to approve any correspondence. The real purpose of this channel is simply to provide an outlet by which the correspondence can be deflected and de-escalated in a controlled manner before dying. And the real reason censorship is necessary is that it is unlikely Bethesda will correct the issues. Elminster, meanwhile, was not bound by an NDA or marketing team, so he was able to give me some of his time to explain the problems and answer questions. There have been fundamental changes to the way that the files are structured in the master file for Starfield that will create a lot of problems for any future game files that are added. It's a very technical explanation, but basically, Skyrim has issues if two mods edit the same thing. If mod A says that Lydia has 10 health and mod B says that she has 5 health, the game has to determine which mod will take priority. The more complex mods and their changes overlap, the more problematic that can be. X-Edit as a tool is essential for mitigating most of those issues. Changes to the system means that there will be conflicts not just if a mod touches Lydia, but conflicts if mod A touches Lydia and mod B touches Whiterun. And it doesn't just extend to mods, Elminster suggested these issues will also plague official content as traditionally, they are loaded in a similar way to mods are. Meaning that the Shattered Space DLC could be in trouble as well. He and his team were able to come to these conclusions as fundamentally the basic structure of how Bethesda stores data hasn't changed since Oblivion, because Creation Engine 2 is not a new engine like they claim, it's the same engine, just updated. Now he did state many times that he does not think it is impossible for Bethesda to fix these issues, but the general sentiment I gathered is that the concerns he raised are indicative of incompetent design that did not ask the question of how these changes were going to impact the modding scene. He's actually more optimistic than I am. My immediate interpretation of this information was to wonder if it was intentional sabotage in order to hinder serious modding efforts so that Starfield modding would not outshine Creation Club content the same way that Skyrim and Fallout 4 mods outshine the paid mods. However, he thinks it simply reflects that Bethesda didn't ask if their changes would negatively impact the modding scene. He also said that attempts to censor this discussion on the official Bethesda Discord was doing nothing to stop the spread of concerns in the broader modding community that is primarily located outside of their influence. And so really, Starfield being promised as a modder's paradise really just means that it's devoid of content and they're expecting modders to step up to fulfill that role. 
That doesn't necessarily require that they be friendly to the modders, as management may simply believe that modders will mod Starfield independent of any challenges because it has happened before for them. As of the time of writing, Creation Club has not been implemented for Starfield. Yet. All there is right now is that little message of the day that was also on Skyrim prior to it getting hit with the curse. First trust, then retention, then revenue. If Starfield has any kind of central design motto, it's that it is just a foundation for content to be built upon. The first people to get to use the foundation were the developers. Now it's up to the modding scene to continue to use that foundation to make the content for Bethesda. That the more you give to Starfield, the more it gives back to you. Doesn't that feel gross to hear? They don't find it cool that modders are doing this anymore. They now find it to be a marketable feature. But I've said before in previous videos that there is a problem with the company feeling entitled to modders. The new message I want to convey with Starfield is that in addition to that, there is a serious problem with the fans and content creators feeling entitled to modders. No longer is it a praiseworthy accomplishment when some modder does something truly incredible to transform a game. Now we're expecting those people to perform those miracles. If I have to hear the words, but at least we'll have mods one more time, I am going to... Starfield would have to receive a miracle in modding for me to even consider ever replaying it again. Outside of a DLC and a hankering for making some money on my end, of course. But what I mean is a full overhaul that can be installed in five clicks that reworks the game top to bottom into a better design vision. Unlikely? Yep, that's the point. It's unrealistic for me to expect that, or for anyone to expect me to replay this game without that. Let's start with the Vanguard. The Vanguard is doing the most work when it comes to really lore dumping onto the player. It starts by literally doing this, but the museum sequence is technically optional. That said, I stated before that pretty much everything established in the museum comes up in the storyline, and I'm not joking. So the real gamble is, if you haven't played this game, Will the first mission be plot relevant, or will we be given a chance to do faction stuff for- <laughs> Are you kidding? It really is a coin toss though, as the Rangers and Ryujin both have you doing basic work as an onboarding process. But no, we are delivering supplies to a civilian outpost that was conveniently wiped out by a monster that will spend this entire questline investigating. Luckily, there happens to already be a researcher who specializes in the field of studying creatures like this who's able to help us beat it. Something I find amusing about this mission is that it seems to be random whether or not it will actually be atmospheric. A few reviewers praised this mission for taking place at night when it was raining, but during the directed in my game, this sequence took place during the day. I was so terminally bored by what was being presented, I almost missed the Terramorph scripted introduction because I started to walk away. It probably would have helped if there were actually hints of this thing stalking us around the facility, like creepy noises or shadows running around corners, you know? Actually set it up as something that causes terror and hunts humans instead of just telling us that it is scary over and over. But guys, it totally fits because we're in a meat processing plant and that's super important for later. Also, this creature, called a terror morph, gets bodied hard by starborn powers. Even without them, just having elevation seemed to do the trick. And this was before I even had OP weapons, as I had just restarted the universe prior to doing this questline. Xeno enemies rarely handle the boost pack and can often be outdone by simply finding elevation and strafing left or right to dodge their spit attacks. It's weird too, because Xeno enemies are the game's best bet at replicating the various mutant creatures from Fallout and fantasy creatures from Elder Scrolls. But all of the Xenos are just thing that chases you in melee, can maybe spit at you, and can maybe burrow. Terror morphs get introduced at the end of the museum. They are this uber deadly Xeno predator that mysteriously appears on human worlds that we've yet to hear about being an issue anywhere else. If anything, the Ashta on Aquila are a bigger threat to humans than these things. But Terror Morphs will probably get used as an excuse down in the comments for why humanity is bunched up in a couple urban cores. The most bizarre part, though, is that the researcher, who happens to actually be the former co-head of the Xeno Weapons Division, says that it is unknown how Terror Morphs are getting around. The secret is revealed later to be that the creature with Morph in its name morphs from another creature that is famous for basically being space rats that ride along on ships. Just 
Okay. Nobody thought to test what exactly heat leeches were doing with all that heat they were leeching. I mean, maybe that's explainable because they couldn't cage the terror. No, no, they can. Well, maybe they were just underfunded. No, they were a primary project during the war. So there's really no excuse for why the UC doesn't know that heat leeches can morph into terror morphs. Whatever. No, but see, it's brilliant because they reference the heat leeches in every Vanguard quest. It's like thematic or something. How do they know to call them terror morphs if they didn't know that they morphed? This is unironically the quest line that reviewers are saying is one of the best they've ever written. I like when we report back to Tuala, we just blow past telling him what happened and go straight to, we need to get this terror morph sample analyzed. It really helps me to immerse myself in the character of the mentally deficient person Bethesda assumes we are. He also says he recognizes the name Sanan, but not from where. I don't think I need to explain why a naval officer being unfamiliar with a convicted and executed war criminal from his own country is nonsense. But in case you don't get it, it would be like Germans in the 1960s. All right, should be pretty obvious now. <laughs> now I guess you have two options on how to proceed. Head to the UC Vigilance and help out SysDef or deliver that sample. Okay, so my choice is to either investigate a threat to the entirety of humanity or go hang out with pirates. What are stakes? Xeno weapons were a tool used by the UC during the war, which ended up being banned. Although critically, terror morphs are not actually Xeno weapons. They were not created or used for this purpose because they were too difficult to control. This is an important plot point the story focuses on. But it was during that assignment that the UC asked us to explore deploying terror morphs on the battlefield. The project never got off the ground. Like becoming a Marine for the UC vanguarding. Welcome to the Navy, Captain going down an entirely different quest line involving the creation of these monsters called Terramorphs. The Terramorph project never went anywhere. It couldn't. They are deadly creatures, but they aren't Xeno weapons. The cabinet not opening the archives is probably a bigger risk than them handing over the files. That data itself isn't dangerous. I actually think it's a bit weird though. You would think the storyline would be about Xeno weapons that, after the war had ended, got loose and were causing havoc on all the worlds they were released on. You know, something akin to the lasting effects of Agent Orange or landmines. There are still cities in Europe today that have to be evacuated so that a bomb from the Second World War can be defused. Instead, it's focused on terror morphs, which explicitly are stated to not be Xeno weapons, hence why accessing the archived data about them is not as difficult. You see, both sides of the war agreed to put all their data on Xeno weapons and mechs into an archive located in New Atlantis. Data on these subjects outside of that archive is flagged as contraband, somehow. Contraband's a system I want to like, but is super gamey, as you would think New Atlantis might flag weapons as contraband. They can just magically scan my entire ship and know whether or not I have Xeno weapons research data aboard. Maybe they are actually starborn and have access to gravity magic that lets them detect the contraband flag. But okay. So this quest line is not going to be about the Xeno Weapons Division trying to undo the damage that their Xeno Weapons did, or trying to find some kind of moral redemption from the war. No, there's an unambiguously evil black alien monster thing that specifically likes hunting and killing humans. Greatest quest line in the game though, truly, a phenomenal masterpiece. Honestly, I think G-Man mentally inserted that the Terramorphs had to be Xeno weapons because that would have been the version of the storyline that would have been engaging. There's a quest on Mars I neglected to write about in my first draft, which is alarming as it establishes the base of operations for the Anti-Terramorph Task Force. In essence, it's a quest that introduces our base of operations. And I forgot to mention it. In this quest line, you go in two steps from new recruit to delivering key information to the top leadership of the United Colonies. But as you make your report, New Atlantis gets attacked by terror morphs. Fun fact about this quest, when it changes the city to its attack state, it actually resets apartments as well. That's more relevant to the hunter attack that reuses this state. And someone on Reddit lost thousands of items in their apartment because of this. It's hilarious that player homes, the one place in Bethesda games where it makes sense that they'd be behind a loading screen, aren't in Starfield. I'm gonna be blunt. 
Given the order of events that happens, the obvious conclusion that would be drawn is that we and Hadrian are terrorists. We join an organization on our very first mission, happen to find a settlement destroyed by a terror morph, which happens to be being investigated by a head researcher of a now illegal field of science related to terror morphs. Then we use that data to track down another researcher tied to this illegal field of science who happens to be hiding out in the base of operations of that illegal field of science. Then we deliver a report to the highest leadership of the UC, urging a reopening of that field, only to conveniently have several terror morphs attack the city in the part where our ship is, that we demand to defeat ourselves and mysteriously manage to do so despite UC security failing. It's actually revealed later that, yes, that is what happened, meaning that by every right we would get kidnapped and taken to a UC black site before being tortured for days for information. The Vanguard is definitely the most Bethesda-y of questlines in this game as we get immediately shuttled to the top of UC society and treated like a hero for participating. Except the Kavanch in this storyline was just a meatpacking plant. The UC operates via citizenship by service. The Vanguard and New Atlantis are rather obviously references to Starship Troopers where citizenship is offered to serving members of the UC Armed Forces. But that's about it. It's not trying to be a commentary on that system of governance, it's just the meme of service guarantees citizenship, moving on. We need to get sent to the top of UC society because the game doesn't want to take 10 years to give us our citizenship. What I found really fun though is that there is a super citizen status. We don't just become citizens through exemplary service, we get awarded class 1 citizenship by the end. They're obviously conscious that becoming the faction leader is a meme at this point for them and would not work in this setting, so they've settled for saying something as stupid as being a super citizen is an award. Wow, I get to own an apartment in the city. It's not like I'm a privateer who likely prefers space living. For those who don't know, privateers are private people who own vessels that are commissioned by a state to participate in maritime warfare. Privateers were the key feature of the Freestar military that allowed them to win the conflict, although they act a bit cagey about this concept. The Vanguard is supposed to be the UC's own adoption of this practice. They even have lore on one of the loading screens calling the Vanguard privateers. So of course, we spend this entire questline basically doing nothing related to privateering our own ship. Our key qualification for being a member, owning a ship, is relegated to that line in an American job description where you're expected to have a valid US driver's license. It's just the car we use to get to our job. Hey, remember when Sarah pushed us to join this faction despite our ship at the time being Constellation's ship? What's the difference between being a privateer and a pirate? basically a piece of paper saying that you're a pirate but on behalf of the government. The problem it created was that you had a bunch of sailors reliant on attacking and taking over ships in wars that wouldn't last forever. The war would end, but the need for income continued. Privateering as a practice ended in part because governments in Europe began to acknowledge that it was just a breeding ground for piracy. So, of course, the Crimson Cringe, a fleet of pirates, has absolutely nothing to do with privateering or either of the navies that are doing so. And this is why I don't like Starfield lore. It has the chance to have factions be interesting exploration of these dynamics and have interplay in between factions and storylines, and it doesn't, because instead someone wrote down on a whiteboard in 2016 that the Vanguard quest line is about exploring Xeno weapons and scary monsters. Which, in order to do so, we need to access the archives. The problem, as laid out, is that you need an approval from all three governments. Three, you might ask. Yes, because at this time, Varun was an active government and co-signer on the peace treaty. So we need to convince the Freestar Collective and House Varun to give us access to the Terramorph data. I can't stress how stupid these archives are. Guys, didn't you know that restricting access to military secrets is as simple as just agreeing that nobody can access it? I figured that, at a minimum, the Archives would be this cool location on a neutral planet with standing armed forces facing each other off, kind of like the border between North and South Korea. Instead, it's just this room with a bug where the guards spawn and shift slightly upon entry. The UC has their Xeno Weapons research in here, while the Freestar Collective has their mech research. I 
honestly wish this story was smart enough to even suggest that the Ashta were there because of the United Colonies, but no. So nobody's allowed to access or use mechs, even though we find multiple mech graveyards and facilities that are breaking them down. Like, at least banning Xeno weapons makes sense from the perspective that they could become a dangerous invasive species. Mechs are just tanks that have legs instead of treads. Hey, remember when grav drives could destroy planets? Good times. So the Freestar Collective's plan in this situation is to ask the UC to keep the forbidden archived knowledge from the war in the capital city of the UC. Like, why would they agree to that? <laughs> if another war broke out, the very first thing that would happen is all those Freestar soldiers would go get killed. Getting access is pretty easy. You can convince or blackmail the Freestar Ambassador and the Varun Ambassador just needs to be reached. The funny thing is that literally the only reason he's still here is for this quest, both out and in-universe. He says that he stayed behind to fulfill the terms of the treaty, and that was it. This is one of the only major windows into Varun culture in this entire game. And this is where we get our citizenship. Standing atop the tallest building in New Atlantis, looking into the horizon where we can see the edge of the map as objects stop loading in the distance. Truly breathtaking. Then we meet Ve Victus, one of the main leaders of the UC military executed in the post-war. He's actually still alive, being kept down in a UC black site below the mast building. Our companions are not allowed to meet him as to aid in keeping the secret that this guy is still alive, since Sarah Morgan would no doubt have some strong thoughts about this. Oh yeah, I brought Sarah along for this since she made me sign up. She doesn't really contribute that much though, and will actually complain both when you tried to work with the Trade Authority to clear someone's debt, and when you lied to the Trade Authority to get information. She's earned a negative reputation because she nags you anytime you try to employ any kind of subterfuge in front of her. Anyways, Ve Victus. He's being allowed a comfortable but monitored life in exchange for information on various people he worked with during the war. He was the UC's big naval commander who made some slightly controversial decisions, so of course he's gonna end up being this game's incarnation of guy who did literally nothing wrong. And I mean in fairness, they're right, and I too would have bombed Londinian and fired on the Freestar Privateers without hesitation. The story really fumbles around in the dark. The UC are portrayed as having incompetent and bureaucratic leadership who consults some random vanguard for advice on how to deal with terror morphs. But it also wants to be about war crimes and the scars war can leave until it gets bored. For example, there was a big cloning program using him as a template, who all grew up into being various military and government leaders. Yet, somehow, most of them conveniently died, save for one, the Xeno Weapons researcher we met earlier. Why? Why would you write that detail in? Don't specify what happened to all of them, that way you can still have the option to use them later. I also love the fact that they haphazardly introduced cloning into this setting, and then that's it. We have cloning because we need Hadrian to be Ve Victus's clone. You might notice she's a woman and he's a man. She even admits that there was a non-trivial amount of work required to clone a man into a woman, but why? Like legitimately, what was the underlying rationale for making some of the Victus clones girls? I mean, in universe. So. The advantage of Hadrian being a literal clone is that we'd meet Victus, and it would be Hadrian's face, but with a few more wrinkles, gray hair, and eyes that weren't red from serving on Mars. It could be a real shocking moment until we find out about the whole cloning thing. Or Hadrian could look different because of the canonical race and, I think, sex-changing surgery that exists in setting. Maybe as a way of distancing herself from her progenitor. Or there could be a point about how the UC wanted to be progressive and said that girl clones of Victus would be just as smart so they were worth making. Or they could make a story about gender identity. Point is, Starfield does none of these things. For example, they established that Hadrian was 18 when she got her citizenship, something that takes us 10 years. It's a pretty subtle clue that she was born and raised inside the UC military structure and was likely serving when she was still a child. That's Interesting. Do more of that. Don't invent cloning just to say Hadrian is Ve Victus's not daughter. Don't switch her gender for no reason. Of course, it's symptomatic of the same old problem, representation cowardice. 
For example, they would never write a story about Hadrian being trans and Ve Victus disapproving, because that would require they write a transphobic character into their story. And they're absolutely petrified of getting cancelled for writing a transphobe, even though he's a literal war criminal. So okay, let's remove the political storytelling. Just do more with the clone angle. Maybe Hadrian confesses that she doesn't really support the United Colonies at all. She was just born and forced into supporting them and didn't even know the war wasn't just a game that was being played until it was over. Again, it comes back to that whole point of stories. The Vanguard questline should be trying to get us to do gameplay and or trying to tell a compelling narrative. Maybe we say screw all this clone nonsense and the game gives us a neuroamp that lets us control Xeno weapons and so we go out and collect a bunch of dinosaurs to use to kill a bunch of giant spiders. Anyways, working with Victus is necessary because he knows how to put together the entire Xeno weapons research team. But he wants us to cross off somebody who of course is the guy who orchestrated the entire terror morph attack at the spaceport. Well, he was framed anyways, and you'll never guess who was actually responsible for that. When we go to capture the doctor, you are told you could try to take him alive, but you can't. I guess actually being able to board and arrest people as a member of the space police just isn't important. No, they're too busy pitching the skill as being something only pirates do, missing the opportunity to further draw comparisons between the skill sets of the Vanguard and the Crimson Cringe. Then we have to track down the robot the research team uses for aggressive sample collection, but he's in a mech graveyard hunting Xeno weapons, but he's plagued with heat leeches. See what they're doing? It's like, it's like it's clever or something. Imagery, metaphors, themes. With our team put together, we set out for Londinian. I told you, everything in the museum's important. Londinian may have been bombed, but the ruins are still there. The planet is blockaded. Funny thing is that you can actually pretty easily end up coming here again later accidentally and having the same exact dialogue as though it was the first time we're here. Also, a good detail is that you can run into terramorphs anywhere you land on the planet, as it's their homeworld. So why should I care that the humans who lived here died? I do like how aggressively active the UC military is here, making you realize how absent they are elsewhere. It really helps sell that this is supposed to be a dangerous area. As part of the prep for the mission, they also give you a set of armor that for me ended up being a full set of 3 star legendary items. This was huge as it instantly managed to replace my starborn armor, which fills all 3 slots but only has 3 effects. I used this new armor for a very long time. As to the sequence itself, it's… alright. I like exploring bombed out cities, but even with that it's kinda lame. Still, we end up uncovering the dirty secret. My. Le Terramorph. It. Le Morphed. Seriously, the reveal that heat leeches are actually baby terramorphs is one of the most monumental moments of ironic humor in this game and became an inside joke between me and my friends for weeks. Pups. No. It can't be true. Heat leeches are everywhere. They live everywhere. That means terramorphs. You just saw that, right? You would tell me if I was losing my mind. This is a setting where the UC managed to separate people from their cats and dogs, for some reason, but couldn't figure out that heat leeches are just the larval stage of their species. Even better, the stated reason is that terramorphs actually have a natural predator. Yes, these things are hunted by these giant things. Somehow these giant agile mobile spider things are hunted by even gianter armored giraffes. Starfield is the greatest game of a generation. Oh, and Terramorphs became a problem because the UC hunted the armored giraffes to extinction because they wanted their meat for the war. I wish I was joking, but no, this is unironically what they made the story about. Okay, so humanity of the future decided that lucrative earth species like cows and chickens weren't worth transporting to Jemison. Instead, they hunted Xenos species to extinction, but instead of trying to find a species as easy to mass farm as cows, they settled on a predator species with massive armor plates. It's akin to saying that China farmed pandas to extinction during the Great War and Fallout. It's just nonsense. The processing facility for all this is located near the planet's North Pole as well. And apparently tens of thousands of people lived here. Truly, I believe that totally happened. 
Why would we put a massive city and food processing plant in an area where humans could live easily, when we could instead all live in a frozen wasteland? Also, Ptolemy 2 has almost Earth-like conditions, 1G, standard O2 rating. The Terramorphs aren't a reason to avoid living more equatorially, because at the time, they were being hunted by the giraffes. But you see, once all the giraffes were eaten by the humans, Nothing was able to hunt terramorphs anymore, which is why the city was attacked by tons and tons of terramorphs and had to be destroyed. Wait, so the humans can capture and kill giraffes, but somehow lack the ability to capture and kill giant spiders. So we're visiting Londinian to gather samples needed to resurrect the giraffes so we can set them loose on human worlds as their life's mission is apparently to hunt terror morphs wherever they're hiding. You do have to bear in mind that Bethesda made all of their planets have an ecology where predators just mindlessly run around killing every prey species they see without eating them. Biology was never their strong suit. Ah, but you see, if you wait long enough after an animal dies, scavengers come. The other option to releasing giant armored giraffes everywhere is to release a microbe onto planets that will kill the terror morphs. This is a setting where terraforming is not a thing because the sheer scale of resources involved, but apparently, releasing microbes on human worlds to snuff out terramorphs is possible. I like too that the story becomes just trust the science, bro, when it comes to the microbe. I mean, both solutions are stupid because the entire situation was manufactured by Vevictus. I did it. I did. The terramorph attacks on Tau City. New Atlantis. My doing. There's never actually any real sign that terror morphs are a problem in this universe beyond us being told that they are. The only reason the moral dilemma is stuck to is because it is introduced before the big reveal that terror morphs morph. You'd think the Victus clone would be in on the conspiracy, but she's not. She's unaware that he's even still alive, let alone that she's still a pawn in his game. And if anything, the new policy of enforcing heat leech removal at spaceports is going to be way more effective than trying to revive and transport armored giraffes or distribute a microbe planet-wide. If only because the Freestar Collective can get behind a heat leech removal policy, but probably won't be too keen on either the giraffes or the microbe. It's also pretty lame that they tied up all the plot conveniences behind the curtain of Ve Victus was behind it all. Everything hinges on the fact that the prison guards just didn't like interacting with him, so they were too hasty to notice coded messages he was sending out to mysterious collaborators on the outside who enacted his plans. It's as though someone at Bethesda really liked the Thrawn trilogy, but then was told that Starfield takes place in the post-war where the UC wasn't destroyed, so there wouldn't be a necessary UC remnant in existence for Vey Victus to be admiral of. You are given the choice to reveal Ve Victus's betrayal to the Council, but keeping him alive allows him to give you infinite radiant quests where you go hunt down war criminals. Truly, what a gift. Space Delphine does have strong opinions about Victus being alive, but of course it's not something she wants to speak privately about. Going back to Mass Effect for a second, companions didn't just have their own side stories they were involved in, they would also have opinions anytime the main storylines intersected with their own characters. For example, anything to do with Protheans would best be encountered with Liara, but you could also talk with companions about missions afterwards. Sarah just found out a war criminal of her own government is being kept alive down in the basement and, after the meeting, wants to discuss her time in the Navigator Corps. But yeah, that's how the Vanguard storyline ends. The Council makes a decision based on our input on whether giraffes or the microbe are better. We get promoted to Class 1 Citizen and given infinite radiant quests to go do. Honestly, the best solution would be to reset the universe, go kill Ve Victus, and then pretend that terror morphs don't exist. Our apartment is, of course, free. Why would we want to sink money into our luxury apartment? I mean, in fairness, the apartment is super inconvenient and doesn't quite fit the same role such a thing would in, say, an Elder Scrolls game. You also get a discount that I never noticed because money is worthless by the time that you'll get the discount. Let's talk about those Radiant Quests. So you'll get dispatched out to take care of some ship that is purportedly causing problems for the UC. Funny thing though, because we got inducted into UC Sysdef, whom send us on an undercover operation to join the Crimson Cringe, 
we actually end up being allies to the mission targets we're sent to kill. This is actually a pervasive problem throughout the game. The game doesn't adjust its dungeon generation algorithm to put more spacers and ecliptic mercs in instead of crimson cringe members in dungeons, so half of the enemy ships and dungeons you come across after joining the cringe stop being hostile. They just let you run around the dungeon looting everything with a couple lines of dialogue. Even funnier are the missions Victus gives you. The war criminals in question are often not flagged as allies to the dungeon owners, so they end up fighting the people they're hiding out with when you enter the cell. Another piece of jank is that you can attack a Crimson Fleet ship, board it, and then all the pirates inside the ship will still see you as an ally because there's no cohesion in combat states from outside to inside the ship. Overall, I didn't like the Vanguard. It felt like it was made by someone who was resentful that the game takes place after the Colony War instead of during, who demanded there be at least one story in this game where humanity is at risk of extinction and the player has to be the one to stop it all. Since this is a story about bugs, I figured I'd talk a bit about them here. A good place to start would be bugs that actually improved the game. Somewhat commonly, the dialogue camera would actually break in a way that made it closer to the Skyrim dialogue camera. It immediately stood out whenever it happened how much this improved the act of speaking with an NPC, since normally they use the Oblivion-style dialogue camera, zooming in on an NPC's face. Sometimes a little too closely. The dialogue camera is a huge source of issues. I don't understand the underlying design decision to go back to their earlier style. It has to be a stylistic decision, given how quickly it was modded into its bugged state. Two mods, actually, within days of launch. Funny thing is that when you are in the bugged state of dialogue, you can actually go into third person. I don't know why they forced this first person dialogue system when in Fallout 4, they gave an option in the menu as to whether you wanted to use the first or third person dialogue camera. See, in Oblivion and Fallout 3, when you interact with NPCs, they'll try to rotate to face you, get within a set range, and then they lock the controls and the camera zooms in. Starfield's problem is that it's trying to tie together a more dynamic dialogue system where multiple NPCs can speak to the player with that older mode of dialogue. Starfield does have a rotation phase, but it's usually a line into the dialogue. I don't mean to be rude, but I don't know you. Then why don't you turn around and face me? Turn around, come on, there you go, doesn't that feel more natural? There's not a consistent system to get NPCs to turn around however, so they'll side-eye you or even just straight up refuse to look at you. Like that happened in the earlier games if NPCs were sitting, and it was clearly on you that you tried to speak with a character who was sitting in a chair while you were behind them. Even if NPCs are facing you, there's not a guarantee they'll look at you. There were a couple times where the staging made sense that an NPC didn't want to make direct eye contact, or was intentionally keeping their back to us to be rude. However, I'm guessing in order to keep those scenes functional, they had to include a lot of scenes that were more nebulous. The difference between Cyberpunk and Starfield is that Cyberpunk puts a lot of thought into the animations of each individual scene, and has a backup system for more casual encounters. However, most NPCs are animated intentionally, so if they want to portray a character who is rudely keeping their back to the player, they can do that without any question from the player as to whether it's intentional or not. Starfield has a generalized system. Dialogue works the same way in 99.99% .99 of encounters. It's less emotive, but it also requires less effort from the developers to implement. The problem is that fundamentally, the generalized system doesn't work very well. An upside to this idea is that if you have a system that works, then you have a functional system in, well, 99.99% of your encounters. But obviously, if it doesn't fully work, then it becomes a liability. There are a few things that would improve the system dramatically. Firstly, markers that tell NPCs in the camera where to be during dialogue. Teleport them if you need to. I've got NPCs talking to me through walls or dialogues where we're playing monkey in the middle. Marooned there. A child, born from two of the crew, that survived the crash. After her parents died, that poor girl spent years surviving on that hostile world, alone. I'm sorry. I had no idea. I think we can all agree that this was another unfortunate circumstance of the Colony War. What you'd call an unfortunate circumstance, I call a tragedy. You're absolutely right, Sarah. It is a tragedy. One thing that I can assure you is that the names of these men and women will never be forgotten. I'll see to it personally. 
Thank you, Admiral. Good luck to both of you. It's been an honor. Once we're done here, we should have a little talk with Sona. Is this what anxiety disorders feel like? Did you know this game actually has preset camera movements? It's just two basic pans randomly in the middle of the UC Vanguard questline, and I think that really speaks to Starfield and Bethesda in general. Starfield is almost a game that can be played entirely without breaking the first person perspective, but like Skyrim, they randomly include just a handful of scenes that force perspective to be broken, and I doubt there was even a second thought to doing that. Like, if you can now do basic camera pans, then why aren't we seeing that more frequently? Why does this only happen twice? Why? I wouldn't be surprised if some of these modders were actually anonymous developers who disagreed with the design decision, but because of the various level of production bureaucracy between them and the people in charge, we're only able to affect the game through mods. So someone at the top level probably just got it in their head that it was necessary, and then that was that. It's Oblivion-style dialogue now. You might say that there should be an option in the menu as to whether the player wants zoomed in or zoomed out dialogue, and to that I would say, remember this is the company that forgot to port the FOV slider from a previous game into Starfield, or needed a patch to implement brightness options. But I digress. Tons of issues came from the dialogue camera, namely NPCs refusing to face you. It's not fully Oblivion style as Oblivion frees the world during dialogue, however Oblivion didn't have issues with NPCs facing away from the camera. Additionally, the game doesn't cheat and teleport companions to appropriate positions during dialogue, so if there's a wall between you and the companion during their line read, you'll stare at the wall. I had one dialogue where the companion was over a kilometer away stuck in a canyon. Not that the game is against blatantly teleporting NPCs in front of you, or face through the decks to get to where he needs to stand. Annoying though, one of the positions he liked to sit in standby mode was in the middle of a bottleneck in the armory, so it was hard to get around him. Before we move too far from dialogue screwiness, it's not hard to have NPCs talking over each other in parallel conversations at Constellation, or a bug where a Constellation member spawns a couple meters up in the air, or the door to the lodge breaking because too many NPCs used it. That happened a few times. And, well, there are a lot, and I mean a lot of times, where the subtitles don't match what the actors say. Being out there with me is a better education than any book. Haven't you ever considered how she feels about all this? Thanks for the offer, but my answer is still no. What? Where the hell did you learn to do that? Now we have even greater reason to press forward. Uh, would it help if I said we needed it for scientific research? In that respect, this is easily the game where this problem is at its worst. Because I don't remember any of their other games routinely having problems with voice actors going off on their own. Spelling and grammar mistakes, sure, I've noticed those in all their games. And a healthy heaping more of that in Starfield. Some voice director probably just wasn't doing that good of a job making sure that the actors actually read the lines verbatim, not writing down any necessary amendments if they did go off script. When I record my audio, I will go off script with minor tweaks that I feel flow better. It happens, but it's someone's job to update the subtitles if the voice line that makes it to the production version changed from when it was written. The whole point of subtitles is to help people that might not necessarily understand or be able to hear the spoken lines. That's the reason why you write size into the dialogue. So to have the subtitles be incorrect is actually a pretty big deal if someone who is hearing impaired or is trying to learn English is playing. Granted, for some reason, I don't think they can do actual italics in dialogue anymore. I also noticed that the subtitles just use a generic 50% opacity black box in the background rather than using outlines. It's weird and looks cheap. Companions will also get themselves into the dialogue window. At the very least, unlike Serana, they won't actually get in front of the NPC I'm talking to. And that's just some of the issues the game has, especially given how much time you spend in this game on dialogue. The game is far from bug-free or even virtually bug-free. I put it near the level of Skyrim, which is a step up from Fallout 4. Alright, I'm going to be fast with this one because Ryujin is just boring. Imagine Arasaka from Cyberpunk but made by lame people and you've got Ryujin. Other than the first joke quest where we go fetch some coffee for our boss, we get treated to generic missions where we break into a place and hack something. Digipicking is the replacement for both lockpicking and hacking. So whether it's a terminal or a safe, it's the same minigame. It's... alright. It did not take long for me to opt away from ever unlocking anything just because of how often it wouldn't pay off. The minigame is a series of circles with openings, and you match up the openings with various keys in the correct order. There's not a consistent difficulty to the game, 
Some rolls you get are able to be almost instantly solved, others are very easy to make a mistake in the first circle that screws everything up after. The thing is, whomever designed it didn't put much thought into the metagame around it. You can undo mistakes, but undos cost one digipick each. Oftentimes the mistake is four or five moves back. Or you can exit the game, getting an instant reroll that is often going to be much easier, in exchange for just one digipick. So I don't see why you would ever use the undo function. As you complete the puzzles, you can also bank auto attempts which are useful for the higher level puzzles at making sure you don't use the wrong combination of keys on the opening moves. It's an alright minigame that suffers from the fact that the designers responsible for putting things inside of the locks didn't do as good of a job as the people who made the locks at putting things valuable in the containers. Ryujin as a questline doesn't really get started until 8 out of its 15 quests. One of them in the middle is a little more advanced, but not a lot, and I found myself being extremely bored by how offensively brain dead the objectives were. The majority of them weren't even in restricted areas, meaning there wasn't a risk of getting caught. I was honestly surprised to check their wiki pages and find out the locations were actually hand selected for the quest, not randomized. Setbacks mean a lot of things for a lot of people. Payoffs, cover stories, cleanup crews, you get my drift. Not a single setback. <laughs> I knew you were going to be perfect for this job. As for the premise, we were algorithmically hired into an operative position. Our temporary boss is initially skeptical, but we're obviously qualified for corporate espionage as private security seems to just not exist in this setting. I think the story is trying to do something, but it was hard to notice as I was so bored that I would stop playing the game for a couple hours. I really had to force myself to finish this questline as it was the last thing I needed to do to call the playthrough complete. Reading some of the quest staging seems to indicate more is possible than average with various characters dying. It's a questline that does seem to branch a little bit, it's just bogged down by one of the most horrifically boring first halves I've ever seen. We get transferred to another manager. Our old boss turns out to be a mole. We investigate her and find out the real mole is our new boss. Then that kind of gets put on hold as we need to recover a mind control brain chip. It's not a chip you put in someone to mind control them. It is a chip that you can have installed that lets you mind control other people. So of course we're going to get that. If Starfield ever has a sequel, I guarantee the mind control brain chips will create problems within it. Ryujin's a lot of corporate politics and stealth missions. The manipulate social ability isn't really that great, and I realize the menu for using them is a much worse version of the quick hacks menu from Cyberpunk. There's a handful of social abilities you can use, and I didn't realize until this tutorial in this questline at the end of the game how you were supposed to use them. I just kind of figured when I selected some of the skills that they would work like the Outer Worlds where the intimidations would be rolled automatically into combat, not a separate ability. I have to activate, and then I forgot I even bought them. Still, I think the designers were cognizant of some players having moral issues with the chip, so they designed the questline to be able to be completed without it, meaning that it's not really that strong of an ability, and in turn, nearly pointless. It does allow you to affect NPCs in dialogue as well, but only for the few quests in this questline after you get it. Alright, I'm quitting on this one. Ryujin is boring. Like, it's just stealth, but stealth in Starfield, it's just a crouching simulator. I could barely bring myself to keep playing the questline, let alone force myself to actually write about it. Let's talk about the economy in this game instead. I did say earlier it worked with ship component values and that was basically it. Payouts for activities can be all over the place. The helpful folks at the Starfield wiki, the real one, put together a chart of the mission payouts which operate in a preset tiered level list. So for example, at level 28, a main quest mission with a small payout gives you 8,500 credits. A faction mission with the same payout gives you 6,600 credits. A side mission gives you 4,300 credits. A miscellaneous mission gives 2,400 credits. So for example, guards will sometimes randomly give you money as a reward for defeating pirates. This is scaled. When I noticed it, they gave me 3,300 credits, which seemed like a lot. Meals seem to run somewhere between 1 to 200 credits. So it's less like they're buying me a free lunch and more like they're buying me two copies of Starfield. I know, that's a lot of money. Now Bethesda's never been good at the lunch money stink test. 
That said, Starfield is also bad at relative values. What I mean is, everything you can buy valued fairly compared to other markets. A digipick is 35 credits. What stops you from amassing digipicks isn't their price, but rather the fact that merchants only tend to have 3 to 5 in stock at a time. A med pack is 525 credits. The lowest pay and activity at its smallest can still cover that cost easily, meaning that it's not hard to outpace some of the only routine expenditures you might have, which you only need to start doing if you decide to really stop looting dungeons like I did towards the end. Then you get into the weapons, an Eon is 750 credits to start. Either the settled systems have subsidized cheap weaponry or something ain't right. Of course, nobody's saying buys weapons. Weapons are for selling, not buying. Thus, we're half pirate killer, half arms dealer. Even at the steep percentage loss we experience just because we're the player, weapons trading outpaces quests by a wide mile. In turn, this means there isn't much incentive to do mission board quests. Let's see, I can make 2,000 on a Radiant quest, or I can go do a random dungeon and generate 50,000 easily. Starfield suffers from this problem because of how easy it is to cart truckloads of loot back to the ship. Whereas at least in Skyrim or Fallout 4, encumbrance prevented you from absolutely stripping dungeons dry. The companions do try to harangue you over hoarding items, but it's easily the best way to generate revenue in the setting. I never had a problem with hoarding iron swords or pipe guns like I do in Starfield, and that's because Starfield's too scared to punish me for hoarding. You're always a short distance from your ship, and in turn, if you're within 400 meters of it, you can access its inventory and transfer items to the ship. There's also a space shout that enables you to sprint infinitely, even while encumbered. You can also sell items directly from the ship's inventory, which is convenient, but also means the economy gets absolutely devalued because additionally, Almost all the merchants are willing to buy anything, including weapons. So to counteract this, they set the merchants to only have around 5,000 credits to spend on your goods. So clearing out the merchants in town, you won't walk away with more than 25,000 in a day. A good economy is important for making it feel like I'm meaningfully upgrading or living a character. Because I barely have to spend money on items, money just pools up faster than it can drain. The shipbuilding system is literally the only thing controlling rampant economic inflation in Starfield, and New Game Plus since it will set you back to zero. In a way, New Game Plus helped me feel like I hadn't wasted points on the commerce skill trying to quickly get higher tier social perks, because it was at least useful early starting out in the new universe. The cheapest ship in New Atlantis is roughly 52,000 credits. This is less than twice the price of a house down in the well, meaning that guards are handing out down payments to me for killing pirates. But selling ships is a complete waste of time. In order to sell ships, you need to pay for their registration, which is roughly 90% of the ship's value. Even if you're selling stolen ships to the literal pirate faction, which you would think they would offer a higher margin since they aren't selling those ships back into the civilian market, they're either scrapping them for components or using them for piracy meaning that there's a small margin of profit to selling ships. Not even stealing them, just selling the various space bandit ships that attack you. Mind you, the profit margin on selling a spaceship is equal to the profit margin on selling a couple mid-tier firearms. Even then, the game's mechanical systems don't handle ship transfers smoothly, so I ended up avoiding piracy despite it being an activity I actually expected myself to do frequently, which is a shame because I like the activity, but I need a motivation to do it. Overall, Starfield's economy is all over the place. Buying out ammunition is somehow an order of magnitude more expensive than buying out material resources, which leads into outposts. It's funny how many reviews, even from people with more than 100 hours, didn't even interact with outposts, yet assumed the system works well. It really doesn't. Vasco does give an easy-to-miss side quest early on, encouraging you to go build an outpost, but then that's it. That's how hard the game tries to push you into it, it otherwise relies on passive curiosity. I have to wonder how well the system would have been received if you took away people's knowledge of settlement building in Fallout 4. The only reason I built my first outpost was because I had a bounty in UC space and didn't know where to clear it in Aquila, so I made an outpost to build the bounty clearing terminal. I'll take the fact that so few reviewers engaged with the system as a sign that it's not quite as effective as Fallout 4 at introducing the idea. The first big change is that miscellaneous items are no longer broken down into components. Adhesive is still a thing, but you can no longer break down duct tape to get it. This has put clutter into an awkward position. 
The general level design philosophy changed slightly. There are now a lot more generic items placed onto shelves which are non-interactable. In prior games, this was kept low in order to help players read what could be looted and what couldn't easily. Now you need to keep the scanner open to see these items. So there's non-interactable clutter and interactable clutter, but the clutter you can pick up can only be sold. Then mixed in amongst the clutter are material resources, the manufactured components often looking like generic items. The hired mod author Eleonora, known for making Skyrim house mods as a level designer responsible for placing clutter into the world. And the result is that within days, a popular mod was uploaded to the Nexus, removing all of it. That's not her fault, it's the fault of whichever dev decided that scrappy materials was no longer going to be a thing, reducing the value of miscellaneous items down to their pithy credit values. Unless that was her decision, then it would be her fault, but I doubt it was. I digress, this game broke the loot goblet in me. Dungeons were simply too noisy with items, both interactable and non-interactable, for me to actually bother learning where the valuable, in quotes, items were. The whole system doesn't work. In theory, items looted from the environment are useful for research and weapon modding. In practice, you're better off buying out these resources in towns and mass harvesting ores using an overpowered starborn ability than actually wasting time combing through dungeons, especially since we're talking about template dungeons, not unique dungeons. What separates Starfield from Fallout 4 and Skyrim is that those games have a finite number of locations and you only repeat content by going to the same place you've already been. In Starfield there's a few dozen templates as opposed to the couple hundred in Skyrim and no matter where you go, you end up at the same few dungeons. There's no point in being precise in looting when you're going to repeat the same dungeon a dozen times. Better to just hit the main loot containers that are on the way as fast as you possibly can. Research isn't tied to outposts either. You can get a research station on your ship and do it entirely independent of outposts or looting. This gives players multiple avenues to pursue research, but research is... Uh... Well, it's a bit shallow. There are five categories, but none of them go particularly deep. It doesn't help that the majority of research projects are gated behind perk investments. But there are not that many projects, so spending points to make research cheaper is a huge waste of points because the alternative is just material resources. I'm not wasting valuable perk points on rocks. Basically, you open projects and then put resources toward that project. So for instance, Barrel Mods 1 requires 2 sealant, 3 iron, and 3 nickel. It's a freebie, so it's not as heavy on resources as some of the later ones. No matter where you are, all you need is to access a research station with that material and you can put it towards the project. So really, even having a research station on your ship isn't necessary, considering some merchants have them in shops and Constellation has one in the basement. Again, I want to stress, you don't have to have all of the materials in any one location to complete a project. Somehow, all of the stations are interconnected, so you can just gradually make progress as you find the materials. Submitted resources can sometimes also randomly lead to sudden developments, where the game pays for some of the missing resources instead. Given there is a perk to increase sudden development chances, I assume it's RNG and thus you could theoretically save scum it. There's also a chem to reduce resource requirements for 10 minutes. And you best believe I did neither of those things, because I was too lazy to. As neurotic as I can get about Skyrim crafting, it's not present here. The system is so casual and easy to complete that it doesn't incentivize actually trying to metagame it. Skyrim rewards efficiency with its crafting system because it can take a long time and a metric ton of materials to fully complete. Additionally, it's not necessary due to the low difficulty. For reference, I only went past the first tier of weapon upgrades after 50 hours, when I noticed a single enemy in a dungeon that took an unusually long time to kill. Alright, let's start with the useless category, food. Probably not a surprise to you that food is useless if you've played any of Bethesda's games except Fallout 76. A few people were surprised on a stream when Private Sessions and I expressed absolute disgust at the fact that food had been recombined into the aid category in the menu. So we're back to putting food in the aid category? No. Can we please keep food in its own category? Like, I don't... Uh. God. They don't want you to scroll on this menu, and this is all they could fit, so... Yeah. <laughs> Even if they wanted to stick to that, they could have, like, shrunk down some of these panels and stuff. Like, you could easily fit, like, another four or five categories on that screen before you have to scroll. 
Yeah, cool, Todd. Why wouldn't food be in the aid section when that's the, literally the mechanical function it serves? So what we're talking about is in 76, there's an aid category, a food category, and a drink category. But like you keep it separate because they do do like different things. And because like you want more categories. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have like 30 things in the aid category of all the different types of food and medical and supplies. And all I'm looking for are my and health all I want, potions. Yeah, I just want my health potion, my, my red juice refiller. The only reliable way I found to do this was to sort the aid menu by weight, as food items all weigh more than 0.1 kilograms. That said, food is effectively worthless. A lot of food items restore somewhere between 1 and 30 health. In a game where you start out with 205 health and it scales up as you level. The first time I even checked my numerical health value, I'd already passed 2000. It honestly seems like the game was designed around a much smaller health pool, and someone at the last minute bumped it up, leaving food items behind massively. So really, all they provide is small benefits that last a couple minutes. I found them unnecessary, at least compared to Kim's. Pharmacology unlocks the ability to create better Kims. Note that you can find all but the absolute highest tier of Kims in loot and at merchants, so you have to invest multiple perk points to unlock the final tier of exclusive Kims that look really inconvenient to craft. They're powerful, but it's a tiered crafting system where you have to make the previous item to make the next one. So dwarf star hearts are used to make giant hearts, and then you can use the giant hearts to make super massive hearts. Tiered crafting is annoying in modded Minecraft where the UI can at least tell you the individual steps. Go ahead and imagine how well that flies in a Bethesda game. Kims aren't too bad. There are multiple Kims that increase movement speed and they do stack. Sadly, I didn't realize this until after I'd done most of my temple runs. But you best believe I was collecting movement speed Kims because my time is the most valuable thing in this game. You can still get addicted too, which I appreciate even if it's trivial to get unaddicted. There are also 8 items for removing status effects. Different planets can give you different effects based on the environment, such as heat, cold, radiation, and biological contamination. There are also status effects for fall damage, blunt force trauma, blood loss. It's good stuff, as your prognosis can also worsen with time and exposure. It did bug out and I ended up with a permanent weather alert, but that was owed to buggy quest scripting during the Crimson Cringe questline. I thought the idea was neat. That said, what they do is very minor and the curatives for the effects are so common that I never had a situation arise where I was dealing with an injury I couldn't immediately resolve, akin to some of the great experiences I've had with needing to literally limp home in, say, New Vegas. So the way the environmental damage works in the game on planets and on your suit and, you, you know, you, can, uh, you have uh, resistances to certain types of atmosphere effects, whether that's radiation or thermal, etc. And that was a pretty, it's a pretty complex system, actually. It was very punitive. And so we kept trying, where you get these afflictions, we kept trying to tune it. We get a point where we're tuning it and you're having to heal those things. And what we did at the end of the day, is it, and it was a complicated system for players to understand, is we just, made, we just nerfed the hell out of it. Hmm. Where it ends up being, it matters, but only a little bit. It matters more in flavor. Like the affliction you get is more annoying knowing you have it than the game result. Usually, I'm generalizing. So it was, let's just dial it down. Because if we dial it way back, it becomes more flavor on the screen than it does a gameplay system we had originally wanted where, okay, I have multiple spacesuits. I have one for high radiation planets. I have one for really cold planets. I have ones for these environments. And I'm saying it now, people are playing the game, like you don't think about it that much. It might be something we address going forward, but that was one type of solution there. And I could probably go through similar or dissimilar things up or down. And there you have it. If they couldn't make something fun, then they just make it effectively non-existent. Like so many things, a good idea sitting in an ocean of poor implementation where every other idea tied to it lets it down. I think that that's an excellent sort of uh, piece of advice for creative directors, designers who are wondering, well, how do I balance these things? So, thank yeah, you. sometimes it's take it out, find the straightest line. Outpost research is what it says on the tin, research for unlocking things related to outposts. So, technically, you can set down routes on most planets you land on as long as you're out of range of a point of interest. 
I did have a time where I was about to set down my outpost and a spaceship landed and took up the nice flat spot I was going to use. That was annoying. Outposts have been heralded as this amazing new addition, but honestly, as someone who regularly plays games like Factorio and Satisfactory, please just go play a game that actually focuses on mechanics like this instead of putting effort into a Starfield outpost. Trust me, it's well worth your time and money. Okay, so planets have a subset of resources you can access. You need to actually find a spot where the resources you want are near each other, so it's not as simple as just finding a planet with 8 resources and getting all of them. But, for example, I find this landing spot on a planet where the biome generation messed up and put a huge straight line where the resource generation changed. You put down an outpost, put down power generation, and then you put down resource extractors. Those extractors can dump into containers. You can then use the resources for whatever research or production you want to do. The obvious problem is that not many research projects actually necessitate resources on the level that an outpost generates. Basically, outposts are for generating hundreds if not thousands of resources, while research often takes a few dozen at most. Satisfactory and Factorio are both games that are finely tuned around to progressing research with your resource generation. I think it's a mistake to not make outposts the easiest way to complete research, as it means the two systems are working in isolation rather than in cooperation. Here's how it should work. You do combat to make money, you make money to upgrade your ship, you use the ship to reach new planets, you use the new planets to build better outposts, you use the outposts to generate resources, you use the resources to do research, you do research to unlock new combat mechanics. And then the loop repeats. Instead it's, you do combat to make money, you use the ship to make money, you go to new planets to make money, you use outposts to make money, you use resources to make money, you do research to make making money easier. You can set up landing pads connected to the nodes though, which can then summon ships mysteriously from the Aether to deliver resources into outposts. The only stipulation is that if they have to go in between systems, then you need to set up a supply line for Helium-3, even though we don't need fuel anymore. I already hate this. We can own multiple ships and could even customize ships for serving the purpose of transporting materials, and could have dedicated crew for piloting those ships but instead it just opts to conveniently spawn a mystery ship to do it all for us, for free. The system was also a real pain to set up, and for almost no gain. Sure, you could set up a system that automatically generates produced goods that you could then load onto your cargo hauler and take to a city to sell, or set up production lines in response to mission board quests, but... Why? Why would you do that? Sure, you could also ask that of Factorio or Satisfactory or Modded Minecraft, but those games make the process of setting up production lines actually fun, in addition to having a lengthy progression system that intertwines combat and exploration into the production process. Here's a cheat sheet for Starfield. If its only purpose is to help make the player money, it's a bad system. If the game had a better economy, this would be less the case, but that wouldn't entirely solve the problem. Mechanics should lead into other mechanics, as long as you have the approach of needing to be able to say, yes, you can choose to not do that, you will always have problems making a compelling game. You should provide alternatives, not escapes. For example, doing dungeons to generate resources instead of building outposts, for players who like combat and hate crafting. I wonder how long it took for Heller and Lynn to realize I not only abandoned them in an outpost, but I literally swapped realities and forgot to send someone to go get them. The remaining two categories for research are for unlocking spacesuit and weaponry mods. I touched on these earlier, so no need to repeat myself here. Pretty much the only benefit to weapons research over dedicated combat perks is that the unlocks are universal, so you can get more bang for your perk points without committing points to specific weapon types. As is, research was only something I crossed off late into the game, when I had accumulated a ton of resources and wanted to use them before resetting. And even then it was a bit tedious because it was a huge skill point investment, which is more rewarding for someone who does it throughout the game, rather than all at once, which is typically how I do crafting in Skyrim or Fallout 4. The outpost building is also tedious, because it seems that everything that has been updated to be improved in camp building for Fallout 76 was just ignored for Starfield. It's really not surprising considering how the team dynamic at Bethesda works. It's probably seen as prudent to just copy Fallout 4, warts and all. Like they pitched the outpost free cam as though it was going to be a new thing, but it's not. Fallout 76 already had that. I never had problems with getting things rotated precisely in 76 like I did in Starfield. 
Now Starfield doesn't have basic foundation blocks to build upon, so I literally put all my crafting stations on top of the flattest building. I could not imagine a system more pointless than outpost building in Starfield, and I feel genuinely embarrassed for all the day one reviewers who gave it an automatic pass. So if you remember way back when, we stopped a bank robbery. Well, the Marshal and Aquila. Uh, okay, I'm just going to pretend it's like modern day sheriffs, where the name is traditional. I mean, sheriffs predate the Wild West, but you get my point. I'm going to pretend the Marshal and Rangers aren't obviously cowboy things. Frankly, I'm honestly surprised the uniform isn't a leather duster. Anyways, the Rangers want us to start by doing a Radiant Quest. No, they don't pretend it's not a Radiant Quest. They don't go handcraft a Radiant Style Quest. And they don't have us do literally nothing. We are told to go to the Ranger Mission Board and do a Ranger Mission. I like it. But I really want to be clear on why it works here, because it'll come off as contradictory if you're not paying attention. The Vanguard and Sysdef have us do nothing to earn our place. Ryujin has us do Radiant Quests, but they are pre-made and pretend that they're not. Here we are told that if we want to earn our way into the Rangers, we'll need to work for it. It's introducing a mechanic of the game, the mission boards, and making sure we understand what the faction is about up front. I think having to earn your way into higher responsibility work is important for faction writing in these games, but also important as being up front, that is what you're having the player do. If we want to be a ranger, we'll need to go do ranger things. That is, if we forget that we handled a bank robbery to get this far. We're only given a chance because of that robbery, which I hate. It was so close, but of course it's Starfield, it can't do anything 100% right. I mean, how else are rangers and deputies hired? Unless the marshal seriously waits to offer jobs only to people who show equivalent initiative. Yeah, most sheriff's offices don't get to be so picky. Personally, I'd only have the bank robbery happen if we're on Sam Coe's personal quest, and you get a couple different lines of dialogue if you happen to already be with the rangers. Then if you want to be a ranger, you just apply. Just complete some basic, unimportant assignment that they need help fulfilling, and bam, that's our end with the faction. When they said there were only 12 rangers, I thought that was hyperbole. No, apparently there are only 12 rangers in the entire Free Star Collective working to maintain law and order. Sure, there are probably more deputies than just us, and the guards obviously aren't tied to the rangers, but it's a bit crazy. Rangers are outright stated to be THE law when it comes to the Freestar Collective. It's almost an admission that the cities in this setting are fully to scale. If the Freestar Collective only has a couple hundred people living in it, it makes sense that they only have a dozen rangers. A lot of the game's own fans had a problem with there only being a dozen rangers, but if the settled systems are actually at a one-to-one -one scale, that means there's four rangers per FSC system. It's more than enough. The problem really isn't the number of rangers, it's how tiny the settled systems are. The rangers draw their obvious inspiration from the rangers of the American frontier. The Texas rangers have a complicated history, to say the least. They were founded to protect settling families in the Texas territory from bandits and native tribes, because in the 1830s the army wasn't there to protect them. See, Texas at the time wasn't part of the United States, but rather the freshly independent nation of Mexico. The rangers were famous for their efficiency, but also their extra-legal operations. Despite being founded by pro-native Sam Houston, the rangers were deployed against native Cherokee and Comanche. However, their big claim to fame was their absolute peak performance during the Mexican-American War over the territory of Texas. Texas had broken off from Mexico not long after their war for independence, but Mexico obviously still saw it as their territory and an American ploy to steal their land. What's important here is that tactics established by the Texas Rangers were adopted by the United States' own cavalry. The Rangers' exploits continued and they became a part of American folklore, a sort of contemporary knightly order. I mean, they had the horses, were defending the people, and were martial masters. Of course, like real knights, the true history wasn't as glamorous. It was a tough and lawless time, and the reason the Rangers were able to overcome it was through equivalent brutality. But as the frontier became more and more civilized, their actions became more intolerable. Things changed with the Mexican Revolution in 1910. The violence of the revolution spilled over the border as criminals came north to raid Texas. 
the Rangers responded in a series of actions that were increasingly extreme. They justified their actions under the pretense that Mexico was stoking the fires of a war in Texas, and a number of attacks against Americans had happened. However, an investigation by the Texas legislature into the Rangers' actions between 1910 and 1919 revealed a series of massacres and summary executions. They experienced a reform, but it was short-lived because a decade later, the Great Depression happened. The Rangers were discharged, but eventually reformed a few years later due to increasing crime tied to the prohibition making its way to Texas due to the Rangers not being around anymore. So they were brought back and reformed into the organization that they are today. I bring up their history because like that whole deal with the privateers, Starfield is obviously going to come up short in portraying its Rangers. The Rangers were products of the geographic reality of the American Southwest, a rough and desolate land sitting on a border that separated distinct cultures. The Freestar Collective really doesn't have a reason they're relying on such an organization. You want to be very careful when it comes to giving law enforcement officers power to do anything. Because they're still people, and people will use power given to them for petty reasons. So if you want to tell a story about a ranger-like organization, the best way to do that would be to explore a group of rangers who all fall on a spectrum when it comes to how they use, or abuse, their powers. Granted, I think the ranger storyline in Starfield is its... strongest. It's trying to put the Freestar Collective in the context that its legal system is flawed and ineffective. Neon is a crime-ridden hellhole, and that's not an accident. Turns out they're rangers directly tied to the oligarchy. However, Starfield as a game is woefully ineffective at creating the real experience of a ranger, and that's because civilization is just a little too civilized. It's got the cowboy veneer, but it's exactly that. We're just minutes away from the crown jewel of United Colonies space. Volley, Cheyenne, and Narion are all too close together. Freestar space should be far more decentralized and spread out. For example, our first real job as a deputy is to head out to Montera Luna, a moon in the Cheyenne system. Instead, our first mission should be three or four grab jumps away from Aquila. That way there's a real lag in response time for the rangers that isn't because they're an ineffective organization, but simply because too few rangers are having to protect too large of a space. Of course, doing this quest reveals a conspiracy that we're going to spend this entire quest line solving. And that's kind of the trope of Bethesda writing that holds them back. They have one big idea they want to explore, and feel like it's a sin to have multiple storylines in one narrative. I would honestly prefer if we did some smaller investigation to earn our badge, and then after earning our badge, we're assigned this mission that branched into the big investigation. Maybe we get assigned to help a ranger bust a smuggling ring in a three-part sub-quest line, and then become a full ranger. Then we get assigned to Montera Luna as our first solo operation. Instead, we spend the entire time in the rangers as a deputy, and our reward is to be a ranger. Now go do some radiant quests, champ. Why wouldn't we want to spend the bulk of the ranger quest line being an actual ranger? Ranger Wilcox comes out with us, us being just a deputy and all. Of course, this is the cowboy quest line, so it's the most cowboy of them. We aren't just visiting someone who is a citizen of the Freestar Collective. Of course, it's somebody with a classic cowboy ranch next to a big gorge. We gotta head down to find them there, cattle rustlers. Some space bandits are trying to steal this person's land. In fairness, and we do have to give them credit here, there is actually a not totally stupid reason for this. It might have been an accident, of course. See, a typical Bethesda plot point would have the reason be that the bank wants to foreclose on their property so that they can build a new chunks factory. And of course, my obvious response would be that 99.99% .99 of Montera Luna is unoccupied. There's zero reason why a chunks factory needs to be built on this specific plot of land. But in this case, they wrote a reason for the space bandits to want specifically this farm. I mean, it's not 100%, I could easily nitpick it, but it's still something. The point stands, Work like this is why I credit the rangers above the other quest lines. We get two leads from tracking down the bandits. They have a Hope Tech ship, and they call themselves the First Cavalry. The Marshal is actually a veteran of the Colony War, himself a former member of the First Cav. They were... a mech division. Oh. 
I see. The Freestar Collective had mechs so that they could say they had a cavalry division. Couldn't they have written some of the Xeno weapons? Since at this point in writing I'm relying on the wiki to recall information, I did a double take as the quest staging said that we became a full-fledged Freestar Ranger. Had I misremembered events? However, it seems the final version of the game skips that stage, as I guess they decided to move our promotion to Ranger to the end of the questline. I mean, I don't blame them. One little mission down on a moon is not enough to merit promotion to Ranger. Like I said, we should have done a smaller preliminary investigation before this one to earn our merit badge. Apparently, the Marshal doesn't know anything about his old unit becoming bandits, which is strange, because they've certainly not kept a low profile as we find out later in the line. The Marshal isn't in on any kind of conspiracy, either. This is where we learn that we take orders from the Council of Governors, so that'll be our dilemma later. But it is weird that the first have managed to build such a large operation without even a whisper of their existence reaching the ears of the Marshal. I don't think this is an intentional plot point, I think genuinely they want us to believe that this happened. Hope Tech is one of these starship manufacturers, their ships being best described as space trucks. Not child killers, actual freight hauling vehicles. Its founder, Ron Hope, is on the Council of Governors. See, Hope Town is one of the colonies in the Freestar Collective. Not really clear if it was during the Colony War, though. No, you can pick up the transport huh, this looks missions. Like a, this you looks like a moderate settlement. 900 credits, which is oh. like the cost of like a... Dude, you weren't kidding. Level it's so jank. Helmet. Like, I didn't even make it off the dock. Yeah. No, no, no. You didn't I have got, to. Yeah, no, you shit, didn't I guess I don't have a reason. Ship. I guess I don't have a reason to explore this place. All right. Back to the ship, everybody. <laughs> they have a weird kind of mentality with, like, the, the carrot and the stick. Of, like, we'll get people to go to this town. And there's probably some side quest here, right? Mm-hmm. You got me to go to the town. You didn't get me to go into yeah. the town. Yeah. And so it's like, I guess I'm leaving. I mean, I, I'll I'll interact with the uh, the kiosk here to get its five thousand credits. I'm sorry, we have radiant quests to do. Hope Tech ships are supposed to be not great in combat, so I doubt they were big suppliers during the war. Ron Hope seems a little too young to have been running an established company back during the war. It's just unclear, and I was unable to find much online if this was actually explored anywhere, because it's certainly not in the quest line. Like all things related to the Colony War, it's only useful insofar as it can be a premise. What if a bunch of ex-mech pilots formed a mercenary band after the war? Great, ship it. But get this. The most recent Colony War, which was 20 years ago, was started because the Freestar Collective colonized the Lunara system. Now already that stinks because the Freestar Collective is a decentralized alliance of independent systems. They don't formally colonize anything. Other people colonize and then they join the collective, hence why it's called a collective. However, the FSC colonizing a fourth star system was a violation of the Treaty of Narion, an established treaty from a prior war that limited each power to only three star systems. No, I'm... I'm not joking. Someone writing science fiction seriously wrote a fictional treaty in which two stellar powers agreed to mutually limit their colonization. The treaty has no stipulations that each power can colonize to match the other, or that they can make formal agreements to expand at the same rate. No, we're supposed to believe that these two governments agreed that forevermore, they would only occupy three star systems each. As a writer, the only benefit I can see to this is that it explains why the United Colonies and Freestar Collective are so... small. Since these read like the kind of bare-bones skeleton whiteboard notes that Emma likes to write, I can actually understand why some designers decided to avoid writing about the wars. It's because the more you write about them, the more likely it is that players will find out about the atrocious world-building. Legitimately, my opinion of the game would have been higher if I had never found out this fact about the setting. That's not great for writing. Next up is a hilarious scene where Freestar ships scan my ship for contraband as a Freestar Ranger begs over the comms within visual range for assistance. This is not an accident, the Ranger's always found in orbit of Polvo, and Polvo is a planet that has Freestar ships scanning for contraband. There's even a space station in the background. I took a screenshot for posterity of how bad this moment is. How did this pass QA? 
So we head down to the surface with the rangers to meet with Hope Tech's leader, Ron Hope. He's voiced by Wes Johnson doing a half Shea Goreth voice, so... Evil. Definitely evil. No doubt about it. He's behind it all. I see. <laughs> I'm impressed, deputy. It's clear you have a bright future ahead of you. He is, by the way. It's always the first place you look. Ron Hope's big conspiracy was that he wanted to cheapen materials pricing to keep his company afloat, so he loaned farmers in the collective fertilizer that would produce the materials in their farm, then he'd have the first come and take them over and harvest the resources. Yeah, like I said, it's a reason. Not a scientifically literate reason. Because there are many better ways of getting the materials he needs. But doing it this way could be cheaper in terms of labor, I guess. But at least he's not stealing the farm so he can build new factory. Okay, so at least the quest line has us meeting a variety of Freestar Rangers. Nia Kalu is... Ugh, look, this quest kind of sucks. Hope says up front he's not against hiring scavengers and ripping them off if it means keeping a roof over everyone's head. And we're told again to not piss him off because he's one of the rangers' bosses. The story's trying to make it clear that the rangers don't answer to the people, they answer to the oligarchy. And the people just have to hope that the oligarchy has their wellness in mind. Was this the same oligarchy that sparked the previous war by colonizing Lunara? Do the people of the collective have thoughts on their leadership? Cowboy gun go bang bang. <laughs> Our lead from Hope Tech takes us to Neon. Honestly, given Ron Hope was in on the conspiracy and allowed one of his ships to be stolen so the first could use it, why wouldn't he shut down the investigation here? He could say that he wants to handle the investigation internally, or that he'd prefer to discuss this with the Marshal. His downfall comes from the fact that he pushed us into an investigation, with no real plan to stop us from pursuing it later. So we go to... Neon, to follow the lead. Hey, did you know that Sam's been with us this entire time? Yeah. When you do Sam's personal quest, you actually get to meet the ranger here. He's got some strong words for Sam. Welcome back. Listen, uh, feel free to use anything. Wait, is that Sam Co? You have a lot of nerve. Here to yell at Lillian personally? Maybe change things up a little? Um, I did this quest well after the initial meeting with Ranger Price with Sam as a companion. The last thing anyone around here wants is some hotshot deputy looking in every dark corner. Neon's a tough, tough assignment. The ecosystem is rigged against any real law enforcement. Most games would solve this problem by having Sam suggest he wait outside should you try to visit the Neon Ranger station before doing his quest. This accomplishes two positives. It establishes that Sam has relationships with other Rangers that are both positive, as we saw with the Marshal, and negative, as we see with his apprehension to see Ranger Price again. It also prevents Price from prematurely seeing and even speaking with Sam and having nothing angry to say when he sees him. Sam Co. is a former Freestar Ranger. I legitimately think the drastic change in Ranger opinion of Sam is because Price is the only Ranger we talk to during Sam's quest, besides his ex who's still a Ranger, and so they wanted to convey some disconnection between his past life. Like if Sam's ex had been complaining about him making her life hell, surely all of the Rangers would know since they do keep in touch. I do have to give props for the quest at least acknowledging my ranger connection to bypass a bribe, and then retract those props because Ranger Price somehow forgot that I was a ranger. There's only a dozen of us, man. I killed seven gangsters last time we met. But in every other instance, it seems like the rangers want Sam to come back, and it's Sam who quit of his own volition. Sarah and Sam don't really add a whole lot to their respective faction quest lines as companions possibly out of concern, that the writers didn't want to force players to have these companions with them. This is not the only time this has happened either. During Andrea's quest, we are sent to meet with Reina Marquez at the Den. We had also met with her prior to the companion quest during the Vanguard quest line. She's the woman that helped us track down Dr. Orlais. But when it comes time to meet her during Andrea's quest line, she outright says, Haven't seen you around here before. Welcome to the Den, Reina Marquez. I head up the Vanguard station here. 
good to see another Vanguard pilot. You assigned here, or just passing through? Um. So, what can I do for you? This speaks to a broader problem. Traditionally, NPCs in Bethesda games would have a set of greetings that are used contextually. If you had already met with and were familiar with an NPC, their games would not have an issue with NPCs forgetting who you were. Example given, meeting with Delvin Mallory during the Dark Brotherhood quest line. He has multiple ways he can greet you depending on your Thieves Guild progress up to that point. The way this works is that the NPC greets you and then you use a line of dialogue unlocked by a quest to begin talking to them for the purpose of that particular story. It is extremely alarming to me that this is no longer consistently the case. It means their designers are becoming less robust at using their system. Now in Starfield, if two quests in independent categories point to the same NPC, there's no guarantee that NPC will have dialogue acknowledging your past encounters. This is because each quest is writing its own greeting straight from the root, rather than having a stem greeting that all quests use when they have to share characters. This speaks to a fundamental breakdown in internal communications at Bethesda. I would not be surprised if, in 99% of cases, it was decided that it was easier to simply create new characters for stories than crossover characters between quest lines. Not having a central design document does that. So Sam is with us during our ranger investigation, but doesn't really do anything other than give the occasional comment in conversations. That is to say, you can't ask Sam for a profile on the various rangers we meet. They are more active in the storyline than past Bethesda game companions, with the exceptions of Serana and Nick Valentine. I'll give them credit, but it's still a far ways away from being active participants in storylines. I think it's fair to at least expect the free star guy to have some active writing for his related quest line. Sure, maybe not every companion, but Sam was a ranger. But most of his and Sarah's contributions aren't meaningful. In fact, here are Sam's contributions to this quest. You've got a reputation for looking after your own, Mr. Hope. I'm sure the deputy here will keep that in mind. I mean, I can only delay comparisons to Baldur's Gate 3 for so long. I waited like six hours. Baldur's Gate 3 does a lot of work to give companions real flavor and dialogue. <clears throat> it's just strange to say extra attention was paid to companions in Starfield, and then that extra attention is basically just a tamer Outer Worlds. I at least didn't visibly cringe every time a companion would interject in dialogue. So, I can't jump on stage and sing my heart out to ancient Earth music? Bummer. Okay. Okay. I'll be on my best behavior. See? Serious mode activated. There's a kind of interjection I put in my scripts that can break the flow of the original sequence. If you pay attention, you can probably even notice when it happens. Such things happen when I feel it's important to splice in a piece of information and don't necessarily have the time to smooth over the rough edges. I suppose I should have guessed. It has been too long since I checked in. I'm just glad we found you unharmed, Andresia. Vladimir and I were worried. You are the newest member, yes? Do they often send you to check up on other, more senior members? A lot of companion dialogue interjections are very similar. It helps to have a good teacher. Dad, don't let it go to your head. Sam? <laughs> Not let it go to his head? <laughs> Impossible. A compliment from little Cora. Well, it's not even my birthday. No. Notice how Sam doesn't acknowledge that Sarah even said anything. It's very obvious there's supposed to be a direct flow from Cora's compliment to Sam acknowledging the compliment. And then they awkwardly splice in a spot where companions interject. Likely the goal is to help humanize Constellation as an organization of friends, but how it comes off is that characters just blatantly ignore and talk past each other. Granted, there are a few exceptions where the interjections are actually responded to by the NPC in the conversation, and they're wonderful moments in the storytelling, but it's not consistent, and they pretty rarely show up. A member of the Rangers, and I'm the oldest. How you doing, old man? Well, I'll be a Dust Wrangler's cousin, Sam Coe. Oh, it's been too damn long. Why, Cora must be, what, nine, ten years old by now? I wish. She's twelve. Almost a teenager? 
My goodness. And here I thought I had enough gray hairs already. So, are you back? Oh, no, no, nothing like that. I'm just out here to watch the deputies back and see what kind of trouble we can get into. I see. Well, back to the matter at hand, then. The companions more than made up for it by making their interruptions of the gameplay far more annoying. For example, companions will frequently pipe their interactions up to the bridge of our ship, and it will play over top of any ongoing dialogues you're having with other ships. Companions will also not wait to ask to speak with you, which triggers when they gain affinity, which they gain from completing quests. So half the time they ask, it's at a really bad time they want to talk. But you have to talk with them because they're not going to wait to ask again when we're on the ship. They'll just keep asking. Companions will also like or dislike things you say, which can be annoying, but they can also hate things you do, even if they're the one who did it. Crazy? I can't stand what you did, but the mission is... What to make pleasure. So sometimes you have to send them back to the ship for a few minutes, like they're a child being sent to their room while their parents arrange an orgy. It's funny too because they have a generic dialogue for being offended at what you did. Obviously, it's better to have a system where they can get offended, even if they don't have dialogue for all the things wrong you can do, than to have no system at all. Although it would probably be good to have specific dialogues for like, if you murder certain NPCs during certain quests, so the NPCs can name drop them and make it seem less awkward. It's just a jarring mechanic and made me dread seeing the X hated that message pop up. So mostly I just kept them around for their passive perk benefits on the ship and brought Andrea with me as backup storage space as she seemed the most morally compatible. That said, there's little replay value to doing different questlines with different companions, especially compared to, say, Baldur's Gate 3. It's a shame, but it's also not that surprising since companions are still being treated as something separate from the player's story, instead of a core component of the storytelling like most RPGs that focus on companions. It's a weird middle ground of Bethesda design, because while they have always existed in some capacity, they were often just accessories for the player to collect, with only a couple exceptions per game. Of course, the reality is that there is a desire to increase the quality of the companions and simply a lack of centralized support for the idea. The central vision being almost non-existent, the companion team has to operate within a vacuum of implementation. What little cooperation that does exist was probably a huge amount of work and worry at Bethesda. It was stated that there are 240,000 voice lines in Starfield, significantly more than Skyrim or Fallout 4. This was used as a quantification of why there's more content in Starfield than previous games combined. However, here's the problem. Oblivion. Okay, more specifically. I pointed out with Oblivion that the Mages Guild has 1,000 lines more dialogue than the Fighters or Thieves Guild. However, if you think about the scope of the quest lines, you really don't see it in the end product. Just because a quest line has more lines doesn't necessarily mean it has more content. As an example, Say you remade the companion's questline from Skyrim, it's exactly the same in staging, except every dialogue has three options, and each option gets a unique response. Is the companion's now three times larger than before? Or say you cut all the lines in half, is it now double? Or say you don't edit the writer's work so the dialogue just drags on and on as nothing has been edited out. Point is, more lines of dialogue is not necessarily more content. A part of that new dialogue is going to be focused on the companions. So really, I don't think the companion's weakness is a sign of resource limitations. The game is 125 gigs after all, I don't think they care about people's data caps. Rather, I think it's a sign that the designers just didn't know how to do it. Again, when you make a game from the perspective of there being this theoretical player that doesn't want to interact with anything in the game, yet is somehow still playing Starfield, that's going to curtail ambition of writing narratives where the companions are active participants just like the players. After all, they could be dead already. It would break the ranger questline if it intimately involves Sam if he died. 
I guess that's what New Game Plus is for then. Ranger Price is willing to help us with the investigation, although he wants it to be very clear how generally hands-off the law is in Neon. If we actually try to enforce the law here, we'd likely end up dead pretty fast. He's pretty much just a vehicle to take us to the guy who does maintenance and watches the space traffic. You know, to Neon. The huge mercantile hub and tourist destination. I guess it isn't hard to watch its two landing pads. But that has to mean there's not much traffic, even in universe where things are scaled up 10 times. Allegedly, unlike Elder Scrolls or Fallout, there's nothing to suggest things have actually been shrunk. But Billy sees a way to get us to solve a problem for him, and for the first time in a while, I failed a speech check. Speech checks in Starfield are largely just a means of skipping small steps in quests, which I guess is interesting. Sure, the quest is technically playing out differently due to my failure, but after this diversion, we're going straight back to the point where we would have been had the check succeeded. Presumably, unlike the main quest, I only replayed the Crimson Cringe. No extra testing in this questline. The reason I bring this up is because the side diversion is actually interesting. We meet with a syndicate, actually. I think they're called THE Syndicate, as in that's the name of their gang. You know, in the cyberpunk corporation setting, except they're a gang instead of a corporate. whatever, references are hard. They made the very foolish decision to attack a ranger, and got shoved in a locker consequently for it. Weirdly, there's no consequences for this. Benjamin Bayou, the local oligarch on the Council of Governors, has strong preference for how the Syndicate is treated during the Ryujin line. But I guess a warehouse of them can get wiped out and this isn't harmful for us, Ranger Price, or Ranger Hart, who's Sam's ex and currently undercover in the Syndicate. Interwoven storytelling isn't just name dropping a character from another questline and then pretending that the world of that other questline doesn't exist. We're pointed to a woman over at Madame Savage's, which is like the afterlife from Cyberpunk if it got ported to the Nintendo Switch. I really can't stress how flame this game is. The Ship Thief is a huge lead, giving us names and an encrypted slate we can turn over to another ranger for decryption. It is a bit strange that one of the dozen rangers in existence is a guy who is landlocked to Aquila. Technically he can leave as long as he's not in a pressurized environment, which sounds like a completely solvable problem. Alex Shadid should have been located in a space station, and able to force laws on the ground due to being raised in a zero-gravity environment. Anyway, since he's no use for actual enforcement, he instead specializes in cryptography. I suppose someone in this organization has to actually have skills beyond just being a cowboy. There is a Y branch here in the questline, which, to memory, is exceptionally rare for side faction questlines post Morrowind, with the beginning of the Oblivion Mages Guild being the only real prominent example. We're given a choice on which lead to follow. It's not a huge amount of freedom, but at least it's slightly open. Our first lead takes us to the clinic, a space station in the Narion system that triggered the Narion War that led to that big dumb treaty where the factions could only have three systems each. You see, Narion was non-aligned, and then the UC built a medical clinic there. They thought this was a prelude to annexation, so Narion joined the Freestar Collective, and then they fought a war over Narion. This is how politics works. The clinic is run by a member of the Council of Governors and has a stationed full-time ranger on duty. He wonders why they have a stationed ranger, as though he himself hasn't picked up that clearly political nepotism drives the distribution of the rangers. He's mostly just the archetype of that one co-worker who's nearing retirement age who is super lazy and doesn't want to have to do anything. The mission on the clinic is really boring. Or maybe I did it wrong, I'm not sure. It was pretty obvious our suspect had checked in on the VIP wing under a false name and had used her hacker magic to interfere with the station's computer, so I broke in and immediately found the site of a dead body killed by an active turret. And then nobody ever acknowledged that part of the station had its security system online and that people have been killed. I don't mean to be rude, but unless this is a medical emergency, please get someone else to help you. Like, we're... A deputy law enforcement officer, surely we would need to report this, at a minimum, to the local ranger? Seriously, nobody cares, and I'm pretty sure it's just because they can't, based on reading the quest staging. So then we head into another dungeon and wow, pretty gemstones, cool colors, this game is f- Starfield's default color palette is bad, really bad. I got a kick out of reading a few people who were principally against installing a tool like Reshade because they, in their words, wanted to experience the game the way Bethesda intended. Well, the way they intended is... ugly. 
The game shipped with options to change the brightness levels, contrast, and saturation, but only in photo mode. It was playing with these options while taking a picture that I realized how badly I needed to fix this problem. So after a couple days of playing on ugly mode, bam, reshade. It took me a bit to really tune it correctly, but looking back at my early footage, I don't regret taking the problem into my own hands. See, the game doesn't have a brightness slider or any kind of color correction options by default. It doesn't even have HDR, something that they've had since Oblivion. They're having to add all this stuff in a patch. This means that darkness, something that you might expect to be fairly common in a game set in space, isn't actually dark. Everything has this muted color look to it, and this is of course after the auto-disabled effects like motion blur, depth of field, and film grain get turned off. But this cave in particular helps really illustrate why contrast is important. It's much easier for the brain to parse the visuals of the scene if there's an actual contrast between the shadows and the lighting elements. People spent years working on the visuals and creating assets, and all of that gets sabotaged by some ugly visual direction that smeared everything with a gray tint. I legitimately thought you guys learned this lesson after Fallout 3. Even the menus are ugly without color correction. I mean look at this, the menus have color banding issues, so instead of being a smooth gradient there's clear divisions between the colors. It looks awful. Speaking of a slider this game didn't have at launch, Starfield has no FOV slider. I've mentioned that like three times already. But that's the game's never had, but that doesn't mean it's a tradition you want to maintain. Plus Fallout 76 has one. Anytime I mention this, people feel the need to bring it up that it came in a patch, but it was literally less than two months post-launch. Now they've got the time down to just one month, but maybe they could consider shipping the game with a slider. See, they actually changed the FOV command in the game, meaning that it wasn't until around eight hours in when someone finally found out what INI setting you need to tweak. So my first eight hours of Starfield were played at 70 FOV. I don't see a reason to change the command unless there was some miscommunication that the game was going to have a slider, and then the slider never got added. But yeah, that's why I'm so mad about this whole FOV slider thing. And don't get me started on the main menu. I don't care if you guys used it for years, it just looks bad. This was one of the funny controversies that happened before release, as the team lead for Vanilla World of Warcraft made a casual comment about how lazy a leak of the Starfield main menu looked, and how that seemed to reflect on the game itself. He's wrong about main menus, but a lot of people felt the urge to try to dunk on him with even dumber arguments. Like the best response is simply that a team on a badly made game could still make a good main menu as a cover for the game's quality. Many of the people responding to him didn't even seem to understand what it was he was saying. For example, a number of people posted examples from other games as a suggestion that since their menus were minimalistic, clearly the games themselves were lazy, with the twist that they obviously weren't. Except he wasn't saying that the games are bad because the menus are minimalistic, just that a lazy menu reflects an overworked team. Moreover, Starfield's main menu is bad. Skyrim has a minimalistic main menu, ignoring the ugly message of the day they stapled on. The smoky background is a recurrent element in the loading screens, the logo is highly detailed in the forefront, the text elements are out of the way, and simple text without backgrounds or outlines wasting little space. There's cohesion between the main menu and loading into the game. And the main title theme for Skyrim is actually good, unlike Starfield. Starfield has some good musical tracks, but its title theme just isn't one of them. While we're complaining about the main menu, I'm also going to complain about the save selection tab. It's not good. They removed the screenshot thumbnails of where you saved, making it difficult to gauge where a save will take you. The scroll bar for quickly navigating to an early save is dysfunctional, making reloading my oldest saves a real pain in the ass. This is important for me as I often rely on being able to reload old saves to access quests I'm certain about before writing to double check information. For example, I reloaded the save to double check that we didn't become a ranger earlier, as the quest staging, even in the journal, implies that we had. Really though, the main menu drama highlighted a recurring element of Starfield pre-launch discourse, cowardice. The only reason so many people felt the need to comment was because it had gone viral and so many other people were. Generally though, most people commenting on the game before launch would speak non-specifically, doing callouts without actually naming anybody. The only exceptions were when everyone else was already dunking on somebody, like the guy who complained about not being able to land on gas giants. This drama happened right at the peak of pre-launch hype, so you had a lot of platitudes about not judging games before playing them. Or you know, don't judge them negatively.
Maya doesn't want to reveal anything, suggesting instead that we'll need to use our brain to solve this case before handing us an encrypted slate. And by use our brain, she means delegate this to another character so the writers can give us the W for using our brains without actually expecting us to do anything intellectually complicated. Just keep looking at the pretty colors. Her actions at least make sense in the context of the fact that she's dying. That said, given she's into the cowboy LARP yet a computer whiz, it further affirms that the Freestar folks aren't doing the whole cowboy thing out of some kind of material necessity, because cowboys ain't hackers. You'd think the LARP thing would have been abandoned the second a war happened. And there, there would have been people in the collective complaining about how many resources are being wasted so that their faction can play cowboys and Indians, but without the Indians because that would be racist. Marco's lead takes us to a place called the Red Mile. The ranger isn't thrilled to see us or involve us in a conversation with her contact, but her tune changes pretty fast. In order to get an in with the first, we need to impress the owner of the Red Mile, and to do that, we'll need to run it. Basic premise, the Red Mile sits at the edge of a crater full of dangerous animals. We need to run to the middle and back to complete the challenge. Yes! A runner has come to test the Red Mile! Now is your chance to get a good look. All the fun of Neon, plus betting on whether people are going to survive. Please tell me that was target practice. People in the bar bet on our survival. The trick is that the gravity here is twice Earth gravity, meaning that it'll be difficult. Wait, you guys actually thought about that? That gravity would make something more difficult? I thought we weren't doing that. The Red Mile. Never understood why anyone would voluntarily run it. Fresh air, huh? On a planet with no atmosphere. You need something? If you're sure you don't need backup. And you definitely can't do that in the Aquila quest line, you fuck cool. They have artificially modified the gravity inside the bar so that the patrons are comfortable, right? I mean, I'm not seriously supposed to believe people actually hang out on a planet with two Gs casually, right? Ugh. It's not even a challenge, because Xeno creatures can't handle a boost pack, even at limited capacity as high gravity creates. Like, I couldn't have been more confident it wasn't going to be a challenge, which makes how much they try to hype it up all the more hilarious. Their design ethos simply can't allow them to try to make this difficult on purpose, so it's simply dangerous in the dialogue, and then that's it. Also, we can't bet on ourselves or have our companions bet on us. Seems like a pretty obvious thing to let players try to do. With May pleased that someone ran the race to help the money flow through this place, she puts us in contact with Marco. We arrive and board his ship. His ship is a lavish display of wealth and... The runner. I've uh, got some stuff on my mind when you have the time. Marco's done well for himself. One might say too well. Uh, when the time's right, I'd appreciate a chat. This is what I mean. Other than the rare dialogue, all Sam's brought to this quest line is him deciding that super dangerous moments where we're literally in the belly of the beast is the time he wants to talk about his daughter and his ex-wife. No, oh yeah, didn't you die earlier in this video? Sorry, non-linear timeline and all. I will get you killed in a future universe just so that your daughter doesn't have a fu- It was funny that even on the Starfield subreddit, Starfield fans got razzed for saying its companions are the best ever. Like, they aren't even the best of this year, let alone ever. Might not be the best of Bethesda, and the game's own fans know it. So Marco offers to bribe us in exchange for leaving him alone, as though I'd avoid the gunfight that follows. I think the level design in the Freestar quests is pretty good at giving the player interesting areas to fight in, and there's no shortage of fighting in this questline, at least if you don't accept bribes. I don't know. I like killing people. In video games, too. And the Freestar Collective has the best sections of killing people. The Vanguard's all about Alamows, Ryujin barely lets you kill anybody, and one side of the Crimson Cringe questline actively taunts you if you try to kill anybody. Meanwhile, the Rangers questline is open to letting you have some actual room-to-room -room clearing action. Most of the dungeon templates have disconnected combat encounters. You walk into a room, fight some enemies, go through a hallway, tire cycle repeats, but occasionally you get tight continuous combat sequences. They tone down the blood and dismemberment from Fallout 4, but in exchange they improve the death animations and corpse physics. The problem is that these good combat sequences are far too rare, probably because it's just one designer doing a good job being randomly assigned various levels throughout the game. With our two encrypted slates, we take them back to the rock. 
Our cryptography expert can apparently decrypt faster if he has more examples of the encryption, which I don't think is how that works. Not that it matters, we get pointed to a mech factory where the first are holed up and there are a lot of them. Like, a lot. I really enjoy this dungeon sequence they made, but I think I understand why Starfield fans rank the Rangers as the worst, although typically they don't even acknowledge Ryujin in rankings. The Rangers questline is straightforward and transparently about making you do dungeons. It's old fashioned. The Vanguard questline is about jerking you off in Sysdef. Well, we'll talk about Sysdef, don't worry. What's really funny about this sequence is how obviously it sets up a mech boss fight, but doesn't pay off with one. I imagine the quest was simply written with the mech in mind, but kept open in case they never got around to figuring out how to implement them. And they never did, so now we have a former mech unit turned criminal organization still refusing to use mechs because that would be illegal! Their leader lays out the whole conspiracy with evidence before refusing to be taken alive. Of course he does. It's not like there's an ability to non-lethally incapacitate people. Oh wait, I actually added that. But don't think for a second I even bothered to think that they would have accepted that as a quest solution. I did see someone say that even in Red Dead 2 there aren't mechanics for taking bounties alive, which A, that's not true, and B, why I play a lot of Red Dead Online. Also, because it stands out here, when you loot clothes off of bodies, it no longer strips that body. There also isn't a guarantee that you can loot spacesuits or clothing off of NPCs anymore. This has to be one of the few ways that Fallout 76 has influenced Starfield. Yeah, sure, okay, copy the, the bad idea of all things. It sucks because Bethesda always had a generally immersive way of handling loot. You want an NPC's outfit? Kill them and take it. It's weird because it retroactively makes Outer Worlds competitive because they did market that as a feature years before Starfield even came out and cut it. How do they know? Do they have an insider? Also, we finally got an actual cowboy outfit. Time for the big finale. With the evidence in hand, we of course go to the Marshal to coordinate the arrest of Ron Ho. No? Okay, then we arrange to have all the rangers we've met up so far meet with us to- You know what this game's about. No, of course we go straight to him ourselves without telling anyone what we're doing. Our choice is to take a small bribe of 20k, a big bribe of 50k if we have the negotiation ability, or to kill him. That's it. That's the entire spectrum of decisions. Doesn't matter what you pick either, you get the same rewards from the marshal. Hey, I said it was a good quest line. Didn't say it ended well. With that, we get awarded our Ranger Badge, a decent new starship that I never used because I'd already maxed out my starship design skills and a leather spacesuit. They're so invested into the Cowboy LARP that they have leather spacesuits. Yeah, so if I think the Rangers are the best, that kind of says something about the rest of them, doesn't it? Granted, all that's left is the Crimson Cringe, a questline that's at least unique. But before that, I want to briefly touch on the main four companion quests. You unlock these after acquiring enough affinity, which is less than their side quests can give. So you need to do random stuff with Sarah and Sam after completing the Vanguard and Ranger quest lines to actually get them to give you their quest. Sarah's is to resolve what happened to some of her crew 20 years prior. Barrett's is to resolve what happened to his husband 20 years prior. Andrea is to resolve what happened with her friends 20 years prior. And Sam wants to resolve his breakup 20 years prior. Okay, they're not all literally 20 years prior, but broadly the same strokes. Honestly, the only reason to talk about these quests is just to make fun of them, as Andrea's is the only one that's halfway decent. It's like they looked at Nyoka's companion quest in Outer Worlds and decided to use that as a template. Sarah's is funny because the Admiral will ignore our Class 1 Super Citizen Hero of the United Colonies status until after we get what we want. Nice of you to uh, remember that whole other quest line we did. Then it turns out two of the survivors from Sarah's ship had a child and were living out in the jungles on an alien world for the last 20 years. The only reason I can assume Sarah can even emotionally handle the fact that her refusal to explore what happened in the incident resulted in her people being stranded, dying, and orphaning a child is that their crash site is less than a kilometer Miles. away from where ships land, so clearly it was an aesthetic choice on their part to stay here. But obviously that's not what they're intending with this sequence, and it's kind of embarrassing that ships actually land near here. Something I noticed is that the gun Sona holds is scaled to her smaller model, so she has a little baby gun. Because hey, we're not going to make a unique animation for this one-off scene of a child holding a gun. Sarah even chooses to adopt this girl before refusing to take her with her to the Unity. 
Seriously, it's hilarious how Sona gets used up and thrown away as soon as Sarah's quest resolves. I don't want to be your adoptive mom anymore. It was even funnier that I was flirting with her the entire game, and then picked the friendship option at the end because of how transparently awful of a human being Sarah Morgan is. Barrett not investigating what happened to his dead husband at least makes sense in the context that he might not want to handle it. Granted, he's an adult and his husband bought an apartment. You kind of need to handle that. But it's an understandable reason, Sarah. You just abandoned these people. Barrett's husband was a contractor hired by a mining company who was framed for ruining the local ecology in order to cover up that the mining company did it. The quest is boring and suffers from the fact that Barrett waited so long to resolve it, probably only so that he could be in an emotional state to be willing to bang the player. Yep. Next, Sam. Sam's mission is that his daughter Cora stays in touch with her mom, who is an active ranger and has gone missing. Granted, she's not missing, she's just undercover. The whole conflict between Lillian and Sam is that Sam was willing to leave his life as a ranger to raise his daughter, and Lillian isn't. My entire problem with the dynamic is that Cora is still too young to be participating in the lifestyle. They pretend she's gifted, and then she asks for a rare copy of A Brief History of Time. Like, the writers know Hawking's intention behind that book was that it was for lay people who didn't have an understanding of physics, right? Plus, I doubt it's rare. You seriously mean to tell me Constellation doesn't have slates with archives of all of human literature on them? And this isn't a post-apocalypse setting, shouldn't she be in school? Just because Korra is of at least average intellect doesn't mean that she should be taken to an active crime scene, or to rescue her presumed kidnapped mother. This leads to a dungeon where we kill a oh and she has a small spacesuit by the way. This leads to a dungeon where we kill a bunch of syndicate, then a landing sequence where we contend with waves and waves of incoming syndicate ships. Plus look at this Looney Tunes ass death. Starfield is so bloodless so anytime they put blood decals in a scene it suddenly turns into a Tarantino movie. I might have to censor this for the public release. What did they drain his blood after he died? I know the human body has about 5 liters of blood but you die before you lose all of it. <laughs> Honestly, when they showed a ship landing and dropping off enemies in the 2022 demo, I figured they were going to use this particular asset more often to make some dungeons more dynamic. There are times where ships will land and even drop off enemies that come hunt you down, but Starfield's nature doesn't lend itself to these encounters. Like orbital battles, you basically have to want to be ambushed. Compare that to, say, the hired thug event in Skyrim. Doesn't matter if you're in the middle of something, if that event fires, three thugs are coming to teach you a lesson, and if you're low level, they will instant kill you with a kill animation because you stole flowers from Arcadia's shop. No, I'm not mad. But yeah, this little firefight sequence is actually kind of fun. Shame it's a one-off. I don't know, both male romance options seem kind of weak. The options are either damaged goods or destroyed goods. Seriously, I can't think of a less attractive man than Sam Coe. A basically unemployed and skillless father with a 13-year-old daughter still trying to figure out the custody situation. Yeah, that's a recipe for three years down the road having to deal with Cora hating both her dads and deciding to move in with her mom. Nobody wants baby mama drama this late in the game, especially with a guy who insists that Cora stays in the bedroom when we fu- I mean, stays on the ship when we go on dangerous missions. Come on, Gumdrop, it's time for you to learn from your old man. Seriously, get off the ship. That just leaves Andrea. Honestly, she's the best put together of the four. Socially anxious, doesn't understand UC culture, tons of metal lines. Her writer has a tattoo of her religion. Oh, she's already Emil's waifu. That's unappealing. Still, she's cute. Yes, we are t together. Then you're both clear. Ah, oh, see, it's because that expression has multiple meanings. Honestly, now that I think about it, that line was one of the only times that the companion expressed interest in us other than the other way around. Andrea's super self-conscious about fitting in at Constellation, despite being one of the only companions to even get close to getting an artifact herself. I mean, besides Barrett, obviously. Seriously, Sarah can't accomplish anything without the player, Barrett can't do anything without getting kidnapped, and Sam only has the one trick for finding an artifact. Andrea, meanwhile, was basically at the finish line of her artifact. She's also got the best skill set and connections for Constellation. She's a trained criminal with connections to religious fanatics she can use to clear dungeons and run mining operations. And above all else, her quest is just about trying to clear up a misunderstanding from her past. She doesn't want to deal with it on her own because of her personality, and has never been able to get close enough to anyone who could help her with it. It's a totally understandable premise for something that she's neglected to do. In addition, 
The problem is just that awkward circumstances made it appear to her friends like she ordered some zealots to attack them. It's not as dumb as, say, abandoning her crew for a couple decades or 10 years of drama with her ex. I do have some gripes though, like how Andrea's ex-friend knows we're working with her, even if you go out of your way to never allude to that fact. Definitely an oversight. But all roads lead to Andrea discovering her contact with House Varun is, in fact, working with the Zealots. Sounds like an interesting plot point that could reveal a big part of this fa- And it's over. Goodbye, House Varun. I will laugh for days if they expand your faction through DLC. The Crimson Fleet is a questline about space bandits that was credited to Emil Pagliarulo prior to release that quickly earned the nickname from me as the Crimson Cringe, which I stole from what I presumed was Mahler's Multiverse of Madness video, but it's actually from his solo video. Mind you, this was before I even knew about the multiverse angle for Starfield, so... However, the basic premise of this questline is that it's a dual faction. You see Sisdef wants to take down the Crimson Fleet, and either assigns or extorts us into going undercover to do so. You can also reject the offer, in which case the Crimson Fleet then offers to hire you. As such, you can either side with Sisdef or the Crimson Fleet. All that said, my opinion of them and this questline only lessened the more I played and learned about it. Hmm, that's strange. According to your file, you've encountered them before. On Vectera specifically. They were the pirates that attacked your mining outpost? I'm surprised you don't remember. No, dude, that's... That's not what that question means. So, they are space bandits, obviously. Bethesda's never had a good relationship with their bandits. The Crimson Fleet is no exception to the rule of being shoot on sight raiders. You have to trigger a specific condition in order to even make them joinable, and usually they don't ever issue demands or threats, they just go straight to shooting. Even in their intro, their characterization matches. They're trying to capture the frontier, which is a junker, so they land and just start shooting at miners. No loudspeaker announcing they'll leave the miners alone if Barrett hands over his ship. After all, that would complicate Barrett's morality if he turned that offer down, prioritizing his ship over people's lives. It's much simpler to spawn in a small squad of human beings to be mowed down so that the player doesn't get bored. Like all of Bethesda's raider factions, it doesn't make sense because they are this ever-replenishing horde of criminals that doesn't ever proactively try to recruit the most criminal person in the setting player character. Moreover, once they lore bomb, it gets even more questionable. So 89 years ago, a guy started a prison riot at a United Colonies prison called The Lock. Isn't that already a violation of the Treaty of Narion since Crix isn't one of the three systems the UC is allowed to be within? It's also on the far side of Free Star Space, meaning it absolutely should have triggered a war. Jasper Crix intentionally went to prison just to connect with other criminals and get leads on various scores he could go after. That's it. His plan was to get a lead and then break back out of the highest security prison. Then the riot went so well they managed to escape up to and take over the UC space station called the Key, which today serves as the Crimson Fleet's base of operations. <sighs> yeah, yeah, that's way better than having the fleet be made up of ex-privateers. And this game wishes it had the plot point that the UC intentionally created the Crimson Fleet behind Freestar lines just to harass them. So somehow, the Crimson Fleet has managed to survive for almost a full century. Yet they live like the prison riot was during the Colony War and they were only recently established. This is so that Crix can have an ancient legacy that the fleet's current leader, Delgado, is looking for. Only the legacy is actually a ship he heard about that was stranded full of money. Specifically, it's a Galbank ship full of war reparations that the UC was apparently paying to the Freestar Collective. Wait, then this is for the Narion War? You mean to tell me the UC lost the Colony War and had to pay reparations for the Narion War, and they lost control of this big-ass station to a bunch of criminals and only after 90 years are trying to take control of it back? And what do you mean they lost a shipment of reparations? They're credits, not gold doubloons. They just send a secured message to the Aquila branch of Galbank telling them to credit the Freestar Collective's account by the agreed upon amount. And they lost the shipment by flying it near an EM class gas giant, aka a gas giant with such a strong magnetosphere that it damages ship electronics. Of course, it just blows up the player's ship but merely disables the legacy. 
So such a thing apparently exists, and somehow a ship that is supposed to be traveling from Alpha Centauri to Cheyenne ends up in Bannock, a system that is several jumps beyond Cheyenne, and ends up running into this gas giant. This would be akin to saying the Titanic ran into an iceberg because its operators refused to look outside and accidentally sailed into Neptune's atmosphere. In fairness, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation for all this in a journal on the legacy for why they took such a roundabout and dangerous route unexcorted with enough capital on board to found a new nation. I mean, it's not really fair. Using journals to cover for your major plot points is weak writing. A new nation is what is at stake here, at least allegedly. In reality, Crimson Fleet bases and ships can be found in practically every system. Their interstellar empire is already bigger than the UC and Freestar Collective combined. Their operation is massive, yet incompetent. They're rich enough to support a fleet, yet have to rely on spray paint to direct people around their living space. They decorate their environment with trash and have murder as their solution to personal disagreements. A big score for them, that is months of planning, is stealing an award worth around 4,000 credits. Simply put, you can't have a faction that operates like the fleet survive for multiple decades. I don't buy that they handled their second transfer of power particularly cleanly. Yes, second, Crix was betrayed by the fleet's second leader, meaning even from their inception they were like this. Criminal organizations that last a long time tend to be high class. The Crimson Cringe is a Fallout 76 raider gang that's only survived for as long as it has, because the writer said it did. Quality work, Emil. Speaking of 76 though, there was some speculation that I would absolutely hate the fleet simply for being a continuation of the joinable raider faction from the Wastelanders update. I'm happy to report that no, this is not the case. The Wastelanders raiders were an eclectic group of misfit toys that thought what they were doing was not entirely morally invalid compared to everyone else. The Crimson Fleet is aware that they're just a den of thieves. They don't try to pretend that their society is morally valid because they don't care about that. The tone is also completely different. Some fleet members are rude, but that's different from Millennial's Borderlands style writing. So at least the Crimson Fleet is better than the Wastelanders Raiders. Yay, good job, excellent work Bethesda. You're also allowed to actually destroy the Crimson Fleet if you want to. Personally, I find them to be a welcome addition to galactic politics. Not because they're a strong faction, but because the other three are so lame. So the commander of Sysdef wants us to gather evidence on fleet conspirators so that they can be arrested and work our way into the organization. And of course, it works because we're the player character. Like right off the bat, Delgado is accepting recommendations about staffing from us. The questline pretends we're being disrespected because people keep calling us Rook. <laughs> Wake up, Buttercup. Relax, Rookie. He don't mean nothing. Besides, now's one of those times. Pays to be the strong, silent type. But I don't care about that. Of course I'm called Rookie. At the end, I've only been running with them for like a week. Our recruiter, Neva, is basically the right-hand woman to Delgado himself, meaning we're only one degree away from the Crimson Fleet's leadership. We're given free reign of their command center. Literally, if the Sysdef commander just authorized us assassinating Delgado and bombing the command center, the UC could sweep in and wipe out the fleet instantaneously. Neva gives us a tour of the place where she lore bombs while slowly walking through areas and quipping with various NPCs. This is important because this is a game from the start that was designed to be replayed, and yet none of the quest lines seem to realize how much of this time-wasting bullshit they need to stop doing. It stood out when I was replaying, because I actually needed to reload and my last save was before the tour, so I had to sit through the tour a third time. Atrium to cargo bay doors have been You've repaired. got stuff to smuggle, oh, I've got the stuff to hide it. Oh yeah, this is the only side quest line I replayed, and my second playthrough had a, uh, a defining feature. Honestly, what was surprising wasn't that there weren't any starboard checks, but that there were. I am somewhat of the mind that kind of integrating Starborn checks is worse than not integrating them, especially if their function is to help the player skip the more tedious parts of the questline because there is plenty in need of skipping here. Okay, so the Crimson Cringe relies on a guy who is this super hacker to clean all their money. Because he can screw over the system, they put a bomb in his chest to security. Seriously, this is the faction that has survived for 89 years. 
They could have gone for corrupt government officials, maybe a contact at Gal Bank or a team of hackers with checks and balances, and they opted for a lone super hacker with a bomb in his chest. Pull the pin, Crimson Fleet dies. Can we please stop inventing easy ways to kill off this faction? It's kind of making it hard for me to take the United Colonies seriously. One of my ideas for fixing SysDef as an organization was to make it a joint task force between the Freestar Collective and the UC. Both Rangers and Vanguard point you towards Akande, and the Vigilance represents 20 years of diplomatic cooperation that's now at the point that they may actually be able to start dealing with some of the galaxy's threats. That way I don't have to look at the United Colonies' track record, which I didn't know first time through the questline and still thought the UC sucked. Later on we find ourselves on a UC naval star station and the Marines were using a mix of Freestar, Varun, and even Crimson Fleet weapons. If Bethesda was making a Star Wars game, they'd probably have issues with keeping Tusken Raider weapons out of the hands of Stormtroopers. Our initiation is down to the surface of the planet we're orbiting. Great. Shoot a torpedo down, call it a day. Assassinate Delgado here, it was a tragic accident. Okay. In fairness, killing Delgado before we've had a chance to collect intel on the fleet is not the play. Delgado apparently brings new recruits down here in order to gradually investigate the prison. So in all that time, they have never gotten inside. Don't you guys specialize in, you know, piracy? I figure cutting open metal plating is just a basic skill required of the fleet's members. Nope, but apparently they do have a killer fashion designer in the fleet because they've got regimented uniforms both for operations and casual wear. <laughs> so we work our way across the planet where crabs spawn that drop adhesive. It's so beautiful. Boys, sure not killing a whole lot of people in this questline about pirates. In fairness, I did skip over our joining, where we collect a guy's debt money and then do a hit to prove our usefulness to the fleet. Then we fight some ecliptic ships in space, which turns out were hired by Sysdef to help ingratiate us into the fleet. So did they still hire them in the timeline where I didn't work for Sysdef? The least I can say is that the piracy faction actually has us doing things with our spaceship. Sure, we're killing hundreds of crabs now, but we at least operated a spaceship in the beginning, had to board a ship, pirate things. Delgado sends us with another new recruit to go explore a wing of the prison and we get trapped within. Mathis is an annoying character who is constantly plotting against Delgado. You can either cover for him or throw him under the bus. It's funny because he acts like it's unwarranted when he acted unprofessional and rude the entire time. Are we pirates? Sure. Is that an excuse? No. Like, Neva having this personality defect is at least excused by her high rank. Being a rook in the cringe with a bad attitude is a fast track to getting murdered. It's literally the first thing you see when you arrive. Mathis staying in the fleet depends on us. What this ultimately affects is how many pirate ships show up to the final battle, so depending on which side we take, we might want to exploit Delgado randomly accepting our input on membership. Of course, I didn't realize that was what was happening until after the finale. It seems just as valid that keeping leeches like Mathis around when you're trying to undermine the fleet would make it weaker, not stronger. You know, because he literally conspired against his boss on the first day. The prison itself is just a boring dungeon that's hard to enjoy. We're also told to take the prison shuttle at the end to get out, but I managed to just use drugs to boost pack out and take my own ship, which, I mean, kudos for not breaking. My big question was, if these guys broke out of prison, why are things still locked down? Why are all the cell doors still closed? Why are cut panels still standing instead of knocked over? Why is the armory only half looted? Why is the prison shuttle still here? I guess the rioters put all these things back as they were leaving so that the next person to take the ride didn't have their prison breakout experience spoiled. I feel like a crazy person, am I the only one who notices this shit? Do people who like this game actually know where the brain's off switch is? So we bring Delgado the intel on the legacy, setting up the basic objective for the questline. Alright, so let's set up a ship with a grapple cannon, the hook operating by pneumatics. Or we'll push an asteroid to collide with the ship and push it out of range of the big gas giant. I mean, surely we're not just going to strap some MacGuffins to our ship and call it a day. So, the Legacy is a ship full of digitally stored credits, right? And the problem is that the ship didn't have strong enough electromagnetic shielding, right? Like, you see the problem here? No EM shielding, digital credits, electronically stored credits, electromagnetic fields. 
The only way we would get anything out of the legacy would be to remove it from the magnetic field, and even then it would only have a payout because the writer said it would. The problem is that the strong magnetic field was written to explain why the legacy is there, and why it hasn't been taken in 90 plus years, and why we can't just fly to it. That's the extent of interest on the story's part in magnetic fields. Truthfully, I don't understand why Crix's legacy was the focus of the storyline. It's not saying the Crimson Fleet would be more successful by returning to their cultural roots, because Crix made it to the legacy, but was stranded there and eventually died as his number two betrayed him and used his situation to kill him off, obviously blind to the huge monetary potential. It's not suggesting that Crix was betrayed, and then his image as a leader and the notion of Crix's legacy was used to motivate the pirates of the early fleet. You can only draw that conclusion because the system the key is in was renamed to Crix. No, the story is too focused on creating a plausible ancient heist target for the fleet to pursue, against the interest of trying to world-build the fleet or craft a compelling character-driven narrative. Not that it's a bad foundation, but the heist should be 50% more plausible. Here's my treatment. The technology we use to complete the heist is just better versions of things Crix was able to get in his time. In fact, he was successful in completing the heist, but as soon as he was out of the field, he was ambushed by mysteriously advanced warships. He was captured and his death was faked by Galbank, who used him to reclaim the treasure, but as a precaution, Crix had encrypted the legacy in a way that only a high-level hacker or team could ever decrypt. Galbank never bothered to decrypt the legacy because they were the ones who made it go missing in the first place. Maybe Galbank is far more of a political power broker than they've let on. Maybe they pretend to be apolitical and maintain the status quo between the two main factions in order to profit from both sides of their wars. They made the reparations disappear so that the Collective couldn't become more powerful than the UC. They're the reason the wars keep ending in draws. It was much cheaper to simply throw the legacy into an archive, disappear Crix, and call the whole thing resolved. From everyone else's perspective, the legacy was still lost, it becomes a legend among pirates, but the One Piece is real! Sorry, I've never watched One Piece, but the plotline already sounds super similar. It's not a cut I would expect Emil to ever make, though. He seems like the kind of guy who hates anime. Point is, there should be more political intrigue considering this is a political narrative. The UC Sysdef only cares about the Crimson Fleet because they're pirates who just wantonly go around killing people. Plug in Galbank as a shadowy power broker and now people will have endless discussions about whether you should support a Sysdef who do represent peace in the galaxy, but are also pawns of the elite, or the Crimson Fleet who are obviously flawed but the most independent faction in the entire settled systems. I've been told before as an insult that I'm a great ideas guy and that all of Bethesda's problems would be solved if they just hired me. Why didn't they think of that? I think this kind of comment happens because at a point, the amount of criticism becomes so overwhelming to consider that the easiest defense is to deflect and just say, fine, why don't you do it if it's so easy? But I've never said the process was easy, and I've definitely never said that every single suggestion I make in a video needs to be adopted simultaneously. My main point is that there are many interesting things you can do when telling a story if you have the right mentality or objectives from the outset, and they often choose to not do any of them for pretty terrible reasons. Starfield is in a dire situation lore-wise. The simple fact is, you would not have the vibrant lore community that exists for Elder Scrolls if Oblivion or Skyrim was the first game in the series. Starfield's the first game in its franchise, and it should be rather obvious just how weak it is. There's not a single faction in this game that I felt truly handled the world building in a way that will inspire people to dedicate YouTube channels to multiple hour videos discussing Starfield lore. And some of them have already quit. It'll happen, but it'll be akin to how Fallout 4 videos pan out. For all its faults in storytelling, Skyrim still operates within its setting with respect and makes additions to the series that its haters will accept. Do I like what Skyrim did with the Blades? Not really. But it's an idea. With Starfield, I just find these groups to be nebulous and one-dimensional. The UC somehow still exists despite having to dedicate itself to evacuating Earth and losing multiple wars. The Freestar Collective is still a backwards and primitive culture despite being around for more than a century in a high-tech environment. House Varun is practically non-existent and only exists to be a flavor of bandits. They unironically decided to recreate the Forsworn problem for a third time, and fans have the copium that Maybe the Shattered Space DLC announced before launch will explore them. There's nothing about this setting that I feel can be memed about. Starfield's meme value occupies a similar space in my brain as Yeek, a spot you really don't want to be in. 
as I start calling Todd Howard based for pushing monogamous relationships and the power of prayer to solve introversion. With that in mind, we start collecting pieces for the heist. Step one is to find the legacy, for which we'll need to access the Galbank archive. Yeah, it's just as simple as getting an ID card and walking right in. But in order to get the ID card, we need to, and I'm being serious, we need to get it off a guy called Dumb Broski. Here's where the difference between playthroughs should become obvious. You see, Sysdef doesn't want us to kill people, so we have to very slowly, very patiently complete these missions that are fairly uninteresting, knowing full well the alternative is to say screw it and just cut loose, slaughtering everyone on the ship. If we don't, we have to discover Dumb Broski is having an affair, press her for information, then sabotage the life support sensors and confront another guy in their conspiracy to get evidence against Dumb Broski we can use to get his credentials. Neva did give us an extra objective to steal a quote valuable unquote award. See, the Star Cruiser is currently hosting a party for the Terran Preservation Society, a do-nothing organization that just takes turns giving out an award before returning it. The award gets locked off if a gunshot's detected on board, so that's the stick for not just shooting dumb broski. I mean, carrot. We're definitely incentivized to do it this way, not just beaten with a stick. Then we head to the archive located in New Atlantis. For one of like three times I noticed in the game, I'm able to use my bounty hunter background in order to find out that there's an ecliptic ambush waiting for us. It doesn't change anything about the ambush because it's so slow in happening that it's impossible to not have adequate time to react. The problem is in the scenario writing. All right, so you've decided that there should be an ambush scene. Next, you set down who's ambushing. It's ecliptic mercs. Why? Well, the mercenaries make it so we can bribe them as well as press them for more information on who hired them. Then you design the level. Maybe we sneak into the archives, never alerting the door guard and thus turning the ambush around. I can't believe a bunch of immersive sim people got conned into believing for a few days that Starfield was going to be an immersive simulator because it had vents. Then they have to live with the horror that every single encounter design an immersive sim has ever had has done far worse in Starfield. All along the way of this questline, if we're siding with Sysdef, we can collect evidence that leads to the arrest of various characters working with the Crimson Fleet. You know, just arrest them. It's that simple, dumbass. Delgado just doesn't have a bounty. That's the only reason we can't arrest him. The reason you turn in evidence is that it convinces Mast to send more ships to the final encounter on the side of Sysdef. It's at least trying to be above the questlines of prior Bethesda games by having its final confrontation be manipulatable by the player based on our decisions. It is let down by being so boring in terms of lore implications, as well as the fact that it didn't come with a fundamental paradigm shift in how they make content. It's a Skyrim questline trying really hard to be above Skyrim design mentalities, and the result is that it's really short and not that impressive. Like it's a step in the right direction, but a tiny step that isn't noticeable because of how far down the wrong road Bethesda was already on. Also, like I said, the questline is really hard to justify replaying. It's hard to even just reload a save and see the other ending. Sure, you gave players the option to influence who gets hired into the fleet and how much support Mast sends to the final battle, but that's really boring and not worth replaying to see. In essence, the final dilemma comes down to whether you want to be on the red team or the blue team. Again. I think the Crimson Fleet is better simply because the Depot is one of the most concentrated and well-funded merchant hubs in the entire game. The downside is a bunch of dungeons now give you a bounty for killing pirates. It can't be understated how much being a fleet member will ruin exploration. For a couple hours I was just doing dungeons to help round out my combat section and literally half of the dungeons I found were full of friendly pirates. It's a novelty the first couple times you see it but they probably should have tuned it so that Crimson Fleet dungeons will spawn less if you're a member. Our next operation is to board a secret UC star station where they research advanced military prototypes and steal one called the Comm Spike. This one is definitely far more fun to shoot your way through, as the UC Marines can actually fight back, but also transparently obvious that you aren't supposed to. Like, they never expected players to do this. There's an option for using outfits to sneak through the base. Doing the quest through stealth, though, is... Alright, just kind of boring because Starfield is extremely outdated when it comes to stealth missions and mechanics. I advise a hasty retreat. It will save your life. Oh my god. <laughs> Vasco, you monster. Can you, can you 
steal the deal here? I think Attempt combat with us. You will not survive. After we get the comm spike, we're forced to steal the ship it's attached to. This sequence is really bad. If you shoot your way through, the UC comms officer will permit our departure, then immediately order our destruction. And the ship's so weak that it's really easy to have happen. I tried about 20 times to jump out before I finally managed to do so on the very hard difficulty. You can say it makes sense because they want exactly this to not happen, in which case the entire heist seems to be flawed. Yes, it makes sense that the prototype is weak narratively, but then it creates a problem where it's weak mechanically. One of my favorite attempts was using lateral thrust to spin my ship while drifting through space as my grab drive powered up to try to make the enemy miss shots. Problem is that you can't preemptively reallocate your points before taking off and the ship starts full power to its weapons and no power to the grav drive. So you have to move power over as you're being killed, or you watch as a random shot smokes your grav drive and knocks it out. Granted, this was on my kill everyone run after they patched a bug where the armillary would auto build on ships you took over, meaning I instant warped away from the entirety of the UC star station to the Unity by accident my first time through. I feel like if this happened to a modern military, that country would get memed on for the rest of eternity for losing an entire top secret star station to some random pirate. Next we head to... Neon, in order to get something to help deal with the magnetic field. You see, a grid that helps convert lightning to electricity will help us deal with a powerful magnetic field. I mean, it's probable. I just don't think a faction like the fleet is capable of actually harnessing this kind of technology. Especially as just a small module we'll install on our ship. We'd need to cover the entire ship in shielding material. Honestly, we'd probably want to make a new ship from scratch that's just a Faraday cage with short-range thrusters that can be deployed from a cruiser. Like all things Neon, the pants start filling as soon as we arrive. Our Neon contact is exceptionally rude to us, as though their entire frame of reference for how people in criminal organizations talk is rudeness, let's compare this to a point of reference Emil used to define this questline, Donnie Brasco. I'm asking you to middle a diamond for me here. Now all I want from my end is 8,000. What I'm saying to you is you should give it to somebody that don't know any better because that's a fugazi, all right? We'll move to screw around. We'll make this deal when he starts taking me seriously. There's quite a marked difference, and this is literally just the top scene on YouTube. Characters only get mad if there's an escalation in tone, or if someone is wronged. They start off the conversation cordially. Criminals are contractors, and contractors don't get business if they start conversations with hostility. On the flip side, well over half of the named Crimson Fleet members would get their throats slit in their sleep within a week for acting the way they do. It's worse than just poor writing, it's just annoying. Being cross with us right out the gate is a recipe for poor working conditions, and that's why the smuggler character from the last mission stands out to people, because she's one of the few that actually operates like a professional criminal. So Estella acts surprised when we screwed her over, as though anybody wants to work with someone who has such a bad attitude. Additionally, the problem with the Donnie Brasco comparison is the assumption that players are going to think there's a risk of getting caught by the fleet, but there's not. There's literally zero tension to the questline. In fact, it's more likely Sysdef will fire you than the Crimson Fleet finds out you're a mole. Starfield is a Bethesda game, and even working off the assumption that you didn't know that fact, at no point in Starfield does it make you believe that you will have to do something difficult in order to achieve a desired outcome. But it continues. The next phase is to visit a different bar to get an ID card from an executive to help us break into the building. What follows is easily one of the worst dialogues in the entire game. The bartender immediately assumes we are debt collectors for our target, then she admits that she is in love with our target, then she capitulates when we tell her that we are with the fleet, but then she insists we spend credits on a VIP membership. There are quest stages written in for getting a free membership, but I exhausted every option looking for a way to do this without pain and failed to find any. More to the point, the logic is stupid. The person she loved gets murdered by a criminal who stated they were a pirate and she still forced them to pay her money. 
She's gonna have to live the rest of her life wondering if the person she loved would still be alive if she just gave us free access, thereby not annoying us. We aren't given the option to intimidate her, persuade her, negotiate with her, or sneak into the VIP area. I walked around for five minutes just checking to see if there was some kind of hidden side entrance just to be sure. I even clipped out of the map. It's honestly one of the only times I can even think of in a post-Oblivion Bethesda game where you're expected to pay money during a quest and aren't given money up front to pay the fee. It's bizarre and one of those things in a Bethesda game where you wonder if it's actually just bugged and they fully intend for there to be options, but something accidentally disabled them in the final release. It also stands out because clearly as a Starborn on a repeat run, we should be given a check to navigate this conversation with a little more grace. It's also telling that killing the person with the pass is allowed, but killing the bartender is not. After all, what if there's some other quest she's tied to? Turns out there actually is, which is why we can't just kill her and take the pass into the VIP area off her body. The Jinnerdine facility is probably the best stealth premise of the three. Yes, only three missions. This is in part because it's the least obvious that we are there, and it isn't relying on any kind of social stealth. It's purely either sneaking through vents or gunning people down. I say that's the best because Bethesda is bad at the other kinds of stealth missions. They simply aren't arcane. Not that arcane is arcane anymore. Also, you can't get the conduction grid data without uploading Estella's virus. It's not that the virus is crucial for accessing the data we want. We're actually given that data for free. The quest scripting will literally not permit you to proceed without uploading the virus. The elevator won't function, although I tested it and was able to go back to the facility entrance if I backtracked, but you can't turn in the data that we steal. The reason you have to upload the virus is so that you are forced to go try to meet with Estella afterwards to celebrate, but instead run into Benjamin Bayou, the governor of Neon, who, by the way, is always here. She rented the VIP room at the Astro Lounge that Benjamin Bayou hangs out in 24-7. What's that? Choices? Being allowed to fuck over Estella for having a bad attitude by outright refusing to upload her virus? No bro, this is Starfield. Bayou is one of several NPCs who are ghosts. Yes, Bethesda has transcended essential NPCs and straight up turned some into non-interactable ghosts that bullets will simply pass through harmlessly. You see, all of this is so that Bayou will then confront us and ask us who had us plant the virus. Was it his brother, who did actually give us access to his terminal freely just to piss him off? Was it Estella, or was it us? While it is funny to screw over Estella in this situation, even funnier was saying that it was me, because then Benjamin says he'll frame us for a murder as punishment. Like, dude, didn't you notice that I literally fought my way across the city to here and then shot up your nightclub? Legitimately, Starfield is starting to split apart at the seams. The sheer level of dysfunctional design is staggering because someone had to actually script in the option to murder Komiko and then later write that we would be framed for a murder. Like, I don't think another 15,000 credit bounty is going to scare me. I have never seen a game in a story try to simultaneously give the player options and railroad the player this hard. It's like trying to jump while your feet are nailed to the ground. You can really tell that there was a genuine desire to give the player more options, but that desire ended when they realized that would mean changing the fundamentals of how they make quests. Did you know that Bayou's brother actually thanked us for talking with him? Even as he had his entire facility slaughtered, had his hands up, had a gun pointed at him the entire time and was threatened multiple times? One final conversation with Estella and we leave. Fuck Neon, I hate Neon so much, I'm glad I will literally never have to do anything here ever again. It's like a reverse Philosopher's Stone that turns everything it touches to sh**. You see Sistef is preparing to make their move. We don't learn this from Sistef, but actually the Crimson Fleet. Urgh. Time to do the stupid heist for this game that they felt was mandatory. I don't really have much to say about it that I haven't already alluded to, other than this screen. The writers were very transparent about what exactly the stakes were depending on who we return the legacy to. If we return to the UC, we're cutting ties with the Crimson Fleet. If we return to the fleet, we are cutting ties with Sistef. 
and then bam, they lay it all out in a tooltip. This is one of the most unnecessary, condescending, intelligence insulting messages I've ever seen in one of these games. It's like someone dumped a billion gallons of yellow spray paint onto my fucking soul. You did not just make me do that quest on Neon and assume that I am the stupid one. You know, we always want our writing to, to be less video gamey, you know? And the final battle is a janky broken sequence and we've already talked about the quest outcomes. The sequence is basically to jump to a couple defensive batteries around the key, have some space battles, and then a final battle at the key. Then we either storm the vigilance or the key. Exploring the galaxy is hard work. Trust me, I know. Stop by sometime and let's talk. Just us adventurers. Capture the opposing leadership and call it a W. Yeah, sure. Like Ikande is going to shower you in credits for doing your duty like a good little toy soldier. I've twisted arms and cashed in some favors at Mast. I wanted to make sure you got a share of the money you recovered from the legacy. We appreciate it, but if we did it for the credits, we probably wouldn't be talking right now. Don't thank me yet. If it had been completely up to me, you'd get a lot more than they're giving you. Yep, even if you side with Sistef, you still get the same exact amount of money from Crix's legacy. You guys, like, you couldn't just... Ah, oh. best faction in the game though, for real this time. 250,000 credits is not enough to say there's a winner in this conflict. I took the legacy with me to the Unity one last time as a final act of rebellion against this terrible game. And so in retaliation, the game broke and refused to let me jump. I had to reload an old save. Somehow in the final hour of playing Starfield, I finally had a quest breaking bug. <sighs> Starfield is a mess. It has dominated the last three months of my life and I cannot wait to uninstall it. I'm writing this conclusion towards the end of this project and I can say it's a fair bet that it will be a really hard decision whether or not I ever choose to cover its DLC because that would require playing Starfield again. It's not the worst game I've ever played but it may be the poorest put together game I've talked about on this channel. It is a design disaster. I have never seen a game that failed to tie together so many disparate mechanical ideas as well as the storytelling. It is a miracle that it functions as well as it does, which makes it all the more hilarious. It is Bethesda's most functional game, but their worst design to date. Shovelware and asset flip games are beaten by Starfield because those games tend to keep their mechanical scope small. Starfield went as wide as it could without displaying mastery of any one concept, and it's not even a jack of all trades, because jacks are still royalty, it's a one of all trades. And it is legitimately maddening how many people are in denial about this game, even now. I've definitely seen Starfield sour in the public perception, yet somehow it keeps ardent defenders, and that's fine, you're allowed to like Starfield, but you have to admit that it's gaming fast food. Starfield has been a big motivator for me to want to do some positive videos, or at least ones that aren't so negative. I never planned on 2023 being the year I would hate a single game. I never planned on disliking Starfield as much as I do. I had some expectation that Starfield was not going to flounder every single component, that there would be some aspect of this game that truly worked for more than a couple hours. I thought this video was going to be two hours, maybe four, now I'm looking at 8, and there's still a lot left on the table. And the worst part is, maybe now Bethesda's finally gotten the sign. Maybe Todd's final game will be that Elder Scrolls return to form. I'm not holding out hope. I'm not smoking any copium. I do not think Bethesda will do well with Elder Scrolls 6. But I hope of everything I've said in this video, that statement ages the poorest. But I don't think this video was unjustified. I think there were still enough people who felt betrayed by Starfield who want a voice to speak for them, to really hammer why this game didn't work. Why doesn't Starfield work? Because they didn't have a plan, because they wanted to say yes as much as possible, and because their management structure has become so large and convoluted that their old formula for making games can no longer function. They had one of the most desirable opportunities a creative person can ever get. 
the opportunity to create a brand new IP with hundreds of millions of dollars in funding, where they got a blank slate to create whatever science fiction story they wanted with practically zero corporate oversight. It is literally every nerd's wet dream of opportunities. And hundreds of people had to watch this once in a lifetime opportunity slip out of their fingers. Do you think Bethesda will have another chance to make a game like Starfield? It's all existing IPs from here on out. It is crazy to think that since I started working on the Morrowind video, Bethesda was just making Starfield. That's how long it's been. And that's why I find a sense of finality with this project. A sense of poetic closure. There is not an image smug enough to portray how vindicated I feel at years of Bethesda fans denying what I had to say and being rewarded with this game. Starfield is absolutely the game that you deserve. Thank you. 